Chapter Twenty Four of Villette. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Villette by Charlotte Bronte. Chapter Twenty Four. Monsieur de Bassompierre. Those who live in retirement, whose lives have fallen amid the seclusion of schools or of other walled-in and guarded dwellings, are liable to be suddenly and for a long while dropped out of the memory of their friends, the denizens of a freer world. Unaccountably, perhaps, and close upon some space of unusually frequent intercourse, some congeries of rather exciting little circumstances, whose natural sequel would rather seem to be the quickening than the suspension of communication, there falls a stilly pause, a wordless silence, a long blank of oblivion. Unbroken always is this blank, alike entire and unexplained. The letter, the message, once frequent, are cut off. The visit, formerly periodical, ceases to occur. The book, paper, or other token that indicated remembrance, comes no more. Always there are excellent reasons for these lapses, if the hermit but knew them. Though he is stagnant in his cell, his connections without are whirling in the very vortex of life. That void interval which passes for him so slowly that the very clocks seem at a stand, and the wingless hours plod by in the likeness of tired tramps prone to rest at milestones, that same interval perhaps teems with events and pants with hurry for his friends. The hermit, if he be a sensible hermit, will swallow his own thoughts and lock up his own emotions during these weeks of inward winter. He will know that destiny designed him to imitate, on occasion, the dormouse, and he will be conformable, make a tidy ball of himself, creep into a hole of life's wall, and submit decently to the drift which blows in and soon blocks him up, preserving him in ice for the season. Let him say, it is quite right, it ought to be so, since so it is, and perhaps one day his snow sepulchre will open. Spring softness will return, the sun and south wind will reach him, the budding of hedges and caroling of birds and singing of liberated streams will call him to kindly resurrection. Perhaps this may be the case, perhaps not. The frost may get into his heart and never thaw more. When spring comes, a crow or a pie may pick out of the wall only his dormouse bones. Well, even in that case all will be right. It is to be supposed he knew from the first he was mortal, and must one day go the way of all flesh, as well soon as sun. Following that eventful evening at the theatre, came for me seven weeks as bare as seven sheets of blank paper. No word was written on one of them. Not a visit, not a token. About the middle of that time I entertained fancies that something had happened to my friends at La Terrasse. The mid-blank is always a beclouded point for the solitary. His nerves ache with the strain of long expectancy. The doubts hitherto repelled gather now to a mass, and, strong in accumulation, roll back upon him with a force which savours of vindictiveness. Night, too, becomes an unkindly time, and sleep and his nature cannot agree. Strange starts and struggles harass his couch. The sinister band of bad dreams, with horror of calamity, and sick dread of entire desertion at their head, join the league against him. Poor wretch! He does his best to bear up, but he is a poor, pallid, wasting wretch, despite that best. Towards the last of these long seven weeks I admitted what through the other six I had jealously excluded the conviction that these blanks were inevitable, the result of circumstances, the fiat of fate, a part of my life's lot, and, above all, a matter about whose origin no question must ever be asked, for whose painful sequence no murmur ever uttered. Of course I did not blame myself for suffering. I thank God I had a truer sense of justice than to fall into any imbecile extravagance of self-accusation. And as to blaming others for silence, in my reason I well knew them blameless, and in my heart acknowledged them so. But it was a rough and heavy road to travel, and I longed for better days. 
I tried different expedients to sustain and fill existence. I commenced an elaborate piece of lace-work. I studied German pretty hard. I undertook a course of regular reading of the driest and thickest books in the library. In all my efforts I was as orthodox as I knew how to be. Was there error somewhere? Very likely. I only know the result was if I had gnawed a file to satisfy hunger, or drank brine to quench thirst. My hour of torment was the post-hour. Unfortunately, I knew it too well, and tried as vainly as assiduously to cheat myself of that knowledge, dreading the rack of expectation, and the sick collapse of disappointment which daily proceeded and followed upon that well-recognized ring. I suppose animals kept in cages, and so scantily fed as to be always upon the verge of famine, await their food as I awaited a letter. Oh, to speak truth! and drop that tone of false calm which longed to sustain, outwears nature's endurance, I underwent in those seven weeks bitter fears and pains, strange inward trials, miserable defections of hope, intolerable encroachments of despair. This last came so near me sometimes that her breath went right through me. I used to feel it like a baleful air or sigh penetrate deep and make motion pause at my heart or proceed only under unspeakable oppression. The letter, the well-beloved letter, would not come, and it was all of sweetness in life I had to look for. In the very extremity of want I had recourse again and yet again to the little packet in the case, the five letters. How splendid that month seemed, whose skies had beheld the rising of these five stars. It was always at night I visited them, and not daring to ask every evening for a candle in the kitchen, I bought a wax taper and matches to light it, and at the study hour stole up to the dormitory, and feasted on my crust from the barmecide's loaf. It did not nourish me. I pined on it, and got as thin as a shadow. Otherwise, I was not ill. Reading there somewhat late one evening, and feeling that the power to read was leaving me, for the letters from incessant perusal were losing all sap and significance. My gold was withering to leaves before my eyes, and I was sorrowing over the disillusion. Suddenly a quick, tripping foot ran up the stairs. I knew Ginevra Farnshaw's step. She had dined in town that afternoon. She was now returned, and would come here to replace her shawl, etc., in the wardrobe. Yes, in she came, dressed in bright silk, with her shawl falling from her shoulders, and her curls half uncurled in the damp of night, drooping careless and heavy upon her neck. I had hardly time to recasket my treasures and lock them up, when she was at my side. Her humour seemed none of the best. It has been a stupid evening. They are stupid people, she began. Who? Mrs. Chumley? I thought you always found her house charming. I have not been to Mrs. Chumley's. Indeed. Have you made new acquaintance? My uncle de Bassompierre is come. Your uncle de Bassompierre? Are you not glad? I thought he was a favourite. You thought wrong. The man is odious. I hate him. Because he is a foreigner? Or for what other reason of equal weight? He is not a foreigner. The man is English enough, goodness knows, and had an English name till three or four years ago. But his mother was a foreigner, a de Bassompierre, and some of her family are dead, and have left him estates, a title, and this name. He is quite a great man now. Do you hate him for that reason? Don't I know what Mamma says about him? He is not my own uncle, but married Mamma's sister. Mamma detests him. She says he killed Aunt Ginevra with unkindness. He looks like a bear. Such a dismal evening, she went on. I'll go no more to his big hotel. Fancy me walking into a room alone, and a great man of fifty years old coming forwards, and after a few minutes' conversation, actually turning his back upon me, and then abruptly going out of the room. Such odd ways. I dare say his conscience smote him, for they all say at home that I am the picture of Aunt Ginevra. Mamma often declares the likeness is quite ridiculous. Were you the only visitor? The only visitor? Yes. Then there was Missy, my cousin, little spoiled, pampered thing. Monsieur de Bassompierre has a daughter. Yes, yes, don't tease one with questions. 
dear, I'm so tired, she yawned. Throwing herself without ceremony on my bed, she added, It seems Mademoiselle was nearly crushed to a jelly in a hubbub at the theatre some weeks ago. Ah, indeed. And they live at a large hotel in the Rue Croissy. Justement. How do you know? I have been there. Oh, you have? Really? You go everywhere these days. I suppose Mother Breton took you. She and Asclepius have the entrée of the de Bassompierre apartments. It seems my son John attended Missy on the occasion of her accident. Accident? Bah! All affectation. I don't think she was squeezed more than she richly deserves for her airs. And now there is quite an intimacy struck up. I heard something about old Lang Syne and what not. How stupid they all were. Oh, you said you were the only visitor. Did I? You see, one forgets to particularize an old woman and her boy. Dr. and Mrs. Breton were at Monsieur de Bassompierre's this evening. Ay, ay, as large as life. And Missy played the hostess. What a conceited doll it is. Soured and listless, Miss Fanshawe was beginning to disclose the causes of her prostrate condition. There had been a retrenchment of incense, a diversion or a total withholding of homage and attention. Coquetry had failed of effect. Vanity had undergone mortification. She lay fuming in the vapours. "'Is Miss de Bassompierre quite well now?' I asked. "'As well as you or I, no doubt. But she is an affected little thing, and gave herself invalid airs to attract medical notice, and to see the old dowager making her recline on a couch, and my son John prohibiting excitement, etc. Fa! The scene was quite sickening!' "'It would not have been so if the object of attention had been changed, if you had taken Miss de Bassompierre's place.' Indeed. I hate my son John. My son John? Whom do you indicate by that name? Dr. Breton's mother never calls him so. Then she ought. A clownish, bearish John he is. You violate the truth in saying so, and as the whole of my patience is now spun off the distaff, I peremptorily desire you to rise from that bed and vacate this room. Passionate thing! Your face is the colour of a coquelicot. I wonder what always makes you so mighty testy à l'endroit du Crojean. John Anderson, my Joe, John, of oh, a distinguished name. Thrilling with exasperation to which it would have been sheer folly to have given vent, for there was no contending with that unsubstantial feather, that mealy-winged moth, I extinguished my taper, locked my bureau, and left her, since she would not leave me. Small beer as she was. She had turned insufferably acid. The morrow was Thursday, and a half-holiday. Breakfast was over. I had withdrawn to the first class. The dreaded hour, the post-hour, was nearing, and I sat waiting it, much as a ghost-seer might wait his spectre. Less than ever was a letter probable. Still, strive as I would, I could not forget that it was possible. As the moments lessened, a restlessness and fear almost beyond the average assailed me. It was a day of winter east wind, and I had now for some time entered into that dreary fellowship with the winds and their changes, so little known, so incomprehensible to the healthy. The north and east owned a terrific influence, making all pain more poignant, all sorrow sadder. The south could calm, the west sometimes cheer unless, indeed, they brought on their wings the burden of thunderclouds, and the weight and warmth of which all energy died. Bitter and dark as was this January day, I remember leaving the class, and running down without bonnet to the bottom of the long garden, and then lingering amongst the striped shrubs, in the forlorn hope that the postman's ring might occur while I was out of hearing, and I might thus be spared the thrill which some particular nerve or nerves, almost gnawed through with the unremitting tooth of a fixed idea, were becoming wholly unfit to support. I lingered as long as I dared, without fear of attracting attention by my absence. I muffled my head in my apron, and stopped my ears in terror of the torturing clang, sure to be followed by such blank silence, such barren vacuum for me. At last I ventured to re-enter the first class, where, as it was not yet nine o'clock, no pupils had been admitted. The first thing seen was a white object on my black desk, a white, flat object. 
the post had indeed arrived by me unheard rosine had visited my cell and like some angel had left behind her a bright token of her presence that shining thing on the desk was indeed a letter a real letter i saw so much at the distance of three yards and as i had but one correspondent on earth from that one it must come he remembered me yet how deep a pulse of gratitude sent new life through my heart drawing near bending and looking on the letter and trembling but almost certain hope of seeing a known hand it was my lot to find on the contrary an autograph for the moment deemed unknown a pale female scrawl instead of a firm masculine character i then thought fate was too hard for me and i said audibly this is cruel but i got over that pain also life is still life whatever its pangs our eyes and ears and their use remain with us though the prospect of whatever pleases be wholly withdrawn and the sound of what consoles be quite silenced i opened the billet by this time i had recognized its handwriting as perfectly familiar it was dated la terrasse and it ran thus dear lucy it occurs to me to inquire what you have been doing with yourself for the last month or two not that i suspect you would have the least difficulty in giving an account of your proceedings i dare say you have been just as busy and as happy as ourselves at la terrasse as to graham his professional connection extends daily he is so much sought after so much engaged that i tell him he will grow quite conceited like a right good mother as i am i do my best to keep him down no flattery does he get from me as you know and yet lucy he is a fine fellow his mother's heart dances at the sight of him after being hurried here and there the whole day and passing the ordeal of fifty sorts of tempers and, and combating a hundred caprices and sometimes witnessing cruel sufferings perhaps occasionally as i tell him inflicting them at night he still comes home to me in such kindly pleasant mood that really i seem to live in a sort of moral antipodes and on these january evenings my day rises when other people's nights set in still he needs keeping in order and correcting and repressing and i do him that good service but the boy is so elastic there is no such thing as vexing him thoroughly when i think i have at last driven him to the sullens he turns on me with jokes for retaliation but you know him and all his iniquities and i am but an elderly simpleton to make him the subject of this epistle as for me i have had my old breton agent here on a visit and have been plunged over head and ears in business matters i do so wish to regain for graham at least some part of what his father left him he laughs to scorn my anxiety on this point bidding me look and see how he can provide for himself and me too and asking what the old lady can possibly want that she has not hinting about sky-blue turbans accusing me of an ambition to wear diamonds keep livery servants have a hotel and lead the fashion amongst the english clan in villette talking of sky-blue turbans i wish you had been with us the other evening he had come in really tired and after i had given him his tea he threw himself into my chair with his customary presumption to my great delight he dropped asleep you know how he teases me about being drowsy i who never by any chance close his eye by daylight while he slept i thought he looked very bonny lucy fool as i am to be so proud of him but who can help it show me his peer look where i will i see nothing like him in villette well i took it in my head to play him a trick so i brought out the sky-blue turban and handling it with gingerly precaution i managed to invest his brows with this grand adornment i assure you it did not at all misbecome him he looked quite eastern except that he is so fair nobody however can accuse him of having red hair now it is genuine chestnut a dark glossy chestnut and when i put my large cashmere about him there was as fine a young bay day or pasha improvised as you would wish to see it was good entertainment but only half enjoyed since i was alone you should have been there in due time my lord awoke the looking-glass above the fireplace soon intimated to him his plight as you may imagine i now live under threat and dread of vengeance but to come to the gist of my letter i know thursday is a half-holiday in the rue fossette be ready then by five in the afternoon at which hour i will send the carriage to take you out to la terrasse be sure to come you may meet some old acquaintance good-bye my wise dear grave little goddaughter very truly yours louisa breton now a letter like that sets one to rights i might still be sad after reading that letter 
but I was more composed. Not exactly cheered, perhaps, but relieved. My friends, at least, were well and happy. No accident had occurred to Graham. No illness had seized his mother. Calamities that had so long been my dream and thought. Their feelings for me, too, were as they had been. Yet how strange it was to look on Mrs. Breton's seven weeks, and contrast them with my seven weeks. Also, how very wise it is in people placed in an exceptional position to hold their tongues, and not rashly declare how such position galls them. The world can understand well enough the process of perishing for want of food. Perhaps few persons can enter into or follow out that of going mad from solitary confinement. They see the long-buried prisoner disinterred, a maniac or an idiot. How his senses left him, how his nerves, first inflamed, underwent nameless agony, and then sunk to palsy, is a subject too intricate for examination, too abstract for popular comprehension. Speak of it. You might almost as well stand up in an European market-place, and propound dark sayings in that language and mood wherein Nebuchadnezzar, the imperial hypochondriac, communed with his baffled Chaldeans. And long, long may the minds to whom such themes are no mystery, by whom their bearings are sympathetically seized, be few in number, and rare of rencontre. Long may it be generally thought that physical privations alone merit compassion, and that the rest is a figment. When the world was younger and haler than now, moral trials were a deeper mystery still. Perhaps in all the land of Israel there was but one Saul, certainly but one David to soothe or comprehend him. The keen, still cold of the morning was succeeded later in the day by a sharp breathing from Russian wastes. The cold zone sighed over the temperate zone and froze it fast. A heavy firmament, dull and thick with snow, sailed up from the north and settled over expectant Europe. Towards afternoon began the descent. I feared no carriage would come. The white tempest raged so dense and wild. But trust my godmother. Once having asked, she would have her guest. About six o'clock I was lifted from the carriage over the already blocked up front steps of the chateau, and put in at the door of La Terrasse. Running through the vestibule and upstairs to the drawing-room, there I found Mrs. Breton, a summer day in her own person. Had I been twice as cold as I was, her kind kiss and cordial clasp would have warmed me. Inured now for so long a time to rooms with bare boards, black benches, desks, and stoves, the blue saloon seemed to me gorgeous. In its Christmas-like fire alone there was a clear and crimson splendour which quite dazzled me. When my godmother had held my hand for a little while, and chatted with me, and scolded me for having become thinner than when she last saw me, she professed to discover that the snow wind had disordered my hair, and sent me upstairs to make it neat and remove my shawl. Repairing to my own little sea-green room, there also I found a bright fire, and candles too were lit. A tall wax-light stood on each side the great looking-glass. But between the candles and before the glass, appeared something dressing itself. An airy, fairy thing, small, slight, white. A winter spirit. I declare for one moment I thought of Graham and his spectral illusions. With distrustful eye I noted the details of this new vision. It wore white, sprinkled slightly with drops of scarlet. Its girdle was red. It had something in its hair, leafy yet shining a little wreath with an evergreen gloss. Spectral or not, here truly was nothing frightful, and I advanced. Turning quick upon me, a large eye under long lashes flashed over me, the intruder. The lashes were as dark as long, and they softened with their pencilling the orb they guarded. Ah, you are come, she breathed out, in a soft, quiet voice, and she smiled slowly and gazed intently. I knew her now. Having only once seen that sort of face, with that cast of fine and delicate featuring, I could not but know her. Mr. Bassompierre, I pronounced. No, was the reply. Not Mr. Bassompierre for you. I did not inquire who then she might be, but waited voluntary information. You are changed, but still you are yourself, she said, approaching nearer. I remember you well, your countenance, the colour of your hair, 
the outline of your face i had moved to the fire and she stood opposite and gazed into me and as she gazed her face became gradually more and more expressive of thought and feeling till at last a dimness quenched her clear vision it makes me almost cry to look so far back said she but as to being sorry or sentimental don't think it on the contrary i am quite pleased and glad interested yet altogether at fault i knew not what to say at last i stammered i think i never met you till that night some weeks ago when you were hurt she smiled you have forgotten then that i have sat on your knee been lifted in your arms even shared your pillow you no longer remember the night when i came crying like a naughty little child as i was to your bedside and you took me in you have no memory for the comfort and protection by which you soothed in acute distress go back to breton remember mr home at last i saw it all and you are little polly i am paulina mary home de bossompierre how time can change little polly wore in her pale small features her fairy symmetry her varying expression a certain promise of interest and grace but paulina mary was become beautiful not with the beauty that strikes the eye like a rose orbed ruddy and replete not with the plump and pink and flaxen attributes of her blonde cousin ginevra but her seventeen years had brought her a refined and tender charm which did not lie in complexion though hers was fair and clear nor in outline though her features were sweet and her limbs perfectly turned but i think rather in a subdued glow from the soul outward this was not an opaque vase of material however costly but a lamp chastely lucent guarding from extinction yet not hiding from worship a flame vital and vestal in speaking of her attractions i would not exaggerate language but indeed they seemed to me very real and engaging what though all was on a small scale it was the perfume which gave this white violet distinction and made it superior to the broadest camellia the fullest dahlia that ever bloomed ah and you remember the old time at breton better said she better perhaps than you i remember it with minute distinctness not only the time but the days of the time and the hours of the days you must have forgotten some things very little i imagine you were then a little creature of quick feelings you must long ere this have outgrown the impressions with which joy and grief affection and bereavement stamped your mind ten years ago you think i have forgotten whom i liked and in what degree i liked them when a child the sharpness must be gone the point the poignancy the deep imprint must be softened away and effaced i have a good memory for those days she looked as if she had her eyes were the eyes of one who can remember one whose childhood does not fade like a dream nor whose youth vanish like a sunbeam she would not take life loosely and coherently in parts and let one season slip as she entered on another she would retain and add often review from the commencement and so grow in harmony and consistency as she grew in years still i could not quite admit the conviction that all the pictures which now crowded upon me were vivid and visible to her her fond detachments her sports and contests with a well-loved playmate the patient true devotion of her child's heart her fears her delicate reserves her little trials the last piercing pain of separation i retraced these things and shook my head incredulous she persisted the child of seven years lives yet in the girl of seventeen said she you used to be excessively fond of mrs breton i remarked intending to test her she set me right at once not excessively fond said she i liked her i respected her as i should do now she seems to me very little altered she is not much changed i assented we were silent a few minutes glancing round the room she said there are several things here that used to be at breton i remember that pincushion and that looking-glass evidently she was not deceived in her estimate of her own memory not at least so far you think then you would have known mrs breton i went on i perfectly remembered her the turn of her features her olive complexion and black hair her height her walk her voice dr breton of course i pursued would be out of the question 
and indeed as i saw your first interview with him i am aware that he appeared to you as a stranger that first night i was puzzled she answered how did the recognition between him and your father come about they exchanged cards the names graham breton and home de bossompierre gave rise to questions and explanations that was on the second day but before then i was beginning to know something how know something why she said how strange it is that most people seem so slow to feel the truth not to see but to feel when dr breton had visited me a few times and sat near and talked to me when i had observed the look in his eyes the expression about his mouth the form of his chin the carriage of his head and all that we do observe in persons who approach us how could i avoid being led by association to think of graham breton graham was slighter than he and not grown so tall and had a smoother face and longer and lighter hair and spoke not so deeply more like a girl but yet he is graham just as i am little polly or you are lucy snow i thought the same but i wondered to find my thoughts hers there are certain things in which we so rarely meet with our double that it seems a miracle when that chance befalls you and graham were once playmates and do you remember that she questioned in her turn no doubt he will remember it also said i i have not asked him few things would surprise me so much as to find that he did i suppose his disposition is still gay and careless was it so formerly did it so strike you do you thus remember him i scarcely remember him in any other light sometimes he was studious sometimes he was merry but whether busy with his books or disposed for play it was chiefly the books or game he thought of not much heeding those with whom he read or amused himself yet to you he was partial partial to me oh no he had other playmates his schoolfellows i was of little consequence to him except on sundays yes he was kind on sundays i remember walking with him hand in hand to st mary's and his finding the places in my prayer-book and how good and still he was on sunday evenings so mild for such a proud lively boy so patient with all my blunders in reading and so wonderfully to be depended on for he never spent those evenings from home i had a constant fear that he would accept some invitation and forsake us but he never did nor seemed ever to wish to do it thus of course it can be no more i suppose sunday will now be dr breton's dining out day children come down here called mrs breton from below paulina would still have lingered but i inclined to descend and we went down End of chapter twenty four Chapter twenty five of Villette. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Villette by Charlotte Bronte. Chapter twenty five. The Little Countess. Cheerful as my godmother naturally was, and entertaining as, for our sakes, she made a point of being, there was no true enjoyment that evening at La Terrasse, till, through the wild howl of the winter night, were heard the signal sounds of arrival how often while women and girls sit warm at snug firesides their hearts and imaginations are doomed to divorce from the comfort surrounding their persons forced out by night to wander through dark ways to dare stress of weather to contend with the snow-blast to wait at lonely gates and stiles in wildest storms watching and listening to see and hear the father the son the husband coming home father and son came at last to the chateau for the count de bassompierre that night accompanied dr breton i know not which of our trio heard the horses first the asperity the violence of the weather warranted our running down into the hall to meet and greet the two riders as they came in but they warned us to keep our distance both were white two mountains of snow and indeed mrs breton seeing their condition ordered them instantly to the kitchen prohibiting them at their peril from setting foot on her carpeted staircase till they had severally put off that mask of old christmas they now affected into the kitchen however we could not help following them it was a large old dutch kitchen picturesque and pleasant the little white countess danced in a circle about her equally white sire clapping her hands and crying papa papa you look like an enormous polar bear the bear shook himself 
and the little sprite fled far from the frozen shower. Back she came, however, laughing and eager to aid in removing the arctic disguise. The Count, at last issuing from his dreadnought, threatened to overwhelm her with it as with an avalanche. "'Come, then,' said she, bending to invite the fall, and when it was playfully advanced above her head, bounding out of reach like some little chamois. Her movements had the supple softness, the velvet grace of a kitten. Her laugh was clearer than the ring of silver and crystal. As she took her sire's cold hands and rubbed them, and stood on tiptoe to reach his lips for a kiss, there seemed to shine round her a halo of loving delight. The grave and reverend seigneur looked down on her as men do look on what is the apple of their eye. "'Mrs. Breton,' said he, "'what am I to do with this daughter, our daughterling of mine? She neither grows in wisdom nor in stature. Don't you find you're pretty nearly as much the child as she was ten years ago?' "'She cannot be more the child than this great boy of mine,' said Mrs. Breton who was in conflict with her son about some change of dress she deemed advisable, and which he resisted. He stood leaning against the Dutch dresser, laughing and keeping her at arm's length. "'Come, Mama," said he, "'by way of compromise and to secure for us inward as well as outward warm, let us have a Christmas for sale cup, and toast old England here, on the hearth.' So while the Count stood by the fire, and Paulina Mary still danced to and fro, happy in the liberty of the wide, hall-like kitchen, Mrs. Breton herself instructed Martha to spice and heat the wassail bowl, and pouring the draught into a Breton flagon, it was served round, reaming hot, by means of a small silver vessel, which I recognised as Graham's christening cup. "'Here's to old Lang Syne,' said the Count, holding the glancing cup on high. Then, looking at Mrs. Breton, "'Wit wa he peddled in the barn fra morning sin till dine, "'but sees it win as braid her ords and old lang syne. "'And surely you'll be your pine stoup, and surely I'll be mine, "'and I'll taste a cup o' kindness yet for old lang syne.' "'Scotch! Scotch!' cried Paulina. "'Papa is talking Scotch, and Scotch he is, partly.' We are home in der Bosson Pierre, Caledonian and Gallic. And is that a Scotch reel you are dancing, you Highland fairy? asked her father. Mrs. Breton, there will be a green ring growing up in the middle of your kitchen shortly. I would not answer for her being quite canny. She is a strange little mortal. Tell Lucy to dance with me, papa. There is Lucy Snow. Mr. Home. There was still quite as much about him of plain Mr. Home as of proud Count de Bassompierre, held his hand out to me, saying kindly, He remembered me well, and even had his own memory been less trustworthy, my name was so often on his daughter's lips, and he had listened to so many long tales about me, I should seem like an old acquaintance. Every one now had tasted the wassail cup, except Paulina, whose pas de fille eut de fantaisie, nobody thought of interrupting to offer so profanatory a draught. But she was not to be overlooked, nor balked of her mortal privileges. "'Let me taste,' said she to Graham, as he was putting the cup on the shelf of the dresser, out of her reach. Mrs. Breton and Mr. Home were now engaged in conversation. Dr. John had not been unobservant of the fairy's dance. He had watched it, and he had liked it. To say nothing of the softness and beauty of the movements, eminently graceful to his grace-loving eye, that ease in his mother's house charmed him, for it set him at ease. Again she seemed a child for him, again almost his playmate. I wondered how he would speak to her. I had not yet seen him address her. His first words proved that the old days of little Polly had been recalled to his mind by this evening's childlike light-heartedness. "'Your ladyship wishes for the tankard?' "'I think I said so. I think I intimated as much.' "'Couldn't consent to a step of the kind on any account. Sorry for it, but couldn't do it.' "'Why? I'm quite well now. It can't break my collarbone again, or dislocate my shoulder. Is it wine?' "'No, nor dew.' "'I don't want dew.' 
I don't like to. But what is it? Ale strong, ale old October, brewed perhaps when I was born. It must be curious. Is it good? Excessively good. And he took it down, administered to himself a second dose of this mighty elixir, expressed in his mischievous eyes extreme contentment with the same, and solemnly replaced the cup on the shelf. I should like a little, said Paulina, looking up. I never had any old October. Is it sweet? Perilously sweet, said Graham. She continued to look up exactly with the countenance of a child that longs for some prohibited dainty. At last the doctor relented, took it down, and indulged himself in the gratification of letting a taste from his hand. His eyes, always expressive in the revelation of pleasurable feelings, luminously and smilingly avowed that it was a gratification, and he prolonged it by so regulating the position of the cup that only a drop at a time could reach the rosy sipping lips by which its brim was courted. "'A little more, a little more,' said she, petulantly touching his hand with the forefinger, to make him incline the cup more generously and yieldingly. "'It smells of spice and sugar, but I can't taste it. Your wrist is so stiff, and you are so stingy.' He indulged her, whispering, however, with gravity, don't tell my mother or Lucy they wouldn't approve. Nor do I, said she, passing into another tone and manner as soon as she had fairly essayed the beverage, just as if it had acted upon her like some disenchanting draught, undoing the work of a wizard. I find it anything but sweet. It is bitter and hot, and takes away my breath. Your old October was only desirable while forbidden. Thank you, no more. And, with a slight bend, Careless, but as graceful as her dance, she glided from him and rejoined her father. I think she had spoken truth. The child of seven was in the girl of seventeen. Graham looked after her, a little baffled, a little puzzled. His eye was on her a good deal during the rest of the evening, but she did not seem to notice him. As we ascended to the drawing-room for tea, she took her father's arm. Her natural place seemed to be at his side. Her eyes and her ears were dedicated to him. He and Mrs. Breton were the chief talkers of our little party, and Paulina was their best listener, attending closely to all that was said, prompting the repetition of this or that trait or adventure. And where were you at such a time, Papa? And what did you say then? And tell Mrs. Breton what happened on that occasion. Thus she drew him out. She did not again yield to any effervescence of glee. The infantine sparkle was exhaled for the night. She was soft, thoughtful, and docile. It was pretty to see her bid good night. Her manner to Graham was touched with dignity. In her very slight smile and quiet bow spoke the countess, and Graham could not but look grave and bend responsive. I saw he hardly knew how to blend together in his ideas the dancing fairy and delicate dame. Next day, when we were all assembled round the breakfast-table, shivering and fresh from the morning's chill ablutions, Mrs. Breton pronounced a decree that nobody, who was not forced by dire necessity, should quit her house that day. Indeed, egress seemed next to impossible. The drift darkened the lower panes of the casement, and, on looking out, one saw the sky and air vexed and dim, the wind and snow in angry conflict. There was no fall now, but what had already descended was torn up from the earth, whirled round by brief shrieking gusts, and cast into a hundred fantastic forms. The countess seconded Mrs. Breton. "'Papa shall not go out,' said she, placing a seat for herself beside her father's armchair. "'I will look after him. You won't go into town, will you, papa?' "'I am no,' was the answer. If you and Mrs. Breton are very good to me, Polly, kind, you know, and attentive, if you pet me in a very nice manner and make much of me, I may possibly be induced to wait an hour after breakfast and see whether this razor-edged wind settles. But, you see, you give me no breakfast. You offer me nothing. You let me starve. Quick, please, Mrs. Breton and pour out the coffee entreated paulina whilst i take care of the count de bossompierre in other respects since he grew into a count he has needed so much attention 
she separated and prepared a roll there papa are your pistolets charged said she and there is some marmalade just the same sort of marmalade we used to have at breton and which you said was as good as if it had been conserved in scotland and which your little ladyship used to beg for my boy do you remember that interposed mrs breton have you forgotten how you would come to my elbow and touch my sleeve with the whisper please ma'am something good for graham a little marmalade or honey or jam no mamma broke in dr john laughing yet reddening it surely was not so i could not have cared for these things did he or did he not paulina he liked them asserted paulina never blush for a john said mr home encouragingly i like them myself yet and always did and polly showed her sense in catering for a friend's material comforts it was i who put her into the way of such good manners nor do i let her forget them uh, polly offer me a small slice of that tongue there papa but remember you are only waited upon with this assiduity on condition of being persuadable and reconciling yourself to la terrasse for the day mrs breton said the count i want to get rid of my daughter uh, to send her to school do you know of any good school there is lucy's place madame beck's miss snow is in a school i am a teacher i said and was rather glad of the opportunity of saying this for a little while i had been feeling as if placed in a false position mrs breton and son knew my circumstances but the count and his daughter did not they might choose to vary by some shades their hitherto cordial manner towards me when aware of my grade in society i spoke then readily but a swarm of thoughts i had not anticipated nor invoked rose dim at the words making me sigh involuntarily mr home did not lift his eyes from his breakfast plate for about two minutes nor did he speak perhaps he had not caught the words perhaps he thought that on a confession of that nature politeness would interdict comment the scotch are proverbially proud and homely as was mr home in look simple in habits and tastes i have all along intimated that he was not without his share of the national quality was his a pseudo pride was it real dignity i leave the question undecided in its wide sense where it concerned me individually i can only answer then and always he showed himself a true-hearted gentleman by nature he was a feeler and a thinker over his emotions and his reflections spread a mellowing of melancholy more than a mellowing in trouble and bereavement it became a cloud he did not know much about lucy snow what he knew he did not very accurately comprehend indeed his misconceptions of my character often made me smile but he saw my walk in life lay rather on the shady side of the hill he gave me credit for doing my endeavour to keep the course honestly straight he would have helped me if he could having no opportunity of helping he still wished me well when he did look at me his eye was kind when he did speak his voice was benevolent yours said he is an arduous calling i wish you health and strength to win in it success his fair little daughter did not take the information quite so composedly she fixed on me a pair of eyes wide with wonder almost with dismay are you a teacher cried she then having paused on the unpalatable idea well i never knew what you were nor ever thought of asking for me you were always lucy snow and what am i now i could not forbear inquiring yourself of course but do you really teach here in Villette? i really do and do you like it not always then why do you go on with it her father looked at and i feared was going to check her but he only said proceed polly proceed with that catechism prove yourself the little wiseacre you are if miss snow were to blush and look confused i should have to bid you hold your tongue and you and i would sit out the present meal in some disgrace but she only smiles so push her hard multiply the cross questions well miss snow why do you go on with it chiefly i fear for the sake of the money i get not then from motives of pure philanthropy 
Polly and I were clinging to that hypothesis as the most lenient way of accounting for your eccentricity. No, no, sir. Rather for the roof of shelter I am thus enabled to keep over my head, and for the comfort of mind it gives me to think that while I can work for myself, I am spared the pain of being a burden to anybody. Papa, say what you will. I pity Lucy. Take up that pity, Miss de Bassompierre, take it up in both hands, as you might a little callow gosling squattering out of bounds without leave. Put it back in the warm nest of a heart whence it issued, and receive in your ear this whisper. If my Polly ever came to know by experience the uncertain nature of this world's goods, I should like her to act as Lucy acts, to work for herself, that she might burden neither kith nor kin. Yes, papa, said she, pensively and tractably. But poor Lucy, I thought she was a rich lady, and had rich friends. You thought like a little simpleton. I never thought so. When I had time to consider Lucy's manner and aspect, which wasn't often, I thought she was one who had to guard and not be guarded, to act and not be served, and this lot has, I imagine, helped her to an experience for which, if she live long enough to realize its full benefit, she may yet bless Providence. But this school, he pursued, changing his tone from grave to gay, would Madame Beck admit my Polly, do you think, Miss Lucy? I said there needed but to try, Madame. It would soon be seen. She was fond of English pupils. If you, sir, I added, will but take Miss de Bassompierre in your carriage this very afternoon, I think I can answer for it that Rosine, the portress, will not be very slow in answering your ring, and Madame, I am sure, will put on her best pair of gloves to come into the salon to receive you. In that case, responded Mr. Home. I see no sort of necessity there is for delay. Mrs. Hurst can send what she calls her young lady's things after her. Polly can settle down to her horn-book before night, and you, Miss Lucy, I trust, will not disdain to cast an occasional eye upon her, and let me know from time to time how she gets on. I hope you approve of the arrangement, Comtesse de Bassompierre. The Countess hemmed and hesitated. I thought, said she, I thought I had finished my education. That only proves how much we may be mistaken in our thoughts. I hold a far different opinion, as most of these will who have been auditors of your profound knowledge of life this morning. Ah, my little girl, thou hast much to learn, and papa ought to have taught thee more than he has done. Come. There is nothing for it but to try Madame Beck, and the weather seems settling, and I have finished my breakfast. But, Papa— Well? I see an obstacle. I don't, at all. It is enormous, Papa. It can never be got over. It is as large as you in your greatcoat, and the snowdrift on the top. And like that snowdrift, capable of melting? No, it is of too, too solid flesh. It is just your own self. Miss Lucy, warn Madame Beck not to listen to any overtures about taking me, because in the end it would turn out that she would have to take Papa too. As he is so teasing, I will just tell tales about him. Mrs. Breton and all of you listen. About five years ago, when I was twelve years old, he took it into his head that he was spoiling me, that I was growing unfitted for the world, and I don't know what, and nothing would serve or satisfy him, but I must go to school. I cried, and so on. But Monsieur de Bossompierre proved hard-hearted, quite firm and flinty, and to school I went. What was the result? In the most admirable manner, Papa came to school likewise. Every other day he called to see me. Madame Agrito grumbled. But it was of no use. And so, at last, Papa and I were both, in a manner, expelled. Lucy can just tell Madame Beck this little trait. It is only fair to let her know what she has to expect. Mrs. Breton asked Mr. Home what he had to say in answer to this statement. As he made no defence, judgment was given against him, and Paulina triumphed. But she had other moods besides the arch and naive. After breakfast, when the two elders withdrew, 
I suppose to talk over certain of Mrs. Breton's business matters, and the Countess, Dr. Breton, and I were for a short time alone together. All the child left her. With us, more nearly her companions in age, she rose at once to the little lady. Her very face seemed to alter. That play of feature and candour of look which, when she spoke to her father, made it quite dimpled and round, yielded to an aspect more thoughtful, and lines distincter and less mobile. No doubt Graham noted the change as well as I. He stood for some minutes near the window, looking out at the snow. Presently he approached the half, and entered into conversation, but not quite with his usual ease. Fit topics did not seem to rise to his lips. He chose them fastidiously, hesitatingly, and consequently infelicitously. He spoke vaguely of Villette, its inhabitants, its notable sites and buildings. He was answered by Mr. Bassompierre in quite womanly sort, with intelligence, with a manner not indeed wholly disindividualized. A tone, a glance, a gesture here and there, rather animated and quick than measured and stately, still recalled little Polly. But there was so fine and even a polish, so calm and courteous a grace, gilding and sustaining these peculiarities, that a less sensitive man than Graham would not have ventured to seize upon them as vantage points, leading to franker intimacy. Yet while Dr. Breton continued subdued, and for him sedate, he was still observant. Not one of those petty impulses and natural breaks escaped him. He did not miss one characteristic movement, one hesitation in language, or one lisp in utterance. At times, in speaking fast, she still lisped, but coloured whenever such lapse occurred, and, in a painstaking, conscientious manner, quite as amusing as the slight error, repeated the word more distinctly. Whenever she did this, Dr. Breton smiled. Gradually, as they conversed, the restraint on each side slackened. Might the conference have but been prolonged, I believe it would soon have become genial. Already to Paulina's lip and cheek returned the wreathing, dimpling smile. She lisped once and forgot to correct herself. And Dr. John, I know not how he changed, but change he did. He did not grow gayer. No raillery, no levity sparkled across his aspect, but his position seemed to become one of more pleasure to himself, and he spoke his augmented comfort in readier language, in tones more suave. Ten years ago this pair had always found abundance to say to each other. The intervening decade had not narrowed the experience or impoverished the intelligence of either. Besides, there are certain natures of which the mutual influence is such that the more they say, the more they have to say. For these, out of association, grows adhesion, and out of adhesion, amalgamation. Graham, however, must go. His was a profession whose claims are neither to be ignored nor deferred. He left the room. But before he could leave the house there was a return. I am sure he came back, not for the paper or card in his desk, which formed his ostensible errand, but to assure himself by one more glance that Paulina's aspect was really such as memory was bearing away, that he had not been viewing her somehow by a partial, artificial light, and making a fond mistake. No, he found the impression true. Rather, indeed, he gained than lost by this return. He took away with him a parting look, shy but very soft, as beautiful, as innocent, as any little fawn could lift out of its cover of fern, or any lamb from its meadow-bed. Being left alone, Paulina and I kept silence for some time. We both took out some work, and plied a mute and diligent task. The white wood work-box of old days was now replaced by one inlaid with precious mosaic, and furnished with implements of gold. The tiny and trembling fingers that could scarce guide the needle, though tiny still, were now swift and skilful. But there was the same busy knitting of the brow, the same little dainty mannerisms, the same quick turns and movements, now to replace a stray tress, and anon to shake from the silken skirt some imaginary atom of dust, some clinging fibre of thread. That morning I was disposed for silence. The austere fury of the winter day had on me an awing, hushing influence. That passion of January, so white and so bloodless, was not yet spent. The storm had roared itself hoarse, but seemed no nearer exhaustion. 
had Ginevra Farnshaw been my companion in that drawing-room, she would not have suffered me to muse and listen undisturbed. The presence just gone from us would have been her theme, and how she would have wrung the changes on one topic, how she would have pursued and pestered me with questions and surmises, worried and oppressed me with comments and confidences I did not want and longed to avoid. Paulina Mary cast once or twice towards me a quiet but penetrating glance of her dark, full eye. Her lips half opened, as if to the impulse of coming utterance. But she saw, and delicately respected my inclination for silence. This will not hold long, I thought to myself, for I was not accustomed to find in women or girls any power of self-control or strength of self-denial. As far as I knew them, the chance of a gossip about their usually trivial secrets, the often very washy and paltry feelings, was a treat not to be readily foregone. The little countess promised an exception. She sewed till she was tired of sewing, and then she took a book. As chance would have it, she had sought it in Dr. Breton's own compartment of the bookcase, and it proved to be an old Breton book, some illustrated work of natural history. Often had I seen her standing at Graham's side, resting that volume on his knee and reading to his tuition, and when the lesson was over, begging as a treat that he would tell her all about the pictures. I watched her keenly. Here was a true test of that memory she had boasted. Would her recollections now be faithful? Faithful. It could not be doubted. As she turned the leaves, over her face passed gleam after gleam of expression, the least intelligent of which was a full greeting to the past. And then she turned to the title page, and looked at the name written in the schoolboy hand. She looked at it long, nor was she satisfied with merely looking. She gently passed over the characters the tips of her fingers, accompanying the action with an unconscious but tender smile, which converted the touch into a caress. Paulina loved the past, but the peculiarity of this little scene was that she said nothing. She could feel without pouring out her feelings in a flux of words. She now occupied herself at the bookcase for nearly an hour, taking down volume after volume and renewing her acquaintance with each. This done, she seated herself on a low stool, rested her cheek on her hand, and thought, and still was mute. The sound of the front door opened below, a rush of cold wind, and her father's voice, speaking to Mrs. Breton in the hall, startled her at last. She sprang up. She was downstairs in one second. Papa! Papa! You are not going out? My pet, I must go into town. But it is too, too cold, Papa. And then I heard Monsieur de Bassompierre showing to her how he was well provided against the weather and how he was going to have the carriage, and to be quite snugly sheltered, and, in short, proving that she need not fear for his comfort. But you will promise to come back here this evening, before it is quite dark, you and Dr. Breton both, in the carriage. It is not fit to ride. Well, if I see the doctor, I will tell him a lady has laid on him her commands to take care of his precious health and come home early under my escort. Yes, you must say a lady and he will think it is his mother, and be obedient. And papa, mind to come soon, for I shall watch and listen. The door closed, and the carriage rolled softly through the snow, and back returned the countess, pensive and anxious. She did listen and watch when evening closed, but it was in stillest sort, walking the drawing-room with quite noiseless step. She checked at intervals her velvet march, inclined her ear, and consulted the night sounds, I should rather say the night silence, for now at last the wind was fallen. The sky, relieved of its avalanche, lay naked and pale. Through the barren boughs of the avenue we could see it well, and note also the polar splendour of the new year moon, an orb white as a world of ice. Nor was it late when we saw also the return of the carriage. Paulina had no dance of welcome for this evening. It was with a sort of gravity that she took immediate possession of her father as he entered the room, but she at once made him her entire property, led him to the seat of her choice, and while softly showering round him honeyed words of commendation for being so good and coming home so soon, you would have thought it was entirely by the power of her little hands she was put into his chair and settled and arranged. 
for the strong man seemed to take pleasure in wholly yielding himself to this dominion, potent only by love. Graham did not appear till some minutes after the count. Paulina half turned when his step was heard. They spoke, but only a word or two. Their fingers met a moment, but obviously with slight contact. Paulina remained beside her father. Graham threw himself into a seat on the other side of the room. It was well that Mrs. Breton and Mr. Home had a great deal to say to each other, almost an inexhaustible fund of discourse and old recollections. Otherwise, I think, our party would have been but a still one that evening. After tea, Paulina's quick needle and pretty golden thimble were busily plied by the lamplight, but her tongue rested, and her eyes seemed reluctant to raise often their lids, so smooth and so full-fringed. Graham, too, must have been tired with his day's work. He listened dutifully to his elders and betters, said very little himself, and followed with his eye the gilded glance of Paulina's thimble, as if it had been some bright moth on the wing, or the golden head of some darting yellow serpent. End of chapter 25、Chapter、Chapter of Chapter recording is in the public domain. Villette by Charlotte Bronte, Chapter Twenty Six, A Burial. From this date, my life did not want variety. I went out a good deal, with the entire consent of Madame Beck, who perfectly approved the grade of my acquaintance. That worthy directress had never, from the first, treated me otherwise than with respect, and when she found that I was liable to frequent invitations from a chateau and a great hotel. Respect improved into distinction. Not that she was fulsome about it. Madame, in all things worldly, was in nothing weak. There was measure and sense in her hottest pursuit of self-interest, calm and considerateness in her closest clutch of gain. Without then laying herself open to my contempt as a time server and a toady, she marked with tact that she was pleased people connected with her establishment should frequent such associates as must cultivate and elevate rather than those who might deteriorate and depress she never praised either me or my friends only once when she was sitting in the sun in the garden a cup of coffee at her elbow and the gazette in her hand looking very comfortable and i came up and asked leave of absence for the evening She delivered herself in this gracious sort. Oui, oui, ma bonne amie, je vous donne la permission de cœur et de gré. Votre travail dans ma maison a toujours été admirable, rempli de zèle et de discrétion. Vous avez bien le droit de vous amuser. Sortez donc tant que vous voudrez. Quant à votre choix de connaissances, j'en suis contente. C'est sage, digne, laudable. She closed her lips and resumed the gazette. The reader will not too gravely regard the little circumstance that about this time the triply enclosed packet of five letters temporarily disappeared from my bureau. Blank dismay was naturally my first sensation on making the discovery, but in a moment I took heart of grace. Patience, whispered I to myself. Let me say nothing but wait peaceably. They will come back again, and they did come back. They had only been on a short visit to Madame's chamber. Having passed their examination, they came back duly and truly. I found them all right the next day. I wonder what she thought of my correspondence. What estimate did she form of Doctor John Breton's epistolary powers? In what light did the often very pithy thoughts? The generally sound and sometimes original opinions, set without pretension in an easily flowing, spirited style, appear to her. How did she like that genial, half humorous vein, which to me gave such delight? What did she think of the few kind words scattered here and there, not thickly as the diamonds were scattered in the valley of Sindbad, but sparely as those gems lie in unfabled beds? Oh, Madame Beck. How seemed these things to you? I think in Madame Beck's eyes the five letters found a certain favour. One day, after she borrowed them of me, in speaking of so suave a little woman, one ought to use suave terms, 
I caught her examining me with a steady, contemplative gaze, a little puzzled, but not at all malevolent. It was during that brief space between lessons, when the pupils turned out into the court for a quarter of an hour's recreation. She and I remained in the first class alone. When I met her eye, her thoughts forced themselves partially through her lips. Il y a, said she, quelque chose de bien remarquable dans le caractère anglais. How, madame? She gave a little laugh, repeating the word how in English. Je ne saurais vous dire how, mais enfin, les Anglais ont des idées à eux, en amitié, en amour, en tout. Mais au moins, il n'est pas besoin de les surveiller, she added, getting up and trotting away like the compact little pony she was. Then I hope, murmured I to myself. You will graciously let alone my letters for the future. Alas! Something came rushing into my eyes, dimming utterly their vision, blotting from sight the schoolroom, the garden, the bright winter sun, as I remembered that never more would letters such as she had read come to me. I had seen the last of them, that goodly river on whose banks I had sojourned, of whose waves a few reviving drops had trickled to my lips, was bending to another course. It was leaving my little hut and field forlorn and sand dry, pouring its wealth of waters far away. The change was right, just, natural. Not a word could be said. But I loved my Rhine, my Nile. I'd almost worshipped my Ganges, and I grieved that the great tide should roll estranged, should vanish like a false mirage. Though stoical, I was not quite a stoic. Drops streamed fast on my hands, on my desk. I wept one sultry shower, heavy and brief. But soon I said to myself, The hope I am bemoaning suffered and made me suffer much. It did not die till it was full time. Following an agony so lingering, death ought to be welcome. Welcome I endeavoured to make it. Indeed, Long pain had made patience a habit. In the end I closed the eyes of my dead, covered its face, and composed its limbs with great calm. The letters, however, must be put away, out of sight. People who have undergone bereavement always jealously gather together and lock away mementos. It is not supportable to be stabbed to the heart each moment by sharp revival of regret. One vacant holiday afternoon, the Thursday, going to my treasure, with intent to consider its final disposal. I perceived, and this time with a strong impulse of displeasure, that it had been again tampered with. The packet was there, indeed, but the ribbon which secured it had been untied and retied, and by other symptoms I knew that my drawer had been visited. This was a little too much. Madame Beck herself was the soul of discretion, besides having as strong a brain and sound a judgment as ever furnished a human head. That she should know the contents of my casket was not pleasant, but might be borne. Little Jesuit inquisitress as she was, she could see things in a true light, and understand them in an unperverted sense. But the idea that she had ventured to communicate information thus gained to others, that she had perhaps amused herself with a companion over documents, in my eyes most sacred, shocked me cruelly. Yet that such was the case I now saw reason to fear. I even guessed her confidant. Her kinsman, Monsieur Paul Emmanuel, had spent yesterday evening with her. She was much in the habit of consulting him, and of discussing with him matters she broached to no one else. This very morning, in class, that gentleman had favoured me with a glance which he seemed to have borrowed from Vashti, the actress. I had not at the moment comprehended that blue yet lurid flash out of his angry eye, but I read its meaning now. He, I believed, was not apt to regard what concerned me from a fair point of view, nor to judge me with tolerance and candour. I had always found him severe and suspicious. The thought that these letters, mere friendly letters as they were, had fallen once and might fall again into his hands, jarred my very soul. What should I do to prevent this? In what corner of this strange house was it possible to find security or secrecy? 
Where could a key be, a safeguard, or a padlock, a barrier? And the grenier? No, I did not like the grenier. Besides, most of the boxes and drawers there were mouldering and did not lock. Rats, too, gnawed their way through the decayed wood, and mice made nests amongst the litter of their contents. My dear letters, most dear still, though Ichabod was written on their covers, might be consumed by vermin. Certainly the writing would soon become obliterated by damp. No, the grenier would not do. But where, then? While pondering this problem, I sat in the dormitory window-seat. It was a fine, frosty afternoon. The winter sun, already setting, gleamed pale on the tops of the garden shrubs in the Allée de Fondue. One great old pear-tree, the nun's pear-tree, stood up a tall dryad skeleton, grey, gaunt, and stripped. A thought struck me, one of those queer fantastic thoughts that will sometimes strike solitary people. I put on my bonnet, cloak, and furs, and went out into the city, bending my steps to the old historical quarter of the town, whose hoax and overshadowed precincts I always sought by instinct in melancholy moods. I wandered on from street to street, till, having crossed a half-deserted place or square, I found myself before a sort of broker's shop, an ancient place full of ancient things. What I wanted was a metal box which might be soldered, or a thick glass jar or bottle which might be stoppered or sealed hermetically. Amongst miscellaneous heaps, I found and purchased the latter article. I then made a little roll of my letters wrapped them in oiled silk, bound them with twine, and, having put them in the bottle, got the old Jew broker to stopper, seal, and make it air tight. While obeying my directions, he glanced at me now and then suspiciously from under his frost-white eyelashes. I believe he thought there was some evil deed on hand. In all this I had a dreary something, not pleasure, but a sad, lonely satisfaction. The impulse under which I acted, the mood controlling me, was similar to the impulse and the mood which had induced me to visit the confessional. With quick walking I regained the pensionnat just at dark, and in time for dinner. At seven o'clock the moon rose. At half-past seven, when the pupils and teachers were at study, and Madame Beck was with her mother and children in the salle à manger, when the half-boarders were all gone home, and Rosine had left the vestibule, and all was still, I shawled myself, and taking the sealed jar, stole out through the first-class door, into the berceau, and thence into the Allée des Fondus. Methuselah, the pear-tree, stood at the further end of this walk, near my seat. He rose up, dim and grey, above the lower shrubs round him. Now Methuselah, though so very old, was of sound timber still, only there was a hole, or rather a deep hollow, near his root. I knew there was such a hollow, hidden partly by ivy and creepers growing thick round, and there I meditated hiding my treasure. But I was not only going to hide a treasure, I meant also to bury a grief. That grief over which I had lately been weeping, as I wrapped it in its winding-sheet, must be interred. Well, I cleared away the ivy and found the hole. It was large enough to receive the jar, and I thrust it deep in. In a tool-shed at the bottom of the garden lay the relics of building materials, left by masons lately employed to repair a part of the premises. I fetched thence a slate and some mortar, put the slate on the hollow, secured it with cement, covered the hole with black mould, and finally replaced the ivy. This done, I rested, leaning against the tree, lingering, like any other mourner, beside a newly sordid grave. The air of the night was very still but dim with a peculiar mist which changed the moonlight into a luminous haze. In this air or this mist there was some quality, electrical, perhaps, which acted in strange sort upon me. I felt then as I had felt a year ago in England, on a night when the aurora borealis was streaming and sweeping round heaven, when, belated in lonely fields, I had paused to watch that mustering of an army with banners, that quivering of serried lances, that swift ascent of messengers from below the North Star to the dark high keystone of heaven's arch. I felt not happy, far otherwise, but strong with reinforced strength. If life be a war, 
it seemed my destiny to conduct it single-handed. I pondered now how to break up my winter quarters, to leave an encampment where food and forage failed. Perhaps to effect this change another pitched battle must be fought with fortune. If so, I had a mind to the encounter. Too poor to lose, God might destine me to gain. But what road was open? What plan available? On this question I was still pausing, when the moon, so dim hitherto, seemed to shine out somewhat brighter. A ray gleamed even white before me, and a shadow became distinct and marked. I looked more narrowly to make out the cause of this well-defined contrast, appearing a little suddenly in the obscure alley. Whiter and blacker it grew on my eye. It took shape with instantaneous transformation. I stood about three yards from a tall, sable-robed, snowy-veiled woman. Five minutes passed. I neither fled nor shrieked. She was there still. I spoke. "'Who are you? And why do you come to me?' She stood mute. She had no face, no features. All below her brow was masked with white cloth. But she had eyes, and they viewed me. I felt, if not brave, yet a little desperate, and desperation will often suffice to fill the post and do the work of courage. I advanced one step. I stretched out my hand, for I meant to touch her. She seemed to recede. I drew nearer. Her recession, still silent, became swift. A mass of shrubs, full-leaved evergreens, laurel and dense yew, intervened between me and what I followed. Having passed that obstacle, I looked and saw nothing. I waited. I said, If you have any errand to men, come back and deliver it. Nothing spoke or reappeared. This time there was no Dr. John to whom to have recourse. There was no one to whom I dared whisper the words, I have again seen the nun. Paulina Mary sought my frequent presence in the Rue Cressy. In the old Breton days, though she had never professed herself fond of me, my society had soon become to her a sort of unconscious necessary. I used to notice that if I withdrew to my room, she would speedily come trotting after me, and opening the door and peeping in, say with her little peremptory accent, "'Come down. Why do you sit here by yourself? You must come into the parlour. In the same spirit, she urged me now. "'Leave the Rue Fossette,' she said, "'and come and live with us. Papa would give you far more than Madame Beck gives you.' Mr. Home himself offered me a handsome sum, thrice my present salary, if I would accept the office of companion to his daughter. I declined. I think I should have declined had I been poorer than I was, and with scantier fund of resource, more stinted narrowness of future prospect. I had not that vocation. I could teach, I could give lessons, but to be either a private governess or a companion was unnatural to me. Rather than fill the former post in any great house, I would deliberately have taken a housemaid's place, bought a strong pair of gloves, swept bedrooms and staircases, and cleaned stoves and locks, in peace and independence. Rather than be a companion, I would have made shirts and starved. I was no bright lady's shadow, not Mr. Bassompierre's. Overcast enough it was my nature often to be. Of a subdued habit I was, but the dimness and depression must both be voluntary. Such as kept me docile at my desk, in the midst of my now well-accustomed pupils in Madame Beck's first class, or alone at my own bedside, in her dormitory, or in the alley and seat which were called mine, in her garden. My qualifications were not convertible, nor adaptable. They could not be made the foil of any gem, the adjunct of any beauty, the appendage of any greatness in Christendom. Madame Beck and I, without assimilating, understood each other well. I was not her companion, nor her children's governess. She left me free, she tied me to nothing not to herself, not even to her interests. Once, when she had for a fortnight been called from home by a near relation's illness, and on her return all anxious and full of care about her establishment, lest something in her absence should have gone wrong, finding that matters had proceeded much as usual, and that there was no evidence of glaring neglect, she made each of the teachers a present, an acknowledgment of steadiness. To my bedside she came at twelve o'clock that night, 
and told me she had no present for me. "'I must make fidelity advantageous to the St. Pierre,' said she. "'If I attempt to make it advantageous to you, there will arise misunderstanding between us, perhaps separation. One thing, however, I can do to please you. Leave you alone with your liberty. C'est ce que je ferai.' She kept her word. Every slight shackle she had ever laid on me, she from that time with quiet hand removed. Thus I had pleasure in voluntarily respecting her rules, gratification in devoting double time, and taking double pains with the pupil she committed to my charge. As to Mary de Bassompierre, I visited her with pleasure, though I would not live with her. My visits soon taught me that it was unlikely even my occasional and voluntary society would long be indispensable to her. Monsieur de Bassompierre, for his part, seemed impervious to this conjecture, blind to this possibility, unconscious as any child to the signs, the likelihoods, the fitful beginnings of what, when it drew to an end, he might not approve. Whether or not he would cordially approve, I used to speculate. Difficult to say. He was much taken up with scientific interests, keen, intent, and somewhat repugnant in what concerned his favourite pursuits, but unsuspicious and trustful in the ordinary affairs of life. From all I could gather, he seemed to regard his daughterling as still but a child, and probably had not yet admitted the notion that others might look on her in a different light. He would speak of what should be done when Polly was a woman, when she should be grown up, and Polly, standing beside his chair, would sometimes smile and take his honoured head between her little hands and kiss his iron-grey locks and at other times she would pout and toss her curls. But she never said, "'Papa, I am grown up.' She had different moods for different people. With her father she really was still a child, or childlike, affectionate, merry, and playful. With me she was serious, and as womanly as thought and feeling could make her. With Mrs. Breton she was docile and reliant, but not expansive. With Graham she was shy, at present very shy. At moments she tried to be cold, on occasion she endeavoured to shun him. His step made her start, his entrance hushed her. When he spoke her answers failed of fluency. When he took leave she remained self-vexed and disconcerted. Even her father noticed this demeanour in her. "'My little Polly,' he said once, "'you live too retired a life. If you grow to be a woman with these shy manners you will hardly be fitter for society.' You really make quite a stranger of Dr. Breton. How is this? Don't you remember that as a little girl you used to be rather partial to him? Rather, papa, echoed she, with her slightly dry, yet gentle and simple tone. And you don't like him now? What has he done? Nothing. Yes, I like him a little. But we are grown strange to each other. Then rub it off, Polly. Rub the rust and the strangeness off talk away when he is here and have no fear of him he does not talk much is he afraid of me do you think papa oh to be sure what man would not be afraid of such a little silent lady then tell him some day not to mind my being silent say that it is my way and that i have no unfriendly intention your way you little chatterbox so far from being your way it is only your whim well i'll improve papa and very pretty was the grace with which the next day she tried to keep her word. I saw her make the effort to converse affably with Dr. John on general topics. The attention called into her guest's face a pleasurable glow. He met her with caution, and replied to her in his softest tones, as if there was a kind of gossamer happiness hanging in the air which he feared to disturb by drawing too deep a breath. Certainly, in her timid yet earnest advance to friendship, it could not be denied that there was a most exquisite and fairy charm. When the doctor was gone, she approached her father's chair. Did I keep my word, papa? Did I behave better? My Polly behaved like a queen. I shall become quite proud of her if this improvement continues. By and by we shall see her receiving my guests with quite a calm, grand manner. Miss Lucy and I will have to look about us and polish up all our best airs and graces lest we should be thrown into the shade. Still, Polly, there is a little flutter, 
a little tendency to stammer now and then, and even to lisp, as you lisp when you were six years old. No, papa, interrupted she indignantly. That can't be true. I appeal to Miss Lucy. Did she not, in answering Dr. Breton's question as to whether she has ever seen the palace of the Prince de Boiletin, said, Yes, she had been there several times? Papa, you are satirical, you are machant. I can pronounce all the letters of the alphabet as clearly as you can. But tell me this, you are very particular in making me be civil to Dr. Breton. Do you like him yourself? To be sure. For old acquaintance sake I like him. Then he's a very good son to his mother. Besides being a kind-hearted fellow and clever in his profession, yes, the callant is well enough. Callant! Ah, oh, Scotchman! Papa, is it the Edinburgh? or the Aberdeen accent you have. Both, my pet, both, and doubtless the Glaswegian into the bargain. It is that which enables me to speak French so well. A good Scots tongue always succeeds well with the French. The French! Scotch again. Incorrigible, papa. You too need schooling. Well, Polly, you must persuade Miss Snow to undertake both you and me to make you steady and womanly, and me refined and classical." The light in which Monsieur de Bassompierre evidently regarded Miss Snow used to occasion me much inward edification. What contradictory attributes of character we sometimes find ascribed to us, according to the eye with which we are viewed! Madame Beck esteemed me learned in blue, Miss Fanshawe caustic, iron, and cynical, Mr. Home a model teacher, the essence of the sedate and discreet, somewhat conventional, perhaps, too strict, limited, and scrupulous, but still the pink and pattern of governess correctness, whilst another person, Professor Paul Emmanuel, to wit, never lost an opportunity of intimating his opinion that mine was rather a fiery and rash nature, adventurous, indocile, and audacious. I smiled at them all. If any one knew me, it was little Paulina Mary. As I would not be Paulina's nominal and paid companion, genial and harmonious as I began to find her intercourse, she persuaded me to join her in some study, as a regular and settled means of sustaining communication. She proposed the German language, which, like myself, she found difficult of mastery. We agreed to take our lessons in the Rue Crecy, of the same mistress. This arrangement threw us together for some hours of every week. Monsieur de Bassompierre seemed quite pleased. It perfectly met his approbation that Madame Minerva Gravity should associate a portion of her leisure with that of his fair and dear child. That other self-elected judge of mine, the professor in the Rue Fossette, discovering by some surreptitious spying means that I was no longer so stationary as hitherto, but went out regularly at certain hours of certain days, took it upon himself to place me under surveillance. People said Monsieur Emmanuel had been brought up amongst Jesuits. I should more readily have accredited this report had his manoeuvres been better masked. As it was, I doubted it. Never was a more undisguised schemer, a franker, looser intriguer. He would analyse his own machinations, elaborately contrive plots, and forthwith indulge in explanatory boasts of their skill. I know not whether I was more amused or provoked by his stepping up to me one morning and whispering solemnly that he had his eye on me. He at least would discharge the duty of a friend and not leave me entirely to my own devices. My proceedings seemed at present very unsettled. He did not know what to make of them. He taught his cousin Beck very much to blame in suffering this sort of fluttering inconsistency in a teacher attached to her house. What had a person devoted to a serious calling that of education to do with counts and countesses hotels and chateaux to him i seemed altogether en l'air on his faith he believed i went out six days in the seven i said monsieur exaggerated i certainly had enjoyed the advantage of a little change lately 
but not before it had become necessary, and the privilege was by no means exercised in excess. Necessary! How was it necessary? I was well enough, he supposed. Change in necessary. He would recommend me to look at the Catholic religious and study their lives. They ask no change. I am no judge of what expression crossed my face when he thus spoke, but it was one which provoked him. He accused me of being reckless, worldly, and epicurean, ambitious of greatness, and feverishly athirst for the pomps and vanities of life. It seems I had no dévouement, no reclument in my character, no spirit of grace, faith, sacrifice, or self-abasement. Feeling the inutility of answering these charges, I merely continued the correction of a pile of English exercises. He could see me nothing Christian. Like many other Protestants, I revelled in the pride and self-will of paganism. I slightly turned from him, nestling still closer under the wing of silence. A vague sound grumbled between his teeth. It could not surely be a juron. He was too religious for that. But I am certain I heard the word sacré. Grievous to relate, the same word was repeated with the unequivocal addition of mille something, when I passed him about two hours afterwards in the corridor, prepared to go and take my German lesson in the Rue Crecy. Never was a better little man in some points than Monsieur Paul, never in others a more waspish little despot. Our German mistress, Fräulein Anna Braun, was a worthy, hearty woman of about forty-five. She ought, perhaps, to have lived in the days of Queen Elizabeth, as she habitually consumed for her first and second breakfasts beer and beef. Also, her direct and downright Deutsch nature seemed to suffer a sensation of cruel restraint from what she called our English reserve, though we thought we were very cordial with her. But we did not slap her on the shoulder, and if we consented to kiss her cheek, it was done quietly and without any explosive smack. These omissions oppressed and depressed her considerably. Still, on the whole, we got on very well. Accustomed to instruct foreign girls, who hardly ever will think and study for themselves, who have no idea of grappling with a difficulty and overcoming it by dint of reflection or application, our progress, which in truth was very leisurely, seemed to astound her. In her eyes we were a pair of glacial prodigies, cold, proud, and preternatural. The young countess was a little proud, a little fastidious, and perhaps with her native delicacy and beauty she had a right to these feelings. But I think it was a total mistake to ascribe them to me. I never evaded the morning salute which Paulina would slip when she could. Nor was a certain little manner of still disdain a weapon known in my armoury of defence, whereas Paulina always kept it clear, fine, and bright, and any rough German sally called forth at once its steely glisten. Honest Anna Brown, in some measure, felt this difference, and while she half feared, half worshipped Paulina as a sort of dainty nymph, an undine, she took refuge with me as a being all mortal and of easier mood. A book we liked well to read and translate was Schiller's Ballads. Paulina soon learned to read them beautifully. The Fräulein would listen to her with a broad smile of pleasure, and say her voice sounded like music. She translated them, too, with a facile flow of language, and in a strain of kindred and poetic fervour. Her cheek would flush, her lips tremblingly smile, her beauteous eyes kindle or melt as she went on. She learnt the best by heart, and would often recite them when we were alone together. One she liked well was Des Mädchens Klage. That is, she liked well to repeat the words. She found plaintive melody in the sound. The sense she would criticise. She murmured as we sat over the fire one evening, Du Heilige, rufe dein Kind zurück. Ich habe genossen, das ihr dich gruck, ich habe geliebt und gelibet. Lived and loved, said she. Is that the summit of earthly happiness, the end of life? To love? I don't think it is. It may be the extreme of mortal misery, it may be sheer waste of time, and fruitless torture of feeling. 
If Schiller had said to be loved, he might have come nearer the truth. Is not that another thing, Lucy? To be loved. I suppose it may be. But why consider the subject? What is love to you? What do you know about it? She crimsoned, half in irritation, half in shame. Now, Lucy, she said, I won't take that from you. It may be well for Papa to look on me as a baby. I rather prefer that he should thus view me. But you know, and shall learn to acknowledge, that I am verging on my nineteenth year. No matter if it were your twenty-ninth. We will anticipate no feelings by discussion and conversation. We will not talk about love. Indeed, indeed, said she, all in a hurry and heat. You may think to check and hold me in, as much as you please, but I have talked about it, and heard about it too, and a great deal, and lately, and disagreeably, and detrimentally, and in a way you wouldn't approve. And the vexed, triumphant, pretty, naughty being laughed. I could not discern what she meant, and I would not ask her. I was nonplussed. Seeing, however, the utmost innocence in her countenance, combined with some transient perverseness and petulance, I said at last, Who talks to you disagreeably and detrimentally on such matters? Who that has near access to you would dare to do it? Lucy, replied she more softly, It is a person who makes me miserable sometimes, and I wish she would keep away. I don't want her. But who, Paulina, can it be? You puzzle me much. It is... it is my cousin Genevra. Every time she asks on leave to visit Miss Chumley, she calls here, and whenever she finds me alone she begins to talk about her admirers. Love, indeed! You should hear all she has to say about love. Oh, I have heard it, said I, quite coolly. And on the whole, perhaps, it is as well you should have heard it, too. It is not to be regretted. It is all right. Yet surely Ginevra's mind cannot influence yours. You can look over both her head and her heart. She does influence me very much. She has the art of disturbing my happiness and unsettling my opinions. She hurts me through the feelings and people dearest to me. What does she say, Paulina? Give me some idea. There may be counteraction of the damage done. The people I have longest and most esteemed are degraded by her. She does not spare Mrs. Breton. She does not spare— Graham. No, I dare say. And how does she mix up these with her sentiment and her love? She does mix them, I suppose. Lucy, she is insolent, and, I believe, false. You know Dr. Breton. We both know him. He may be careless and proud, but when was he ever mean or slavish? Day after day she shows him to me kneeling at her feet, pursuing her like her shadow. She repulsing him with insult, and he imploring her with infatuation. Lucy, is it true? Is any of it true? It may be true that he once thought her handsome. Does she give him out as still her suitor? She says she might marry him any day. He only waits her consent. It is these tales which have caused that reserve in your manner towards Graham which your father noticed. They have certainly made me all doubtful about his character. As Ginevra speaks, they do not carry with them the sound of unmixed truth. I believe she exaggerates, perhaps invents, but I want to know how far— Suppose we bring Miss Fanshawe to some proof. Give her an opportunity of displaying the power she boasts. I could do that to-morrow. Papa has asked some gentleman to dinner, or savants. Graham, who Papa is beginning to discover, is a savant too. Skilled, they say, in more than one branch of science, is among the number. Now I should be miserable to sit at table unsupported amidst such a party. I could not talk to Messieurs A and C, the Parisian academicians, while my new credit for manner would be put in peril. You and Mrs. Breton must come for my sake. Ginevra, at a word, will join you. Yes, then I will carry a message of invitation, and she shall have the chance of justifying her character for veracity. End of chapter 26《The morrow turned out a more lively and busy day than we, or than I at least, had anticipated. It seems it was the birthday of one of the young princes of Le Basseur, the eldest, I think, the Duc de Dondondo, 
and a general holiday was given in his honour at the schools, and especially at the principal Athenie, or college. The youth of that institution had also concocted, and were to present a loyal address, for which purpose they were to be assembled in the public building where the yearly examinations were conducted, and the prizes distributed. After the ceremony of presentation, an oration, or discours, was to follow from one of the professors. Several of Monsieur de Bassompierre's friends, the savants, being more or less connected with the Athenie, they were expected to attend on this occasion, together with the worshipful municipality of Villette, Monsieur le Chevalier Star, the burgomaster, and the parents and kinsfolk of the Athenians in general. Monsieur de Bassompierre was engaged by his friends to accompany them. His fair daughter would, of course, be of the party, and she wrote a little note to Ginevra and myself, bidding us come early that we might join her. As Miss Farnshaw and I were dressing in the dormitory of the Rue Fossette, she, Miss F., suddenly burst into a laugh. "'What now?' I asked, for she had suspended the operation of arranging her attire, and was gazing at me. "'It seems so odd.' she replied, with her usual half-honest, half-insolent unreserve, that you and I should now be so much on a level, visiting in the same sphere, having the same connections. Why, yes, said I. I had not much respect for the connections you chiefly frequented a while ago. Mrs. Chumley and co. would never have suited me at all. Who are you, Miss Snow? she inquired, in a tone of such undisguised and unsophisticated curiosity has made me laugh in my turn. You used to call yourself a nursery governess. When you first came here, you really had the care of the children in this house. I have seen you carry little Georgette in your arms like a bun. Few governesses would have condescended so far. And now Madame Beck treats you with more courtesy than she treats the Parisienne St. Pierre, and that proud shit my cousin makes you her bosom friend. Wonderful, I agreed, much amused at her mystification. Who am I, indeed? Perhaps a personage in disguise. Pity I don't look the character. I wonder you are not more flattered by all this, she went on. You take it with strange composure. If you really are the nobody I once thought you, you must be a cool hand. The nobody you once thought me, I repeated, and my face grew a little hot. But I would not be angry. Of what importance was a schoolgirl's crude use of the terms nobody and somebody? I confined myself, therefore, to the remark that I had merely met with civility, and asked what she saw in civility to throw the recipient into a fever of confusion. One can't help wondering at some things, she persisted. Wondering at marvels of your own manufacture. Are you ready at last? Yes. Let me take your arm. I would rather not. We will walk side by side. When she took my arm, she always leaned upon me her whole weight, and as I was not a gentleman or her lover, I did not like it. There again, she cried. I thought by offering to take your arm to intimate approbation of your dress and general appearance. I meant it as a compliment. You did. You mean, in short, to express that you are not ashamed to be seen in the street with me? that if Mrs. Chumley should be fondling her lapdog at some window, or Colonel de Hamal picking his teeth in a balcony, and should catch a glimpse of us, you would not quite blush for your companion. Yes, said she, with that directness which was her best point, which gave an honest plainness to her very fibs when she told them, which was, in short, the salt, the sole preservative ingredient of a character otherwise not formed to keep. I delegated the trouble of commenting on this yes to my countenance, or rather my under-lip voluntarily anticipated my tongue, of course. Reverence and solemnity were not the feelings expressed in the look I gave her. Scornful, sneering creature, she went on, as we crossed a great square, and entered the quiet, pleasant park, our nearest way to the Rue Crecy. Nobody in this world was ever such a Turk to me as you are. You bring it on yourself. Let me alone. Have the sense to be quiet. I will let you alone. As if one could let you alone, when you are so peculiar and so mysterious. The mystery and peculiarity being entirely the conception of your own brain, 
maggots neither more nor less be so good as to keep them out of my sight but are you anybody persevered she pushing her hand in spite of me under my arm and that arm pressed itself with inhospitable closeness against my side by way of keeping out the intruder yes i said i am a rising character once an old lady's companion then a nursery governess now a school-teacher do do tell me who you are i'll not repeat it she urged adhering with ludicrous tenacity to the wise notion of an incognito she had got hold of and she squeezed the arm of which she had now obtained full possession and coaxed and conjured till i was obliged to pause in the park to laugh throughout our walk she rang the most fanciful changes on this theme proving by her obstinate credulity or incredulity her incapacity to conceive how any person not bolstered up by birth or wealth not supported by some consciousness of name or connection could maintain an attitude of reasonable integrity as for me it quite sufficed to my mental tranquillity that i was known where it imported that known i should be the rest sat on me easily pedigree social position and recondite intellectual acquisition occupied about the same space and place in my interests and thoughts they were my third-class lodgers to whom could be assigned only the small sitting-room and the little back bedroom even if the dining and drawing-room stood empty i never confessed it to them as thinking minor accommodations better suited to their circumstances the world i soon learned held a different estimate and i make no doubt the world is very right in its view yet believe also that i am not quite wrong in mine there are people whom a lowered position degrades morally to whom loss of connection costs loss of self-respect are not these justified in placing the highest value on that station and association which is their safeguard from debasement if a man feels that he would become contemptible in his own eyes were it generally known that his ancestry was simple and not gentle poor and not rich workers and not capitalists would it be right severely to blame him for keeping these fatal facts out of sight for starting trembling quailing at the chance which threatens exposure the longer we live the more out experience widens less prone are we to judge our neighbour's conduct to question the world's wisdom wherever an accumulation of small defences is found whether surrounding the prude's virtue or the man of the world's respectability there be sure it is needed we reached the hotel crecy paulina was ready mrs breton was with her and under her escort and that of monsieur de bassompierre we were soon conducted to the place of assembly and seated in good seats at a convenient distance from the tribune the youth of the atene were marshalled before us the municipality and their burgemaster were in places of honour the young princes with their tutors occupied a conspicuous position and the body of the building was crowded with the aristocracy and the first burghers of the town concerning the identity of the professor by whom the discours was to be delivered i had as yet entertained neither care nor question some vague expectation i had that a savant would stand up and deliver a formal speech half dogmatism to the athenians half flattery to the princes the tribune was yet empty when we entered but in ten minutes after it was filled suddenly in a second of time a head chest and arms grew above the crimson desk this head i knew its colour shape port expression were familiar both to me and miss fanshawe the blackness and closeness of cranium the amplitude and paleness of brow the blueness and fire of glance were details so domesticated in the memory and so knit with many a whimsical association as almost by this their sudden apparition to tickle fancy to a laugh indeed i confess for my part i did laugh till i was warm but then i bent my head and made my handkerchief in a lowered veil the sole confidence of my mirth i think i was glad to see monsieur paul i think it was rather pleasant than otherwise to behold him set up there fierce and frank dark and candid testy and fearless as when regnant on his estrade in class his presence was such a surprise i had not once thought of expecting him though i knew he filled the chair of bellette in the college with him in that tribune i felt sure that neither formalism nor flattery would be our doom but for what was vouchsafed us for what was poured suddenly rapidly continuously on our heads 
I own I was not prepared. He spoke to the princes, the nobles, the magistrates, and the burghers, with just the same ease, with almost the same pointed choleric earnestness, with which he was wont to harangue the three divisions of the Rue Fossette. The collegians he addressed, not as schoolboys, but as future citizens and embryo patriots. The times which have since come on Europe had not been foretold yet, and Monsieur Emmanuel's spirit seemed new to me. Who would have thought the flat and fat soil of Le Bassacur could yield political convictions and national feelings such as were now strongly expressed? Of the bearing of his opinions I need here give no special indication. Yet it may be permitted me to say that I believed the little man not more earnest than right in what he said. With all his fire he was severe and sensible. He trampled utopian theories under his heel. He rejected wild dreams with scorn. But when he looked in the face of tyranny, oh, then there opened a light in his eye worth seeing. And when he spoke of injustice, his voice gave no uncertain sound, but reminded me rather of the band trumpet, ringing at twilight from a park. I do not think his audience were generally susceptible of sharing his flame in its purity. But some of the college youth caught fire as he eloquently told them what should be their path and endeavour in their countries and in Europe's future. They gave him a long, loud, ringing cheer as he concluded. With all his fierceness, he was their favourite professor. As our party left the hall, he stood at the entrance. He saw and knew me and lifted his hat. He offered his hand in passing and uttered the words, Quand dites-vous? question eminently characteristic and reminding me even in this his moment of triumph of that inquisitive restlessness that absence of what i considered desirable self-control which were amongst his faults he should not have cared just then to ask what i thought or what anybody thought but he did care and he was too natural to conceal too impulsive to repress his wish well if i blamed his over-eagerness i liked his naivete I would have praised him. I had plenty of praise in my heart, but alas, no words on my lips. Who has words at the right moment? I stammered some lame expressions, but was truly glad when other people, coming up with profuse congratulations, covered my deficiency with their redundancy. A gentleman introduced him to Monsieur de Bassompierre, and the Count, who had likewise been highly gratified, asked him to join his friends. For the most part, Monsieur Emmanuel's likewise, and to dine with them at the Hôtel Crassy. He declined dinner, for he was a man always somewhat shy at meeting the advances of the wealthy. There was a strength of sturdy independence in the stringing of his sinews, not obtrusive but pleasant enough to discover as one advanced in knowledge of his character. He promised, however, to step in with his friend, Monsieur A., a French academician, in the course of the evening. At dinner that day, Ginevra and Paulina each looked, in her own way, very beautiful. The former, perhaps, boasted the advantage in material charms, but the latter shone pre-eminent for attractions more subtle and spiritual, for light and eloquence of eye, for grace of mien, for winning variety of expression. Ginevra's dress of deep crimson relieved well her light curls, and harmonized with her rose-like bloom. Paulina's attire, in fashion close, though faultlessly neat, but in texture clear and white, made the eye graceful for the delicate life of her complexion, for the soft animation of her countenance, for the tender depth of her eyes, for the brown shadow and bounteous flow of her hair, darker than that of her Saxon cousin, as were also her eyebrows, her eyelashes, her full eyelids, and large mobile pupils. Nature, having traced all these details slightly, and with a careless hand in Miss Vangel's case, and in Miss de Bassompierre's wrought them to a high and delicate finish. Paulina was awed by the savants, but not quite to mutism. She conversed modestly, diffidently, not without effort, but with so true a sweetness, so fine and penetrating a sense, that her father more than once suspended his own discourse to listen, and fixed on her an eye of proud delight. It was a polite Frenchman, Monsieur Z, a very learned but quite a courtly man, who had drawn her into discourse. I was charmed with her French. It was faultless, the structure correct, the idioms true, the accent pure. Ginevra, who had lived half her life on the continent, could do nothing like it. 
not that words ever failed Miss Fanshawe, but real accuracy and purity she neither possessed, nor in any number of years would acquire. Here, too, Monsieur de Bassompierre was gratified, for, on the point of language, he was critical. Another listener and observer there was, one who, detained by some exigency of his profession, had come in late to dinner. Both ladies were quietly scanned by Dr. Breton, at the moment of taking his seat at the table, and that guarded survey was more than once renewed. His arrival roused Miss Fanshawe, who had hitherto appeared listless. She now became smiling and complacent, talked, though what she said was rarely to the purpose, or rather was of a purpose somewhat mortifyingly below the standard of the occasion. Her light, disconnected prattle might have gratified Graham once. Perhaps it pleased him still. Perhaps it was only fancy which suggested the thought that, while his eye was filled and his ear fed, his taste, his keen zest, his lively intelligence, were not equally consulted and regaled. It is certain that, restless and exacting as seemed the demand on his attention, he yielded courteously to all that was required. His manner showed neither pique nor coolness. Ginevra was his neighbour, and to her, during dinner, he almost exclusively confined his notice. She appeared satisfied, and passed to the drawing-room in very good spirits. Yet no sooner had we reached that place of refuge than she again became flat and listless. Throwing herself on a couch, she denounced both the discours and the dinner as stupid affairs, and inquired of her cousin how she could hear such a set of prosaic gros bonnets as her father gathered about him. The moment the gentlemen were heard to move, her railing ceased. She started up, flew to the piano, and dashed at it with spirit. Dr. Breton entering, one of the first, took up his station beside her. I thought he would not long maintain that post. There was a position near the hearth to which I expected to see him attracted. This position he only scanned with his eye. While he looked, others drew in. The grace and mind of Polina charmed these thoughtful Frenchmen. The fineness of her beauty, the soft courtesy of her manner, her immature but real and inbred tact, pleased their national taste. They clustered about her, not indeed to talk science, which would have rendered her dumb, but to touch on many subject in letters, in arts, in actual life, on which it soon appeared that she had both read and reflected. I listened. I am sure that though Graham stood aloof, he listened too. His hearing, as well as his vision, was very fine, quick, discriminating. I knew he gathered the conversation. I felt that the mode in which it was sustained suited him exquisitely, pleased him almost to pain. In Polina there was more force, both of feeling and character, than most people thought, than Graham himself imagined, than she would ever show to those who did not wish to see it. To speak truth, reader, there is no excellent beauty, no accomplished grace, no reliable refinement, without strength as excellent, as complete, as trustworthy. As well might you look for good fruit and blossom on a rootless and sapless tree, as for charms that will endure in a feeble and relaxed nature. For a little while the blooming semblance of beauty may flourish round weakness, but it cannot bear a blast. It soon fades, even in serenest sunshine. Graham would have started had any suggestive spirit whispered of the sinew and the stamina sustaining that delicate nature. But I, who had known her as a child, knew or guessed by what a good and strong root her graces held to the firm soil of reality. While Dr. Breton listened, and waited an opening in the magic circle, his glance restlessly sweeping the room at intervals, lighted by chance on me, where I sat in a quiet nook not far from my godmother and Monsieur de Bassompierre, who, as usual, were engaged in what Mr. Home called a two-handed crack, what the Count would have interpreted as a tete-a-tete. -tete. Graham smiled recognition, crossed the room, asked me how I was, told me I looked pale. I also had my own smile at my own thought. It was now about three months since Dr. John had spoken to me, a lapse of which he was not even conscious. He sat down and became silent. His wish was rather to look than converse, Ginevra and Paulina were now opposite to him. He could gaze his fill. He surveyed both forms, studied both faces. Several new guests, ladies as well as gentlemen, had entered the room since dinner. 
dropping in for the evening conversation, and amongst the gentlemen, I may incidentally observe, I had already noticed by glimpses a severe, dark, professional outline hovering aloof in an inner saloon, seen only in vista. Monsieur Emmanuel knew many of the gentlemen present, but I think was a stranger to most of the ladies, excepting myself. In looking towards the hearth he could not but see me, and naturally made a movement to approach. Seeing, however, Dr. Breton also, he changed his mind, and held back. If that had been all, there would have been no cause for quarrel. But not satisfied with holding back, he puckered up his eyebrows, protruded his lip, and looked so ugly that I averted my eyes from the displeasing spectacle. Monsieur Joseph Emmanuel had arrived as well as his austere brother, and at this very moment was relieving Ginevra at the piano. What a master touch succeeded her schoolgirl jingle! In what grand, graceful tones the instrument acknowledged the hand of the true artist! Lucy, began Dr. Breton, breaking silence and smiling, as Ginevra glided before him, casting a glance as she passed by. Miss Fanshawe is certainly a fine girl. Of course, I assented. Is there? He pursued. Another in the room as lovely. I think there is not another as handsome. I agree with you, Lucy. You and I do often agree in opinion, in taste, I think, or at least in judgment. Do we? I said, somewhat doubtfully. I believe if you had been a boy, Lucy, instead of a girl, my mother's godson instead of her goddaughter, we would have been good friends. Our opinions would have melted into each other. He had assumed a bantering air. A light, half-caressing, half-ironic, shone aslant in his eye. Ah, oh, Graham! I have given more than one solitary moment to thoughts and calculations of your estimate of Lucy Snow. Was it always kind or just? Had Lucy been intrinsically the same, but possessing the additional advantages of wealth and station? Would your manner to her, your value for her, have been quite what they actually were? And yet by these questions I would not seriously infer blame. No, you might sadden and trouble me sometimes. But then mine was a soon depressed, an easily deranged temperament. It fell if a cloud crossed the sun. Perhaps before the eye of severe equity I should stand more at fault than you. Trying, then, to keep down the unreasonable pain which thrilled my heart, on thus being made to feel that while Graham could devote to others the most grave and earnest, the manliest interest, he had no more than light raillery for Lucy the friend of Lang Syne. I inquired calmly, on what points are we so closely in accordance? We each have an observant faculty. You perhaps don't give me credit for the possession, yet I have it. But you were speaking of tastes. We may see the same objects, yet estimate them differently? Let us bring it to the test. Of course, you cannot but render homage to the merits of Miss Fanshawe. Now, what do you think of others in the room? My mother, for instance, or the lions yonder? Messieurs A and Z, or let us say, that pale little lady, Mr. Bassompierre. You know what I think of your mother. I have not thought of Messieurs A and Z. And the other? I think she is, as you say, a pale little lady. Pale, certainly, just now, when she is fatigued with over-excitement. You don't remember her as a child? I wonder sometimes whether you do. I had forgotten her, but it is noticeable that circumstances, persons, even words and looks that had slipped your memory may, under certain conditions, certain aspects of your own or another's mind, revive. That is possible enough. Yet, he continued, the revival is imperfect, needs confirmation, partakes so much of the dim character of a dream, or of the airy one of a fancy, that the testimony of a witness becomes necessary for corroboration. Were you not a guest at Breton ten years ago, when Mr. Home brought his little girl, whom we then called little Polly, to stay with Mamma? I was there the night she came, and also the morning she went away. Rather a peculiar child, was she not? I wonder how I treated her. Was I fond of children in those days? Was there anything gracious or kindly about me? Great, reckless, schoolboy as I was? But you don't recollect me, of course. You have seen your own picture at La Terrasse. It is like you personally. In manner you were almost the same yesterday as today. But, Lucy, how is that? Such an oracle really whets my curiosity. What am I to-day? What was I the yesterday of ten years back? Gracious to whatever pleased you, and kindly or cruel to nothing. 
There you are wrong. I think I was almost a brute to you, for instance. A brute? No, Graham. I should never have patiently endured brutality. This, however, I do remember. Quiet Lucy Snow tasted nothing of my grace. As little of your cruelty. Why, had I been Nero himself, I could not have tormented a being inoffensive as a shadow. I smiled, but I also hushed a groan. Oh, I just wished he would let me alone. Cease allusion to me. These epithets, these attributes I put from me. His quiet Lucy Snow, his inoffensive shadow I gave him back, not with scorn, but with extreme weariness. Theirs was the coldness and the pressure of lead. Let him whelm me with no such weight. Happily, he was soon on another theme. On what terms were little Polly and I? Unless my recollections deceive me, we were not foes. You speak very vaguely. Do you think little Polly's memory not more definite? Oh, we don't talk of little Polly now. Pray say Miss de Bassompierre, and of course such a stately personage remembers nothing of Breton. Look at her large eyes, Lucy. Can they read a word in the page of memory? Are they the same which I used to direct to a horn book? She does not know that I partly taught her to read. In the Bible on Sunday nights? She has a calm, delicate, rather fine profile now. Once what a little, restless, anxious countenance was hers. What a thing is a child's preference. What a bubble. Would you believe it, that lady was fond of me? I think she was in some measure fond of you, said I, moderately. You don't remember, then? I had forgotten, but I remember now. She liked me the best of whatever there was at Breton. You thought so? I quite well recall it. I wish I could tell her all I recall. Or rather, I wish someone, you for instance, would go behind and whisper it all in her ear and I could have the delight here as I sit of watching her look under the intelligence. Could you manage that, think you, Lucy, and make me ever grateful? Could I manage to make you ever grateful, said I. No, I could not, and I felt my fingers work and my hands interlock. I felt, too, an inward courage, warm and resistant. In this matter I was not disposed to gratify Dr. John, not at all. With now welcome force I realized his entire misapprehension of my character and nature. He wanted always to give me a role, not mine. Nature and I opposed him. He did not at all guess what I felt. He did not read my eyes or face or gestures, though I doubt not all spoke. Leaning towards me coaxingly, he said softly, Do content me, Lucy. And I would have contented or at least I would clearly have enlightened him, and told him well never again to expect of me the part of officious soubrette in a love-drama, when following his soft, eager murmur, meeting his almost pleading, mellow, Do contempt me, Lucy. A sharp hiss pierced my ear on the other side. Petite chatte de doucerette coquette, sibilated the sudden boa constrictor. Vous avez l'air bien triste, soumis, rêveur, mais vous ne l'êtes pas. C'est moi qui vous le dis. Sauvage, la flamme à l'âme, l'éclair aux yeux. Oui, j'ai la flamme à l'âme, et je dois la voir, retorted I, turning in just wrath. But Professor Emmanuel had hissed his insult and was gone. The worst of the matter was that Dr. Breton, whose ears, as I have said, were quick and fine, caught every word of this apostrophe. He put his handkerchief to his face and laughed till he shook. "'Well done, Lucy,' cried he. "'Capital! Petit chat! Petit coquette! Oh, I must tell my mother. Is it true, Lucy, or half true? I believe it is. You read into the colour of Miss Fanshawe's gown, and really, by my word, now I examine him, that is the same little man who was so savage with you at the concert, the very same, and in his soul he is frantic at this moment because he sees me laughing. Oh, I must tease him!' And Graham, yielding to his bent for mischief, laughed, jested, and whispered on, till I could bear no more, and my eyes filled. Suddenly he was sobered. A vacant space appeared near Miss de Bassompierre. The circle surrounding her seemed about to dissolve. This movement was instantly caught by Graham's eye, ever vigilant even while laughing. He rose, took his courage in both hands, crossed the room, and made the advantage his own. Dr. John, throughout his whole life, was a man of luck a man of success. And why? Because he had the eye to see his opportunity, 
the heart to prompt to well-timed action, the nerve to consummate a perfect work. And no tyrant passion dragged him back, no enthusiasms, no foibles encumbered his way. How well he looked at this very moment, when Paulina looked up as he reached her side, her glance mingled at once with an encountering glance, animated yet modest. His colour, as he spoke to her, became half a blush, half a glow. He stood in her presence, brave and bashful, subdued and unobtrusive, yet decided in his purpose and devoted in his ardour. I gathered all this by one view. I did not prolong my observation. Time failed me, had inclination served. The night wore late. Ginevra and I ought already to have been in the Rue Fossette. I rose and bade good night to my godmother and Monsieur de Bassompierre. I know not whether Professor Emmanuel had noticed my reluctant acceptance of Dr. Breton's badinage, or whether he perceived that I was pained, and that, on the whole, the evening had not been one flow of exultant enjoyment for the volatile, pleasure-loving Mademoiselle Lucy. But as I was leaving the room, he stepped up and inquired whether I had any one to attend me to the Rue Fossette. The professor now spoke politely, and even deferentially, and he looked apologetic and repentant, but I could not recognize his civility at a word, nor meet his contrition with crude, premature oblivion. Never hitherto had I felt seriously disposed to resent his brusqueries, or freeze before his fierceness. What he had said to-night, however, I considered unwarranted. My extreme disapprobation of the proceeding must be marked, however slightly. I merely said, I am provided with attendance which was true, as Ginevra and I were to be sent home in the carriage, and I passed him with the sliding obeisance with which he was wont to be saluted in class by pupils crossing his estrade. Having sought my shawl, I returned to the vestibule. Monsieur Emmanuel stood there as if waiting. He observed that the night was fine. "'Is it?' I said, with a tone and manner whose consummate charriness and frostiness I could not but applaud. It was so seldom I could properly act out my own resolution to be reserved and cool where I had been grieved or hurt, that I felt almost proud of this one successful effort. That, is it, sounded just like the manner of other people. I had heard hundreds of such little minced, docked, dry phrases from the pursed-up coral lips of a score of self-possessed, self-sufficing misses and mademoiselles. That Monsieur Paul would not stand any prolonged experience of this sort of dialogue I knew, but he certainly merited a sample of the curt and arid. I believe he thought so himself, for he took the dose quietly. He looked at my shawl and objected to its lightness. I decidedly told him it was as heavy as I wished. Receding aloof and standing apart, I leaned on the banister of the stairs, folded my shawl about me, and fixed my eyes on a dreary religious painting darkening the wall. Ginevra was long in coming. Tedious seemed her loitering. Monsieur Paul was still there. My ear expected from his lips an angry tone. He came nearer. Now for another hiss, thought I. Had not the action been too uncivil, I could have stopped my ears with my fingers in terror of the thrill. Nothing happens as we expect. Listen for a coup or a murmur? It is then you will hear a cry of prey or pain, await a piercing shriek, an angry threat, and welcome an amicable greeting, a low, kind whisper. Monsieur Paul spoke gently. Friends, said he, do not quarrel for a word. Tell me, was it I or ce grand fat d'anglais? So he profanely denominated Dr. Breton. Who made your eyes so humid and your cheeks so hot? as they are even now i am not conscious of you monsieur or of any other having excited such emotion as you indicate was my answer and in giving it i again surpassed my usual self and achieved a neat frosty falsehood but what did i say he pursued tell me i was angry i have forgotten my words what were they such as it is best to forget said i still quite calm and chill. Then it was my words which wounded you. Consider them and said, permit my retractation, accord my pardon. I am not angry, monsieur. Then you are worse than angry, grieved. 
Forgive me, Miss Lucy. Monsieur Emmanuel, I do forgive you. Let me hear you say, in the voice natural to you, and not in that aligned tone, Mon ami, je vous pardonne. He made me smile. Who could help smiling at his wistfulness, his simplicity, his earnestness? Bon, he cried. Voilà que le jour va poindre. Dis donc, mon ami. Monsieur Paul, je vous pardonne. I will have no monsieur. Speak the other word, or I shall not believe you sincere. Another effort. Mon ami, or else, in English, my friend. Now, my friend had rather another sound and significancy than mon ami. It did not breathe the same sense of domestic and intimate affection. Mon ami, I could not say to Monsieur Paul. My friend, I could and did say without difficulty. This distinction existed not for him, however, and he was quite satisfied with the English phrase. He smiled. You should have seen him smile, reader, and you should have marked the difference between his countenance now and that he wore half an hour ago. I cannot affirm that I had ever witnessed the smile of pleasure, or content, or kindness round Monsieur Paul's lips, or in his eyes before. The ironic, the sarcastic, the disdainful, the passionately exultant, I had hundreds of times seen him express by what he called a smile, but any illuminated sign of milder or warmer feelings struck me as wholly new in his visage. It changed it as from a mask to a face. The deep lines left his features. The very complexion seemed clearer and fresher. That swart, sallow, southern darkness which spoke his Spanish blood became displaced by a lighter hue. I know not that I have ever seen in any other human face an equal metamorphosis from a similar cause. He now took me to the carriage. At the same moment Monsieur de Bassompierre came out with his niece. In a pretty humour was Mistress Fanshawe. She had found the evening a grand failure. Completely upset as to temper, she gave way to the most uncontrolled moroseness as soon as we were seated, and the carriage door closed. Her invectives against Dr. Breton had something venomous in them. Having found herself impotent either to charm or sting him, hatred was her only resource, and this hatred she expressed in terms so unmeasured and proportioned so monstrous that after listening for a while with assumed stoicism, my outraged sense of justice at last and suddenly caught fire. An explosion ensued, for I could be passionate too, especially with my present fair but faulty associate, who never failed to stir the worst dregs of me. It was well that the carriage wheels made a tremulous rattle over the flinty Chauzeville pavement, for I can assure the reader there was neither dead silence nor calm discussion within the vehicle. Half in earnest, half in seeming, I made it my business to storm down Ginevra. She had set out rampant from the Rue Cressy. It was necessary to tame her before we reached the Rue Fossette. To this end it was indispensable to show up her sterling value in high deserts, and this must be done in language of which the fidelity and homeliness might challenge comparison with the compliments of a John Knox to a Mary Stuart. This was the right discipline for Ginevra. It suited her. I am quite sure she went to bed that night all the better and more settled in mind and mood, and slept all the more sweetly for having undergone a sound moral drubbing. End of chapter 27Chapter 28 of Villette. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Villette by Charlotte Bronte. Chapter 28. The Watch Guard. Monsieur Paul Emmanuel owned an acute sensitiveness to the annoyance of interruption from whatsoever cause occurring during his lessons. To pass through the class under such circumstances was considered by the teachers and pupils of the school, individually and collectively, to be as much as a woman's or a girl's life was worth. Madame Beck herself, if forced to the enterprise, would scurry through, retrenching her skirts and carefully coasting the formidable estrade like a ship dreading breakers. 
as to rosine the portress on whom every half hour devolved the fearful duty of fetching pupils out of the very heart of one or other of the divisions to take their music lessons in the oratory the great or little saloon the salle a manger or some other piano station she would upon her second or third attempt frequently become almost tongue-tied from excessive consternation a sentiment inspired by the unspeakable looks levelled at her through a pair of dart-dealing spectacles one morning i was sitting in the carré at work upon a piece of embroidery which one of the pupils had commenced but delayed to finish and while my fingers wrought at the frame my ears regaled themselves with listening to the crescendos and cadences of a voice haranguing in the neighbouring class in tones that waxed momentarily more unquiet more ominously varied there was a good strong partition wall between me and the gathering storm as well as a facile means of flight through the glass door to the court in case it swept this way so i am afraid i derived more amusement than alarm from these thickening symptoms poor rosine was not safe four times that blessed morning had she made the passage of peril and now for the fifth time it became her dangerous duty to snatch as it were a brand from the burning a pupil from under monsieur paul's nose mon dieu mon dieu cried she que vais je devenir Monsieur va me tuer, je suis sûr, car il est d'une colère. Nerved by the courage of desperation, she opened the door. Mademoiselle Lamal, au piano, was her cry. Ere she could make good her retreat, or quite close the door, this voice uttered itself. Dès ce moment, la classe est défendue. La première qui ouvrira cette porte, ou passera par cette division, sera pendue. Fût-ce Madame Beck elle-même ten minutes had not succeeded the promulgation of this decree when rosine's french pantoufles were again heard shuffling along the corridor mademoiselle said she i would not for a five-franc piece go into that class again just now monsieur's lunettes are really terrible and here is a commissionnaire come with a message from the athenee i have told madame beck i dare not deliver it and she says i am to charge you with it me no that is rather too bad it is not in my line of duty come come rosine bear your own burden be brave charge once more i mademoiselle impossible five times i have crossed him this day madame must really hire a gendarme for this service Ouf, je n'en puis plus bah you are only a coward what is the message precisely of the kind with which monsieur least likes to be pestered an urgent summons to go directly to the Athenee, as there is an official visitor, a inspector, I know not what, arrived, and monsieur must meet him. You know how he hates a must. Yes, I knew well enough. The restive little man detested spur or curb. Against whatever was urgent or obligatory, he was sure to revolt. However, I accepted the responsibility, not certainly without fear, but fear blent with other sentiments curiosity amongst them i opened the door i entered i closed it behind me as quickly and quietly as a rather unsteady hand would permit for to be slow or bustling to rattle a latch or leave a door gaping wide were aggravations of crime often more disastrous in result than the main crime itself there i stood then and there he sat his humour was visibly bad almost at its worst he had been giving a lesson in arithmetic for he gave lessons on any and every subject that struck his fancy and arithmetic being a dry subject invariably disagreed with him not a pupil but trembled when he spoke of figures he sat bent above his desk to look up at the sound of an entrance at the occurrence of a direct breach of his will and law was an effort he could not for the moment bring himself to make it was quite as well i thus gained time to walk up the long class and it suited my idiosyncrasy far better to encounter the near burst of anger like his than to bear its menace at a distance at his estrade i paused just in front of course i was not worthy of immediate attention he proceeded with his lesson disdain would not do he must hear and he must answer my message 
Not being quite tall enough to lift my head over his desk, elevated upon the estrade, and thus suffering an eclipse in my present position, I ventured to peep round, with the design at first of merely getting a better view of his face, which had struck me when I entered as bearing a close and picturesque resemblance to that of a black and sallow tiger. Twice did I enjoy this side view with impunity, advancing and receding unseen. The third time my eye had scarce dawned beyond the obscuration of the desk, when it was caught and transfixed through its very pupil, transfixed by the lunette. Rosine was right. These utensils had in them a blank and immutable terror beyond the mobile wrath of the wearer's own unglazed eyes. I now found the advantage of proximity. These short-sighted lunettes were useless for the inspection of a criminal under monsieur's nose. Accordingly, he doffed them, and he and I stood on more equal terms. I am glad I was not really much afraid of him, that indeed, close in his presence, I felt no terror at all. For upon his demanding cord and gibbet to execute the sentence recently pronounced, I was able to furnish him with a needleful of embroidering thread, with such accommodating civility as could not but allay some portion at least of his surplus irritation. Of course I did not parade this courtesy before public view. I merely handed the thread round the angle of the desk, and attached it, ready noosed, to the bared back of the professor's chair. Comme voulez-vous? said he, in a growl of which the music was wholly confined to his chest and throat, for he kept his teeth clenched, and seemed registering to himself an inward vow that nothing earthly should wring from him a smile. My answer commenced uncompromisingly. Monsieur, I said, je vous l'homme possible, des choses ennuyées. And thinking it best not to mince matters, but to administer the douche with decision, in a low but quick voice, I delivered the Athenian message, floridly exaggerating its urgency. Of course, he would not hear a word of it. He would not go. He would not leave his present class. Let all the officials of Villette send for him. He would not put himself an inch out of his way at the bidding of king, cabinet and chambers together. I knew, however, that he must go, that talk as he would, both his duty and interest commanded an immediate and literal compliance with the summons. I stood, therefore, waiting in silence, as if he had not yet spoken. He asked what more I wanted. Only Monsieur's answer to deliver to the commissionaire. He waved an impatient negative. I ventured to stretch my hand to the bonnet grec which lay in grim repose on the window-sill. He followed this daring movement with his eye, no doubt in mixed pity and amazement at its presumption. Ah, uh, he muttered. If it came to that— if Miss Lucy meddled with his bonnet grec, she might just put it on herself, turn garçon, for the occasion, and benevolently go to the Athenée in his stead. With great respect I laid the bonnet on the desk, where its tassel seemed to give me an awful nod. I'll write a note of apology. That will do, said he, still bent on evasion. Knowing well it would not do, I gently pushed the bonnet towards his hand. Thus impelled, it slid down the polished slope of the varnished and unbased desk, carried before it the light steel-framed lunette, and, fearful to relate, they fell to the estrade. A score of times ere now had I seen them fall and receive no damage. This time, as Lucy Snow's hapless luck would have it, they so fell that each clear pebble became a shivered and shapeless star. Now, indeed, dismay seized me, dismay and regret. I knew the value of these lunettes. Monsieur Paul's sight was peculiar, not easily fitted, and these glasses suited him. I had heard him call them his treasures. As I picked them up, cracked and worthless, my hand trembled. Frightened through all my nerves I was to see the mischief I had done, but I think I was even more sorry than afraid. For some seconds I dared not look the bereaved professor in the face. He was the first to speak. La, said he, me voilà veuve de mes lunettes. I think Mademoiselle Lucie will now confess 
that the cold and gallows are amply earned. She trembles in anticipation of her doom. Ah, traitress, traitress, you are resolved to have me quite blind and helpless in your hands. I lifted my eyes. His face, instead of being irate, lowering and furrowed, was overflowing with the smile, coloured with the bloom I had seen brightening it that evening at the Hôtel Crécy. He was not angry, not even grieved. For the real injury he showed himself full of clemency, under the real provocation, patient as a saint. This event, which seemed so untoward, which I thought had ruined at once my chance of successful persuasion, proved my best help. Difficult of management so long as I had done him no harm, he became graciously pliant as soon as I stood in his presence a conscious and contrite offender, still gently railing at me as— Une forte femme, une anglaise terrible, une petite casse tout. He declared that he dared not but obey one who had given such an instance of her dangerous prowess. It was absolutely like the grand empereur smashing the vase to inspire dismay. So at last, crowning himself with his bonnet grec, and taking his ruined lunette from my hand with a clasp of kind pardon and encouragement, he made his bow and went off to the Athenée in first-rate humour and spirits. After all this amiability, the reader will be sorry for my sake to hear that I was quarrelling with Monsieur Paul again before night. Yet so it was, and I could not help it. It was his occasional custom, and a very laudable, acceptable custom, too, to arrive of an evening, always al improviste, unannounced, burst in on the silent hour of study, establish a sudden despotism over us and our occupations, cause books to be put away, work-bags to be brought out, and drawing forth a single thick volume, or a handful of pamphlets, substitute for the besotted lecture pieuse, drawled by a sleepy pupil, some tragedy made grand by grand reading, ardent by fiery action, some drama whereof, for my part, I rarely studied the intrinsic merit, for Monsieur Emmanuel made it a vessel for an outpouring, and filled it with his native verve and passion like a cup with a vital brewage. Or else he would flash through our conventual darkness, a reflex of a brighter world, show us a glimpse of the current literature of the day, read us passages from some enchanting tale, or the last witty feuilleton which had awakened laughter in the saloons of Paris, taking care always to expunge with the severest hand, whether from tragedy, melodrama, tale, or essay, whatever passage, phrase, or word could be deemed unsuited to an audience of Jean Fille. I noticed more than once that where retrenchment without substitute would have left unmeaning vacancy or introduced weakness, he could and did improvise whole paragraphs, no less vigorous than irreproachable, the dialogue, the description he engrafted, was often far better than that he pruned away. Well, on the evening in question we were sitting silent as nuns in a retreat, the pupils studying, the teachers working. I remember my work. It was a slight matter of fancy, and it rather interested me. It had a purpose. I was not doing it merely to kill time. I meant it, when finished, as a gift and the occasion of presentation being near, haste was requisite, and my fingers were busy. We heard the sharp bell peal, which we all knew, then the rapid step familiar to each ear. The words, Voilà, monsieur, had scarcely broken simultaneously from every lip when the two-leaved door split, as split it always did for his admission. Such a slow word as open is inefficient to describe his movements and he stood in the midst of us. There were two study-tables, both long and flanked with benches. Over the centre of each hung a lamp. Beneath this lamp, on either side the table, sat a teacher. The girls were arranged to the right hand and the left, the eldest and most studious nearest the lamps or tropics, the idlers and little ones towards the north and south poles. Monsieur's habit was politely to hand a chair to some teacher, generally Zélie Saint-Pierre, the senior mistress, then to take her vacated seat, and thus avail himself of the full beam of Cancer or Capricorn, which, owing to his near sight, he needed. As usual, 
Zelie rose with alacrity, smiling to the whole extent of her mouth, and the full display of her upper and under rows of teeth. That strange smile which passes from ear to ear, and is marked only by a sharp thin curve which fails to spread over the countenance, and neither dimples the cheek nor lights the eye. I suppose Monsieur did not see her, or he had taken a whim that he would not notice her, for he was as capricious as women are said to be. Then his lunette, he had got another pair, served him as an excuse for all sorts of little oversights and shortcomings. Whatever might be his reason, he passed by Zilly, came to the other side of the table, and before I could start up to clear the way, whispered, Ne bougez pas and established himself between me and Miss Farnshaw, who always would be my neighbour and have her elbow in my side, however often I declared to her, Ginevra, I wish you were at Jericho. It was easy to say, ne bougez pas, but how could I help it? I must make him room, and I must request the pupils to recede that I might recede. It was very well for Ginevra to be gum to me, keeping herself warm, as she said, on the winter evenings, and harassing my very heart with her fidgetings and pokings, obliging me indeed sometimes to put an artful pin in my girdle by way of protection against her elbow. But I suppose Monsieur Emmanuel was not to be subjected to the same kind of treatment. So I swept away my working materials to clear space for his book, and withdrew myself to make room for his person not, however, leaving more than a yard of interval, just what any reasonable man would have regarded as a convenient, respectful allowance of bench. But Monsieur Emmanuel never was reasonable, flint and tinder that he was. He struck and took fire directly. Vous ne voulez pas de moi pour voisin, he growled. Vous vous donnez des airs de caste, vous me traitez en paria, he scowled. Soit, je vais arranger la chose. And he set to work. Levez-vous toutes, mademoiselle, cried he. The girls rose. He made them all file off to the other table. He then placed me at one extremity of the long bench, and having duly and carefully brought me my work-basket, silk, scissors, all my implements, he fixed himself quite at the other end. At this arrangement, highly absurd as it was, not a soul in the room dared to laugh. Luckless for the giggler would have been the giggle. As for me, I took it with entire coolness. There I sat, isolated and cut off from human intercourse. I sat and minded my work, and was quiet and not at all unhappy. Est-ce assez de distance? he demanded. Monsieur, on est l'arbitre, said I. Vous savez bien que non. C'est vous qui avez créé ce vide immense. Moi, je n'y ai pas mis la main. And with this assertion he commenced the reading. For his misfortune he had chosen a French translation of what he called Un drame de William Shakespeare. Le faux dieu. He further announced De ces sots païens, les Anglais. How far otherwise he would have characterized him had his temper not been upset, I scarcely need intimate. Of course the translation being French was very inefficient nor did I make any particular effort to conceal the contempt which some of its forlorn lapses were calculated to excite. Not that it behooved or beseemed me to say anything, but one can occasionally look the opinion it is forbidden to embody in words. Monsieur's lunette being on the alert, he gleaned up every stray look. I don't think he lost one. The consequence was his eye soon discarded a screen that their blaze might sparkle free and he waxed hotter at the North Pole to which he had voluntarily exiled himself than, considering the general temperature of the room, it would have been reasonable to become under the vertical ray of cancer itself. The reading over, it appeared problematic whether he would depart with his anger unexpressed, or whether he would give it vent. Suppression was not much in his habits, but still, what had been done to him definite enough to afford matter for overt reproof? I had not uttered a sound, and could not justly be deemed amenable to reprimand or penalty for having permitted a slightly freer action than usual to the muscles about my eyes and mouth. The supper, consisting of bread and milk diluted with tepid water, was brought in. 
In respectful consideration of the professor's presence, the rolls and glasses were allowed to stand instead of being immediately handed round. Take your supper, ladies, said he, seeming to be occupied in making marginal notes to his William's Shakespeare. They took it. I also accepted a roll and glass. But being now more than ever interested in my work, I kept my seat of punishment, and wrought while I munched my bread and sipped my beverage, the whole with easy sang-froid, with a certain snugness of composure, indeed scarcely in my habits and pleasantly novel to my feelings. It seemed as if the presence of a nature so restless, chafing, thorny as that of Monsieur Paul, absorbed all feverish and unsettling influences like a magnet, and left me none but such as were placid and harmonious. He rose. Will he go away without saying another word? Yes, he turned to the door. No, he returned on his steps, but only perhaps to take his pencil case, which had been left on the table. He took it, shut the pencil in and out, broke its point against the wood, recut and pocketed it, and walked promptly up to me. The girls and teachers, gathered round the other table, were talking pretty freely. They always talked at meals, and from the constant habit of speaking fast and loud at such times, did not now subdue their voices much. Monsieur Paul came and stood behind me. He asked at what I was working, and I said I was making a watch-guard. He asked, For whom? And I answered, For a gentleman, one of my friends. Monsieur Paul stooped down and proceeded, as novel writers say, and as was literally true in his case, to hiss into my ear some poignant words. He said that, Of all the women he knew, I was the one who could make herself the most consummately unpleasant. I was she with whom it was least possible to live on friendly terms. I had a caractère intraitable and perverse to a miracle. How I managed it, or what possessed me, he, for his part, did not know, but with whatever pacific and amicable intentions a person accosted me, crack, I turned concord to discord, goodwill to enmity. He was sure he, Monsieur Paul, wished me well enough. He had never done me any harm that he knew of. He might at least, he supposed, claim a right to be regarded as a neutral acquaintance, guiltless of hostile sentiments. Yet how I behaved to him, with what pungent vivacities, to what an impetus of mutiny, or the fougue of injustice. Here I could not avoid opening my eyes somewhat wide, and even slipping in a slight interjectional observation. Vivacities! Impetus! Fuji! I didn't know! Chut! À l'instant! There! There I went, vive comme la poudre! He was sorry, he was very sorry. For my sake he grieved over the hapless peculiarity. This emportement, this chaleur, generous perhaps, but excessive, would yet, he feared, do me a mischief. It was a pity. I was not, he believed, in his soul, wholly without good qualities, and would I but hear reasoned, and be more said it, more sober, less en l'air, less coquette, less taken by show, less prone to set an undue value on outside excellence, to make much of the attention of people remarkably chiefly for so many feet of stature, des couleurs de poupée, un nez plus ou moins bien fait, and an enormous amount of fatuity. I might yet prove a useful, perhaps an exemplary character, but as it was... And here the little man's voice was for a minute choked. I would have looked up at him, or held out my hand, or said a soothing word, but I was afraid if I stirred I should either laugh or cry. So odd in all this was the mixture of the touching and the absurd. 
I thought he had nearly done, but no, he sat down that he might go on at his ease. While he, Monsieur Paul, was on these painful topics, he would dare my anger for the sake of my good, and would venture to refer to a change he had noticed in my dress. He was free to confess that, when he first knew me, or rather was in the habit of catching a passing glimpse of me from time to time, I satisfied him on this point, the gravity, the austere simplicity obvious in this particular, were such as to inspire the highest hopes for my best interests. What fatal influence had impelled me lately to introduce flowers under the brim of my bonnet, to wear they call brodé, and even to appear on one occasion in a scarlet gown, he might indeed conjecture, but for the present would not openly declare. Again I interrupted, and this time not without an accent at once indignant and horror-struck. Scarlet, Monsieur Paul! It was not scarlet! It was pink, and pale pink too, and further subdued by black lace. Pink or scarlet, yellow or crimson, pea-green or sky-blue, it was all one. These were all flaunting giddy colours, and as to the lace, I talked of that was but a colifichet de plus and he sighed over my degeneracy he could not he was sorry to say be so particular on this theme as he could wish not possessing the exact names of this babiol he might run into small verbal errors which would not fail to lay him open to my sarcasm and excite my unhappily sudden and passionate disposition. He would merely say, in general terms, and in these general terms he knew he was correct, that my costume had of late assumed des façons mondaines, which it wounded him to see. What façon mondaine he discovered in my present winter merino and plain white collar, I own it puzzled me to guess. And when I asked him, he said, it was all made with too much attention to effect, and besides, had I not the bow of ribbon at my neck? And if you condemn a bow of ribbon for a lady, monsieur, you would necessarily disapprove of a thing like this for a gentleman, holding up my bright little chainlet of silk and gold. His sole reply was a groan, I suppose over my levity. After sitting some minutes in silence, and watching the progress of the chain, at which I now wrought more assiduously than ever, he inquired, Whether what he had just said would have the effect of making me entirely detest him? I hardly remember what answer I made, or how it came about. I don't think I spoke at all, but I know we managed to bid good night on friendly terms, and even after Monsieur Paul had reached the door, he turned back just to explain that he would not be understood to speak in entire condemnation of the scarlet dress. Pink! Pink! I threw in. That he had not intention to deny it the merit of looking rather well. The fact was, Monsieur Emmanuel's taste in colours decidedly leaned to the brilliant. Only he wished to counsel me whenever I wore it, to do so in the same spirit as if its material were bure and its hue gris de poussière and the flowers under my bonnet monsieur i asked they are very little ones keep them little then said he permit them not to become full-blown and the bow monsieur the bit of ribbon va pour le ruban was the propitious answer and so we settled it well done lucy snow cried I to myself. You have come in for a pretty lecture, brought on yourself a rude savant, and all through your wicked fondness for worldly vanities. Who would have thought it? You deemed yourself a melancholy sobersides enough. Miss Farnshaw there regards you as a second Diogenes. Monsieur de Bassompierre the other day politely turned the conversation when it ran on the wild gifts of the actress Vashti, 
because, as he kindly said, Miss Snow looked uncomfortable. Dr. John Breton knows you only as... Quiet, Lucy. A creature inoffensive as a shadow. He has said, and you have heard him say it. Lucy's disadvantages spring from over-gravity in tastes and manner, want of colour in character and costume. Such are your own and your friend's impressions, and behold, there starts up a little man, differing diametrically from all these, roundly charging you with being too airy and cheery, too volatile and versatile, too flowery and colory. This harsh little man, this pitiless censor, gathers up all your poor scattered sins of vanity, your luckless chiffon of rose colour, your small fringe of a wreath, your small scrap of ribbon, your silly bit of lace, and calls you to account for the lot and for each item. You are well habituated to be passed by as a shadow in life's sunshine. It is a new thing to see one testily lifting his hand to screen his eyes, because you tease him with an obtrusive ray. End of chapter 28「Chapter Twenty Nine Monsieur's Fête. I was up the next morning an hour before daybreak, and finished my guard kneeling on the dormitory floor beside the centre stand, for the benefit of such expiring glimmer as the night lamp afforded in its last watch. All my materials, my whole stock of beads and silk, were used up before the chain assumed the length and richness I wished. I had wrought it double, as I knew, by the rule of contraries, that, to suit the particular taste whose gratification was in view, an effective appearance was quite indispensable. As a finish to the ornament, a little gold clasp was needed. Fortunately, I possessed it in the fastening of my sole necklace. I duly detached and reattached it, then coiled compactly the completed guard, and enclosed it in a small box I had bought for its brilliancy, made of some tropic shell of the colour called Nacarat, and decked with a little coronal of sparkling blue stones. Within the lid of the box I carefully graved with my scissors point certain initials. The reader will perhaps remember the description of Madame Beck's fête, nor will he have forgotten that at each anniversary a handsome present was subscribed for and offered by the school the observance of this day was a distinction accorded to none but madame and in a modified form to her kinsman and counsellor monsieur emmanuel in the latter case it was an honour spontaneously awarded not plotted and contrived beforehand and offered an additional proof amongst many others of the estimation in which, despite his partialities, prejudices, and irritabilities, the professor of literature was held by his pupils. No article of value was offered to him. He distinctly gave it to be understood that he would accept neither plate nor jewellery. Yet he liked a slight tribute. The cost, the money value, did not touch him. A diamond ring, a gold snuff-box, presented with pomp, would have pleased him less than a flower or a drawing, offered simply and with sincere feelings. Such was his nature. He was a man not wise in his generation, yet could he claim a filial sympathy with the day-spring on high. Monsieur Paul's fête fell on the first of March, and a Thursday. It proved a fine sunny day and being likewise the morning on which it was customary to attend mass being also otherwise distinguished by the half-holiday which permitted the privilege of walking out shopping or paying visits in the afternoon these combined considerations induced a general smartness and freshness of dress clean collars were in vogue the ordinary dingy woollen class dress was exchanged for something lighter and clearer mademoiselle zélie st pierre on this particular thursday even assumed a robe de soie, deemed in economical la basse an article of hazardous splendour and luxury. Nay, it was remarked that she sent for a coiffure to dress her hair that morning. There were pupils acute enough to discover that she had bedewed her handkerchief and her hands with a new and fashionable perfume, 
Poor Zélie. It was much her wont to declare about this time that she was tied to death of a life of seclusion and labour, that she longed to have the means and leisure for relaxation, to have someone to work for her, a husband who would pay her debt, she was woefully encumbered with debt, supply her wardrobe, and leave her at liberty, as she said, to go to un peu le plaisir. It had long been rumoured that her eye was upon Monsieur Emmanuel. Monsieur Emmanuel's eye was certainly often upon her. He would sit and watch her perseveringly for minutes together. I have seen him give her a quarter of an hour's gaze, while the class was silently composing, and he sat throned on his estrade, unoccupied. Conscious always of this basilisk attention, she would writhe under it, half flattered, half puzzled, and Monsieur would follow her sensations, sometimes looking appallingly acute for in some cases he had the terrible unerring penetration of instinct and pierced in its hiding-place the last lurking thought of the heart and discerned under florid veilings the bare barren places of the spirit yes and its perverted tendencies and its hidden false curves all that men and women would not have known the twisted spine, the malformed limb that was born with them, and far worse, the stain or disfigurement they have perhaps brought on themselves. No calamity so accursed but Monsieur Emmanuel could pity and forgive, if it were acknowledged candidly. But where his questioning eyes met dishonest denial, where his ruthless researches found deceitful concealment, oh, then he could be cruel, and I thought wicked— he would exultantly snatch the screen from poor shrinking wretches, passionately hurry them to the summit of the mount of exposure, and there show them all naked, all false, poor living lies, the spawn of that horrid truth which cannot be looked on unveiled. He thought he did justice. For my part, I doubt whether man has a right to do such justice on man. More than once in these his visitations I have felt compelled to give tears to his victims, and not spared ire and keen reproach to himself. He deserved it, but it was difficult to shake him in his firm conviction that the work was righteous and needed. Breakfast being over, and mass attended, the school-bell rang and the rooms filled. A very pretty spectacle was presented in class. Pupils and teachers sat neatly arrayed orderly and expectant, each bearing in her hand the bouquet of felicitation, the prettiest spring flowers all fresh, and filling the air with their fragrance. I only had no bouquet. I like to see flowers growing, but when they are gathered they cease to please. I look on them as things rootless and perishable. Their likeness to life makes me sad. I never offer flowers to those I love. I never wish to receive them from hands dear to me. Mademoiselle St. Pierre marked my empty hands. She could not believe I had been so remiss. With avidity her eye roved over and round me. Surely I must have some solitary symbolic flower somewhere, some small knot of violets, something to win myself praise for taste, commendation for ingenuity. The unimaginative Anglaise proved better than the Parisienne's fears. She sat literally unprovided, as bare of bloom or leaf as the winter tree. This ascertained, Zélie smiled, well pleased. "'How wisely you have acted to keep your money, Miss Lucy,' said she. "'Silly, I have gone and thrown away two francs on a bouquet of hothouse flowers.' And she showed with pride her splendid nosegay. But hush! A step. The step. It came prompt, as usual— but with a promptitude we felt disposed to flatter ourselves, inspired by other feelings than mere excitability of nerve and vehemence of intent. We thought our professor's footfall, to speak romantically, had in it a friendly promise this morning. And so it had. He entered in a mood which made him as good as a new sunbeam to the already well-lit first class. The morning light playing amongst our plants and laughing on our walls, caught an added lustre from Monsieur Paul's all-benignant salute. Like a true Frenchman, though I don't know why I should say so, for he was of strain neither French nor La Basse-Korean, he had dressed for the situation and the occasion. 
not by the vague folds sinister and conspirator like of his soot dark paletot were the outlines of his person obscured on the contrary his figure such as it was i don't boast of it was well set off by a civilized coat and a silken vest quite pretty to behold the defiant and pagan bonnet grec had vanished bareheaded he came upon us carrying a christian hat in his gloved hand the little man looked well very well there was a clearness of amity in his blue eye and a glow of good feeling on his dark complexion which passed perfectly in the place of beauty one really did not care to observe that his nose though far from small was of no particular shape his cheek thin his brow marked and square his mouth no rosebud one accepted him as he was and felt his presence the reverse of damping or insignificant he passed to his desk he placed on the same his hat and gloves bonjour mes amis said he in a tone that somehow made amends to some amongst us for many a sharp snap and savage snarl not a jocund good fellow tone still less an unctuous priestly accent but a voice he had belonging to himself a voice used when his heart passed the words to his lips that same heart did speak sometimes though an irritable it was not an ossified organ in its core was a place tender beyond a man's tenderness a place that humbled him to little children that bound him to girls and women to whom rebel as he would he could not disown his affinity nor quite deny that on the whole he was better with them than with his own sex we all wish monsieur a good day and present him to our congratulations on the anniversary of his fete said mademoiselle zelie constituting herself spokeswoman of the assembly and advancing with no more twists of the affectation than were with her indispensable to the achievement of motion she laid her costly bouquet before him he bowed over it the long train of offerings followed all the pupils sweeping past with the gliding step foreigners practice left their tributes as they went by each girl so dexterously adjusted her separate gift that when the last bouquet was laid on the desk it formed the apex to a blooming pyramid a pyramid blooming spreading and towering with such exuberance as in the end to eclipse the hero behind it this ceremony over seats were resumed and we sat in dead silence expectant of a speech i suppose five minutes might have elapsed and the hush remained unbroken ten and there was no sound many present began doubtless to wonder for what monsieur waited as well they might voiceless and viewless stirless and wordless he kept his station behind the pile of flowers at last there issued forth a voice rather deep as if it spoke out of a hollow Et cela tout? mademoiselle zelie looked round you have all presented your bouquet inquired she of the pupils yes they had all given their nosegays from the eldest to the youngest from the tallest to the most diminutive the senior mistress signified as much cela tout? was reiterated in an intonation which deep before had now descended some notes lower monsieur said mademoiselle st pierre rising and this time speaking with her own sweet smile i have the honour to tell you that every person in classe has offered her bouquet for miss lucy monsieur will kindly make allowance as a foreigner she probably did not know our customs or did not appreciate their significance miss lucy has regarded this ceremony as too frivolous to be honoured by her observance famous i muttered between my teeth you are no bad speaker zelie when you begin the answer vouchsafed to mademoiselle st pierre from the astrot was given in the gesticulation of a hand from behind the pyramid this manual action seemed to deprecate words to enjoin silence a form ere long followed the hand monsieur emerged from his eclipse and producing himself on the front of his estrade and gazing straight and fixedly before him at a vast map monde covering the wall opposite he demanded a third time and now in really tragic tones Et cela tout. 
I might yet have made all right by stepping forwards, and slipping into his hand the ruddy little shell-box I at that moment held tight in my own. It was what I had fully purposed to do, but first the comic side of Monsieur's behaviour had tempted me to delay, and now Mademoiselle St. Pierre's affected interference provoked contumacy. The reader, not having hitherto had any cause to ascribe to Miss Snow's character the most distant pretensions to perfection, will be scarcely surprised to learn that she felt too perverse to defend herself from any imputation the Parisienne might choose to insinuate. And besides, Monsieur Paul was so tragic, and took my defection so seriously, he deserved to be vexed. I kept, then, both my box and my countenance, and sat insensate as any stone. It is well, dropped at length from the lips of Monsieur Paul. And having uttered this phrase, the shadow of some great paroxysm, the swell of wrath, scorn, resolve, passed over his brow, rippled his lips, and lined his cheeks. Gulping down all further comment, he launched into his customary discours. I can't at all remember what this discours was. I did not listen to it. The gulping down process, the abrupt dismissal of his mortification or vexation, had given me a sensation which half counteracted the ludicrous effect of the reiterated essai la tu towards the close of the speech there came a pleasing diversion my attention was again amusingly arrested owing to some little accidental movement i think i dropped my thimble on the floor and in stooping to regain it hit the crown of my head against the sharp corner of my desk which casualties exasperating to me by rights of to anybody naturally made a slight bustle. Monsieur Paul became irritated, and dismissing his forced equanimity, and casting to the winds that dignity and self-control with which he never cared long to encumber himself, he broke forth into the strain best calculated to give him ease. I don't know how, in the progress of his discours, he had contrived to cross the channel and land on British ground, but there I found him when I began to listen. Casting a quick, cynical glance round the room, a glance which scathed, or was intended to scathe, as it crossed me, he fell with fury upon les Anglaises. Never have I heard English women handled as Monsieur Paul that morning handled them. He spared nothing, neither their minds, morals, manners, nor personal appearance. I specially remember his abuse of their tall stature, their long necks, their thin arms, their slovenly dress, their pedantic education, their impious scepticism, their insufferable pride, their pretentious virtue, over which he ground his teeth malignantly, and looked as if, had he dared, he would have said singular things. Oh, he was spiteful, acrid, savage, and, as a natural consequence, detestably ugly. Little wicked, venomous man, thought I. Am I going to harass myself with fears of displeasing you, or hurting your feelings? No, indeed. You shall be indifferent to me as the shabbiest bouquet in your pyramid. I grieve to say I could not quite carry out this resolution. For some time the abuse of England and the English found and left me stolid. I bore it some fifteen minutes stoically enough, but this hissing cockatrice was determined to sting and he said such things at last, fastening not only upon our women but upon our greatest names and best men, sullying the shield of Britannia, and dabbling the Union Jack in mud, that I was stung. With vicious relish he brought up the most spicy current continental historical falsehoods, than which nothing can be conceived more offensive. Zélie and the whole class became one grin of vindictive delight, for it is curious to discover how these clowns of the Bassacur secretly hate England. At last I struck a sharp stroke on my desk, opened my lips, and let loose this cry. Vive l'Angleterre! La histoire est la heureuse! A bas la France! La fiction est les vacances! The class was struck of a heap. I suppose they thought me mad. The professor put up his handkerchief, and fiendishly smiled into its folds. Little monster of malice! He now thought he had got the victory, since he had made me angry. In a second he became good-humoured. With great blandness he resumed the subject of his flowers. 
talked poetically and symbolically of their sweetness, perfume, purity, etc., made Frenchified comparisons between the jeune fille and the sweet blossoms before him, paid Mademoiselle Saint-Pierre a very full-blown compliment on the superiority of her bouquet, and ended by announcing that the first really fine, mild, and balmy morning in spring, he intended to take the whole class out to breakfast in the country. Such of the class, at least, he added with emphasis, as he could count amongst the number of his friends. Donc je n'y serai pas, declared I, involuntarily. What? was his response, and gathering his flowers in his arms, he flashed out of class, while I, consigning my work, scissors, thimble, and the neglected little box to my desk, swept upstairs. I don't know whether he felt hot and angry, but I am free to confess that I did. Yet with a strange evanescent anger, I had not sat an hour on the edge of my bed, picturing and re-picturing his look, manner, words, ere I smiled at the whole scene. A little pang of regret I underwent that the box had not been offered, I had meant to gratify him. Fate would not have it so. In the course of the afternoon, remembering that desks and class were by no means inviolate repositories, and thinking that it was as well to secure the box, on account of the initials in the lid, P, C, D, E, for Paul, Carl, or Carlos, David, Emmanuel, and such was his full name, these foreigners must always have a string of baptismals, I descended to the schoolroom. It slept in holiday repose. The day pupils were all gone home. The boarders were out walking. The teachers, except the surveillant of the week, were in town visiting or shopping. The suite of divisions was vacant. So was the grand salle, with its huge solemn globe hanging in the midst, its pair of many-branched chandeliers, and its horizontal grand piano, closed, silent, enjoying its midweek Sabbath. I rather wondered to find the first-class door ajar, this room being usually locked when empty, and being then inaccessible to any save Madame Beck and myself, who possessed a duplicate key. I wondered still more on approaching, to hear a vague movement as of life, a step, a chair stirred, a sound like the opening of a desk. It is only Madame Beck doing inspection duty, was the conclusion following a moment's reflection. The partially opened door gave opportunity for assurance on this point. I looked. Behold, not the inspecting garb of Madame Beck, the shawl and the clean cap, but the coat and the close-shorn dark head of a man. This person occupied my chair. His olive hand held my desk open. His nose was lost to view amongst my papers. His back was towards me. But there could not be a moment's question about identity. Already was the attire of ceremony discarded. The cherished and ink-stained paletot was resumed. The perverse bonnet grec lay on the floor, as if just dropped from the hand, culpably busy. Now I knew, and I had long known, that the hand of Monsieur Emmanuel's was on the most intimate terms with my desk, that it raised and lowered the lid, ransacked and arranged the contents, almost as familiarly as my own. The fact was not dubious, nor did he wish it to be so. He left signs of each visit palpable and unmistakable. Hitherto, however, I had never caught him in the act. Watch as I would, I could not detect the hours and movements of his coming. I saw the brownie's work and exercises left overnight full of faults, and found next morning carefully corrected. I profited by his capricious good will in Lone's full welcome and refreshing. Between a sallow dictionary and worn-out grammar would magically grow a fresh, interesting new work, or a classic, mellow and sweet in its ripe age. Out of my work basket would laughingly peep a romance. Under it would lurk the pamphlet, the magazine, whence last evening's reading had been extracted. Impossible to doubt the source whence these treasures flowed. Had there been no other indication, one condemning and traitor peculiarity common to them all settled the question. They smelt of cigars. This was very shocking, of course. I thought so at first, and used to open the window with some bustle to air my desk, and with fastidious finger and thumb to hold the peccant brochures forth to the purifying breeze. 
I was cured of that formality suddenly. Monsieur caught me at it one day, understood the inference, instantly relieved my hand of its burden, and in another moment would have thrust the same into the glowing stove. It chanced to be a book, on the perusal of which I was bent. So for once I proved as decided and quicker than himself, recaptured the spoil, and, having saved this volume, never hazarded a second. With all this I had never yet been able to arrest in his visits the freakish, friendly, cigar-loving phantom. But now at last I had him. There he was, the very brownie himself, and there, curling from his lips, was the pale blue breath of his Indian darling. He was smoking into my desk. It might well betray him. Provoked at this particular, and yet pleased to surprise him, pleased, that is, with the mixed feeling of the housewife who discovers at last a strange elfin ally busy in the dairy at the untimely churn, I softly stole forward, stood behind him, bent with precaution over his shoulder. My heart smote me to see that, after this morning's hostility, after my seeming remissness, after the puncture experienced by his feelings, and the ruffling undergone by his temper, he, all willing to forget and forgive, had brought me a couple of handsome volumes, of which the title and authorship were guarantees for interest. Now, as he sat bending above the desk, he was stirring up its contents, but with gentle and careful hand, disarranging, indeed, but not harming. My heart smote me. As I bent over him, as he sat unconscious, doing me what good he could, and I dare say not feeling towards me unkindly. My morning's anger quite melted. I did not dislike Professor Emmanuel. I think he heard me breathe. He turned suddenly. His temperament was nervous, yet he never started, and seldom changed colour. There was something hardy about him. "'I thought you were gone into town with the other teachers.' said he, taking a grim gripe of his self-possession, which half escaped him. It is as well you are not. Do you think I care for being caught? Not I. I often visit your desk. Monsieur, I know it. You find a brochure or tome now and then, but you don't read them, because they have passed under this. Touching his cigar. They have, and are no better for the process. But I read them. Without pleasure? Monsieur must not be contradicted. Do you like them? Or any of them? Are they acceptable? Monsieur has seen me reading them a hundred times, and knows I have not so many recreations as to undervalue those he provides. I mean well, and if you see that I mean well, and derive some little amusement from my efforts, why can we not be friends? A fatalist would say, because we cannot. This morning, he continued, I awoke in a bright mood and came into class happy. You spoiled my day. No, monsieur, only an hour or two of it, and that unintentionally. Unintentionally? No, it was my fed day. Everybody wished me happiness but you. The little children of the third division gave each her knot of violets, lisped each her congratulation. You, nothing, not a bud, leaf, whisper, not a glance. Was this unintentional? I meant no harm. Then you really did not know our custom. You were unprepared. You would willingly have led out a few centimes on the flower to give me pleasure. Have you been aware that it was expected? Say so, and all is forgotten, and the pain soothed. I did know that it was expected. I was prepared, yet I laid out no centimes on flowers. It is well. You do right to be honest. I should almost have hated you had you flattered and lied. But I declare at once, Paul, Carl, Emmanuel, je te déteste, mon garçon, than smile and interest, look and affection, and be false and cold at heart. False and cold 
I don't think you are, but you have made the great mistake in life that I believe. I think your judgment is warped, that you are indifferent where you ought to be grateful, and perhaps devoted and infatuated, where you ought to be cool as your name. Don't suppose that I wish you to have a passion for me, mademoiselle. Dieu vous en garde. What do you start for? Because I said passion. Well, I say it again. There is such a word, and there is such a thing, though not within these walls. Thank heaven. You are no child that one could not speak of what exists. But I only utter the word. The thing, I assure you, is aligned to my whole life and views. It died in the past, in the present it lies buried. Its grave is deep, dark, well heaped, and many winters old. In the future there will be a resurrection, as I believe to my soul's consolation. But all will then be changed form and feeling the mortal will have put on immortality i will rise not from earth but heaven all i say to you miss lucy snow is that you ought to treat professor paul emmanuel decently i could not and did not contradict such a sentiment tell me he pursued when it is your fed day and I will not grudge a few centimes for a small offering. You will be like me, monsieur. This cost more than a few centimes, and I did not grudge its price. And taking from the open desk the little box, I put it into his hand. It lay ready in my lap this morning, I continued. And if monsieur had been rather more patient, and mademoiselle St. Pierre less interfering, Perhaps I should say, too, if I had been calmer and wiser, I should have given it then. He looked at the box. I saw its clear warm tint and bright azure circlet pleased his eyes. I told him to open it. My initials, said he, indicating the letters in the lid. Who told you I was called Carl David? A little bird, monsieur. Does it fly from me to you, then? One can tie a message on its wing, when needful. He took out the chain, a trifle indeed as to value, but glossy with silk and sparkling with beads. He liked that, too, admired it artlessly like a child. For me? Yes, for you. This is the thing you were working at last night. The same. You finished it this morning. I did. You commenced it with the intention that it should be mine. Undoubtedly. And offered on my fed day. Yes. This purpose continued. As you wove it. Again I assented. Then it is not necessary that I should cut out any portion, saying, this part is not mine. It was plated under the idea and for the adornment of another. By no means. It is neither necessary nor would it be just. This object is all mine. That object is yours entirely. Straight away, Monsieur opened his paletot, arranged the guard splendidly across his chest, displaying as much and suppressing as little as he could, for he had no notion of concealing what he admired and thought decorative. As to the box, he pronounced it a superb bonbonniere. He was fond of bonbons, by the way and as he always liked to share with others what pleased himself, he would give his drague as freely as he lent his books. Amongst the kind brownie's gifts left in my desk, I forgot to enumerate many a paper of chocolate comfits. His tastes in these matters were southern, and what we think infantine. His simple lunch consisted frequently of a brioche, which, as often as not, he shared with some child of the third division. À présent, c'est un fait accompli, said he, readjusting his paletto, and we had no more words on the subject. After looking over the two volumes he had brought, and cutting away some pages with his penknife, he generally pruned before lending his books, 
especially if they were novels, and sometimes I was a little provoked at the severity of his censorship, the retrenchments interrupting the narrative. He rose, politely touched his bonnet grec, and bade me a civil good day. We are friends now, thought I, till the next time we quarrel. We might have quarrelled again that very same evening, but, wonderful to relate, failed for once to make the most of our opportunity. Contrary to all expectation, Monsieur Paul arrived at the study hour. Having seen so much of him in the morning, we did not look for his presence at night. No sooner were we seated at lessons, however, than he appeared. I own I was glad to see him, so glad that I could not help greeting his arrival with a smile. And when he made his way to the same seat about which so serious a misunderstanding had formerly arisen, I took good care not to make too much room for him. He watched with a jealous, sidelong look, to see whether I shrank away. But I did not, though the bench was a little crowded. I was losing the early impulse to recoil from Monsieur Paul. Habituated to the paletot and bonnet grec, the neighbourhood of these garments seemed no longer uncomfortable or very formidable. I did not now sit restrained, asphyxié, as he used to say, at his side. I stirred when I wished to stir, coughed when it was necessary, even yawned when I was tired, did in short what I pleased, blindly reliant upon his indulgence. Nor did my temerity, this evening at least, meet the punishment it perhaps merited. He was both indulgent and good-natured, not a cross glance shot from his eyes, not a hasty word left his lips. Till the very close of the evening he did not indeed address me at all, yet I felt somehow that he was full of friendliness. Silence is of different kinds, and breathes different meanings. No words could inspire a pleasanter content than did Monsieur Paul's wordless presence. When the tray came in and the bustle of supper commenced, he just said as he retired that he wished me a good night and sweet dreams. And a good night and sweet dreams I had. End of chapter 29《He was naturally a little man of unreasonable moods. When overwrought, which he often was, he became acutely irritable, and besides his veins were dark with a livid belladonna tincture, the essence of jealousy. I do not mean merely the tender jealousy of the heart, but that sterner, narrower sentiment, whose seat is in the head. I used to think, as I sat looking at Monsieur Paul, while he was knitting his brow or protruding his lip over some exercise of mine, which had not as many faults as he wished, for he liked me to commit faults, a knot of blunders was sweet to him as a cluster of nuts, that he had points of resemblance to Napoleon Bonaparte. I think so still. In a shameless disregard of magnanimity, he resembled the great emperor. Monsieur Paul would have quarrelled with twenty learned women, would have unblushingly carried on a system of petty bickering and recrimination with a whole capital of coteries, never troubling himself about loss or lack of dignity. He would have exiled fifty Madame de Stael if they had annoyed, offended, outrivalled, or opposed him. I well remember a hot episode of his with a certain Madame Panache, a lady temporarily employed by Madame Beck to give lessons in history. She was clever. That is, she knew a good deal, and besides, thoroughly possessed the art of making the most of what she knew. Of words and confidence she held unlimited command. Her personal appearance was far from destitute of advantages. 
I believe many people would have pronounced her a fine woman. And yet there were points in her robust and ample attractions, as well as in her bustling and demonstrative presence, which, it appeared, the nice and capricious tastes of Monsieur Paul could not away with. The sound of her voice echoing through the carré would put him into a strange taking. Her long free step, almost stride along the corridor, would often make him snatch up his papers and decamp on the instant. With malicious intent he bethought himself one day to intrude on her class. As quick as lightning he gathered her method of instruction. It differed from a pet plan of his own. With little ceremony and less courtesy, he pointed out what he termed her errors. Whether he expected submission and attention I know not. He met an acrid opposition, accompanied by a round reprimand for his certainly unjustifiable interference. Instead of withdrawing with dignity, as he might still have done, he threw down the gauntlet of defiance. Madame Panache, bellicose as a penthesilea, picked it up in a minute. She snapped her fingers in the intermeddler's face. She rushed upon him with a storm of words. Monsieur Emmanuel was eloquent but Madame Panache was voluble. A system of fierce antagonism ensued. Instead of laughing in his sleeve at his fair foe, with all her sore amour propre and loud self-assertion, Monsieur Paul detested her with intense seriousness. He honoured her with his earnest fury. He pursued her vindictively and implacably, refusing to rest peaceably in his bed, to derive due benefit from his meals, or even serenely to relish his cigar, till she was fairly rooted out of the establishment. The professor conquered, but I cannot say that the laurels of this victory shadowed gracefully his temples. Once I ventured to hint as much. To my great surprise he allowed that I might be right, but averred that when brought into contact, with either men or women of the coarse, self-complacent quality, whereof Madame Panache was a specimen, he had no control over his own passions. An unspeakable and active aversion impelled him to a war of extermination. Three months afterwards, hearing that his vanquished foe had met with reverses, and was likely to be really distressed for want of employment, he forgot his hatred and alike active in good and evil, he moved heaven and earth till he found her a place. Upon her coming to make up former differences, and thank him for his recent kindness, the old voice, a little loud, the old manner, a little forward, so acted upon him that in ten minutes he started up and bowed her, or rather himself, out of the room, in a transport of nervous irritation. To pursue a somewhat audacious parallel, in a love of power and an eager grasp after supremacy, Monsieur Emmanuel was like Bonaparte. He was a man not always to be submitted to. Sometimes it was needful to resist. It was right to stand still, to look up into his eyes, and tell him that his requirements went beyond reason, that his absolutism verged on tyranny. The dawnings, the first developments of peculiar talent appearing within his range and under his rule, curiously excited even disturbed him. He watched its struggle into life with a scowl. He held back his hand, perhaps said, Come on, if you have strength, but would not aid the birth. When the pang and peril of the first conflict were over, when the breath of life was drawn, when he saw the lungs expand and contract, when he felt the heart beat and discovered life in the eye, he did not yet offer to foster. Prove yourself true ere I cherish you, was his ordinance. And how difficult he made that proof! What thorns and briars, what flints he strewed in the path of feet not inured to rough travel! He watched, tearlessly, ordeals that he exacted should be passed through, fearlessly. He followed footprints that, as they approached the bourne, were sometimes marked in blood, followed them grimly holding the austerest police watch over the pain-pressed pilgrim. And when at last he allowed a rest before slumber might close the eyelids, he opened those same lids wide with pitiless finger and thumb, and gazed deep through the pupil and the irids, into the brain, into the heart, 
to search a vanity or pride or falsehood in any of its subtlest forms was discoverable in the furthest recess of existence if at last he let the neophyte sleep it was but a moment he woke him suddenly up to apply new tests. He sent him on irksome errands when he was staggering with weariness. He tried the temper, the sense, and the health, and it was only when every severest test had been applied and endured, when the most corrosive aqua fortis had been used, and failed to tarnish the ore, that he admitted it genuine, and, still in clouded silence, stamped it with his deep brand of approval. I speak not ignorant of these evils. Till the date at which the last chapter closes, Monsieur Paul had not been my professor. He had not given me lessons. But about that time, accidentally hearing me one day acknowledge an ignorance of some branch of education, I think it was arithmetic, which would have disgraced a charity school boy, as he very truly remarked, he took me in hand, examined me first, found me, I need not say, abundantly deficient, gave me some books, and appointed me some tasks. He did this at first with pleasure, indeed with unconcealed exultation, condescending to say that he believed I was bonne et pas trop faible, i.e. well enough disposed, and not wholly destitute of parts, but, owing, he supposed, to adverse circumstances, as yet in a state of wretchedly imperfect mental development. The beginning of all effort has indeed with me been marked by a preternatural imbecility, I never could, even in forming a common acquaintance, assert or prove a claim to average quickness. A depressing and difficult passage has prefaced every new page I have turned in life. So long as this passage lasted, Monsieur Paul was very kind, very good, very forbearing. He saw the sharp pain inflicted, and felt the weighty humiliation imposed by my own sense of incapacity and words can hardly do justice to his tenderness and helpfulness. His own eyes would moisten when tears of shame and effort clouded mine. Burdened as he was with work, he would steal half his brief space of recreation to give to me. But strange grief, when that heavy and overcast dawn began at last to yield to day, when my faculties began to struggle themselves free, and my time of energy and fulfilment came, when I voluntarily doubled, trebled, quadrupled the tasks he set, to please him as I thought. His kindness became sternness. The light changed in his eyes from a beam to a spark. He fretted, he opposed, he curbed me imperiously. The more I did, the harder I worked, the less he seemed content. Sarcasms, of which the severity amazed and puzzled me, harassed my ears. Then flowed out the bitterest innuendos against the pride of intellect. I was vaguely threatened with I know not what doom, if I ever trespassed the limits proper to my sex, and conceived a contraband appetite for unfeminine knowledge. Alas, I had no such appetite. What I loved, it joyed me by any effort to content. But the noble hunger for science in the abstract, the godlike thirst after discovery, these feelings were known to me but by briefest flashes. Yet when Monsieur Paul sneered at me, I wanted to possess them more fully. His injustice stirred in me ambitious wishes. It imparted a strong stimulus. It gave wings to aspiration. In the beginning, before I had penetrated to motives, that uncomprehended sneer of his made my heart ache. But by and by it only warmed the blood in my veins and sent added action to my pulses. Whatever my powers, feminine or the contrary, God had given them, and I felt resolute to be ashamed of no faculty of his bestowal. The combat was very sharp for a time. I seemed to have lost Monsieur Paul's affection. He treated me strangely. In his most unjust moments, he would insinuate that I had deceived him when I appeared, what he called faible that is incompetent he said i had feigned a false incapacity again he would turn suddenly round and accuse me of the most far-fetched imitations and impossible plagiarisms asserting that i had extracted the pith out of books i had not so much as heard of and over the perusal of which i should infallibly have fallen down in a sleep as deep as that of eutychus once upon his preferring such an accusation i turned upon him 
I rose against him. Gathering an armful of his books out of my desk, I filled my apron and pulled them in a heap upon his estrade, at his feet. "'Take them away, Monsieur Paul,' I said, "'and teach me no more. I never asked to be made learned, and you compel me to feel very profoundly that learning is not happiness.' And returning to my desk, I laid my head on my arms, nor would I speak to him for two days afterwards. He pained and chagrined me. His affection had been very sweet and dear, a pleasure new and incomparable. Now that this seemed withdrawn, I cared not for his lessons. The books, however, were not taken away. They were all restored with careful hand to their places. And he came as usual to teach me. He made his peace somehow. Too readily, perhaps. I ought to have stood out longer. But when he looked kind and good, and held out his hand with amity, memory refused to reproduce with due force his oppressive moments. And then reconcilement is always sweet. On a certain morning a message came from my godmother, inviting me to attend some notable lecture to be delivered in the same public rooms before described. Dr. John had brought the message himself, and delivered it verbally to Rosine, who had not scrupled to follow the steps of Monsieur Emmanuel, then passing to the first class, and in his presence stand carrément before my desk, hand an apron pocket, and rehearse the same, saucily and aloud, concluding with the words, Qu'il est vraiment beau, mademoiselle, ce jeune docteur. Quels yeux, quel regard. Tenez, j'en ai le cœur tout ému. When she was gone, my professor demanded of me why I suffered. Cette fille effrontée, cette créature sans pudeur. To address me in such terms, I had no pacifying answer to give. The terms were precisely such as Rosine, a young lady in whose skull the organs of reverence and reserve were not largely developed, was in the constant habit of using. Besides, what she said about the young doctor was true enough. Graham was handsome. He had fine eyes and a thrilling glance. An observation to that effect actually formed itself into sound on my lips. Elle ne dit que la vérité, I said. Ah, vous trouvez? Mais, sans doute. The lesson to which we had that day to submit was such as to make us very glad when it terminated. At its close, the released pupils rushed out, half trembling, half exultant. I too was going. A mandate to remain arrested me. I muttered that I wanted some fresh air, sadly. The stove was in a glow, the class overheated. An inexorable voice merely recommended silence, and this salamander, for whom no room ever seemed too hot, sitting down between my desk and the stove, a situation in which she ought to have felt broiled but did not, proceeded to confront me with a Greek quotation. In Monsieur Emmanuel's soul rankled a chronic suspicion that I knew both Greek and Latin. As monkeys are said to have the power of speech if they would but use it, and are reported to conceal this faculty in fear of its being turned to their detriment, so to me was ascribed a fund of knowledge which I was supposed criminally and craftily to conceal, the privileges of a classical education. It was insinuated, had been mine. On flowers of Hymatus I had revelled, a golden store hived in memory now silently sustained my efforts, and privily nurtured my wits. A hundred expedients did Monsieur Paul employ to surprise my secret, to wheedle, to threaten, to startle it out of me. Sometimes he placed Greek and Latin books in my way, and then watched me as Joan of Arc's jailers tempted her with the warrior's accoutrements, and lay in wait for the issue. Again he quoted I know not what authors and passages, and while rolling out their sweet and sounding lines, the classic tones fell musically from his lips, for he had a good voice, remarkable for compass, modulation, and matchless expression. He would fix on me a vigilant, piercing, and often malicious eye. It was evident he sometimes expected great demonstrations. They never occurred, however. Not comprehending, of course, I could neither be charmed nor annoyed. Baffled, almost angry, he still clung to his fixed idea. My susceptibilities were pronounced marble, my face a mask. 
It appeared as if he could not be brought to accept the homely truth, and take me for what I was. Men and women, too, must have delusion of some sort. If not made ready to their hand, they will invent exaggeration for themselves. At moments I did wish that his suspicions had been better founded. There were times when I would have given my right hand to possess the treasures he ascribed to me. He deserved condign punishment for his testy crotchets. I could have gloried in bringing home to him his worst apprehensions astoundingly realized. I could have exulted to burst on his vision, confront and confound his lunette, one blaze of acquirements. Oh, why did nobody undertake to make me clever while I was young enough to learn, that I might, by one grand, sudden, inhuman revelation, one cold, cruel, overwhelming triumph, have for ever crushed the mocking spirit out of Paul, Carl, David, Emmanuel? Alas, no such feat was in my power. Today, as usual, his quotations fell ineffectual. He soon shifted his ground. Women of intellect was his next theme. Here he was at home. A woman of intellect, it appeared, was a sort of lusus naturae, a luckless accident, a thing for which there was neither place nor use in creation, wanted neither as wife nor worker. Beauty anticipated her in the first office. He believed in his soul that lovely, placid, and passive feminine mediocrity was the only pillow on which manly thought and sense could find rest for its etching temples, and as to work, male mind alone could work to any good practical result. Eh? This, eh, uh, was a note of interrogation, intended to draw from me contradiction or objection. However, I only said, Cela ne me regarde pas, je ne m'en soucie pas and presently added, "'May I go, monsieur? They have rung the bell for the second déjeuner, i.e. luncheon.' "'What of that? You are not hungry?' "'Indeed I was,' I said. "'I had had nothing since breakfast at seven, and should have nothing till dinner at five if I missed this bell.' "'Well, he was in the same plight, but I might share with him.' and he broke in two the brioche intended for his own refreshment, and gave me half. Truly his bark was worse than his bite, but the really formidable attack was yet to come. While eating his cake I could not forbear expressing my secret wish, that I really knew all of which he accused me. Did I sincerely feel myself to be an ignoramus? he asked in a softened tone. If I had replied meekly by an unqualified affirmative, I believe he would have stretched out his hand, and we should have been friends on the spot. But I answered, Not exactly. I am ignorant, monsieur, in the knowledge you ascribe to me. But I sometimes, not always, feel a knowledge of my own. What did I mean? He inquired sharply. Unable to answer this question in a breath, I evaded it by change of subject. He had now finished his half of the brioche. Feeling sure that on so trifling a fragment he could not have satisfied his appetite, as, indeed, I had not appeased mine, and inhaling the fragrance of baked apples afar from the refectory, I ventured to inquire whether he did not also perceive that agreeable odour. He confessed that he did. I said if he would let me out by the garden door, and permit me just to run across the court, I would fetch him a plateful and added that I believed they were excellent, as Gauton had a very good method of baking, or rather stewing fruit, putting in a little spice, sugar, and a glass or two of vin blanc. Might I go? Petite gourmande, said he, smiling. I have not forgotten how pleased you were with the pâté à la crème I once gave you, and you know very well at this moment that to fetch the apples for me will be the same as getting them for yourself. Go then, but come back quickly. And at last he liberated me on parole. My own plan was to go and return with speed and good faith, to put the plate in at the door, and then to vanish incontinent, leaving all consequences for future settlement. That intolerably keen instinct of his seemed to have anticipated my scheme. He met me at the threshold, hurried me into the room, and fixed me in a minute in my former seat. 
taking the plate of fruit from my hand he divided the portion intended only for himself and ordered me to eat my share i complied with no good grace and vexed i suppose by my reluctance he opened a masked and dangerous battery all he had yet said i could count as mere sound and fury signifying nothing not so of the present attack it consisted in an unreasonable proposition with which he had before afflicted me namely that on the next public examination day i should engage foreigner as i was to take my place on the first form of first-class pupils and with them improvise a composition in french on any subject any spectator might dictate without benefit of grammar or lexicon i knew what the result of such an experiment would be i to whom nature had denied the impromptu faculty who in public was by nature a cipher whose time of mental activity even when alone was not under the meridian sun who needed the fresh silence of morning or the recluse peace of evening to win from the creative impulse one evidence of his presence one proof of his force i with whom that impulse was the most intractable the most capricious the most maddening of masters him before me always excepted a deity which sometimes under circumstances apparently propitious would not speak when questioned would not hear when appealed to would not when sought be found but would stand all cold all indurated all granite a dark baal with carven lips and blank eyeballs and breast like the stone face of a tomb and again suddenly at some turn some sound some long trembling sob of the wind at some rushing past of an unseen stream of electricity the irrational demon would wake unsolicited would stir strangely alive would rush from its pedestal like a perturbed dagon calling to its votary for a sacrifice whatever the hour to its victim for some blood or some breath whatever the circumstance or scene rousing its priest treacherously promising vaticanation and perhaps filling its temple with a strange hum of oracles but sure to give half the significance to fateful winds and grudging to the desperate listener even a miserable remnant yielding it sordidly as though each word had been a drop of the deathless ichor of its own dark veins and this tyrant i was to compel into bondage and make it improvise a theme on a school estrade between a mathilde and a coralie under the eye of a madame beck for the pleasure and the inspiration of a bourgeois of la basse upon this argument monsieur paul and i did battle more than once strong battle with confused noise of demand and rejection exaction and repulse on this particular day i was soundly rated the obstinacy of my whole sex it seems was concentrated in me i had an orgueil de diable i fear to fail for food what did it matter whether i failed or not who was i that i should not fail like my betters it would do me good to fail he wanted to see me worsted i knew he did and one minute he paused to take breath would i speak now and be tractable never would i be tractable in this matter law itself should not compel me i would pay a fine or undergo an imprisonment rather than write for show and to order perched up on a platform could soft motives influence me would i yield for friendship's sake not a wit not a hair-breadth no form of friendship under the sun had a right to exact such a concession no true friendship would harass me thus he supposed then with a sneer monsieur paul could sneer supremely curling his lip opening his nostrils contracting his eyelids he supposed there was but one form of appeal to which i would listen and of that form it was not for him to make use under certain persuasions from certain carters je vous vois d'ici said he eagerly subscribing to the sacrifice passionately arming for the effort making a simpleton a warning and an example of myself before a hundred and fifty of the papas and mamas of villette 
and here losing patience i broke out afresh with a cry that i wanted to be liberated to get out into the air i was almost in a fever Shit. said the inexorable this was a mere pretext to run away he was not hot with the stove close at his back how could i suffer thoroughly screened by his person i did not understand his constitution i knew nothing of the natural history of salamanders for my own part i was a phlegmatic islander and sitting in an oven did not agree with me at least might i step to the well and get a glass of water the sweet apples had made me thirsty if that was all he would do my errand he went to fetch the water of course with the door only on the latch behind me i lost not my opportunity ere his return his half-worried prey had escaped End of chapter thirty Chapter thirty one of Villette. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Villette by Charlotte Bronte. Chapter thirty one. The Dryad. The spring was advancing, and the weather had turned suddenly warm. This change of temperature brought with it for me, as probably for many others, temporary decrease of strength. Slight exertion at this time left me overcome with fatigue sleepless nights entailed languid days one sunday afternoon having walked the distance of half a league to the protestant church i came back weary and exhausted and taking refuge in my solitary sanctuary the first class i was glad to sit down and to make of my desk a pillow for my arms and head a while i listened to the lullaby of bees humming in the berceau and watched through the glass door and the tender lightly strewn spring foliage madame beck and a gay party of friends whom she had entertained that day at dinner after morning mass walking in the centre alley under orchard boughs dressed at this season in blossom and wearing a colouring as pure and warm as mountain snow at sunrise my principal attraction towards this group of guests lay i remember in one figure that of a handsome young girl whom i had seen before as a visitor at madame beck's and of whom i had been vaguely told that she was a filleule or goddaughter of monsieur emmanuel's and that between her mother or aunt or some other female relation of hers and the professor had existed of old a special friendship monsieur paul was not of the holiday band to-day but i had seen this young girl with him ere now and as far as distant observation could enable me to judge she seemed to enjoy him with the frank ease of a ward with an indulgent guardian i had seen her run up to him put her arm through his and hang upon him once when she did so a curious sensation had struck through me a disagreeable anticipatory sensation one of the family of presentiments i suppose but i refused to analyse or dwell upon it while watching this girl mademoiselle sauveur by name and following the gleam of her bright silk robe she was always richly dressed for she was said to be wealthy through the flowers and the glancing leaves of tender emerald my eyes became dazzled they closed my lassitude the warmth of the day the hum of bees and birds all lulled me and at last i slept two hours stole over me ere i woke the sun had declined out of sight behind the towering houses the garden and the room were grey bees had gone homeward and the flowers were closing the party of guests too had vanished each alley was void on waking i felt much at ease not chill as i ought to have been after sitting so still for at least two hours my cheek and arms were not benumbed by pressure against the hard desk no wonder instead of the bare wood on which i had laid them i found a thick shawl carefully folded substituted for support and another shawl both taken from the corridor where such things hung wrapped warmly round me who had done this who was my friend which of the teachers which of the pupils none except saint pierre was inimical to me but which of them had the art the thought 
the habit of benefiting thus tenderly which of them had a step so quiet a hand so gentle but i should have heard or felt her if she had approached or touched me in a day's sleep as to ginevra farnshaw that bright young creature was not gentle at all and would certainly have pulled me out of my chair if she had meddled in the matter i said at last it is madame beck's doing she has come in seen me asleep and thought i might take cold she considers me a useful machine answering well the purpose for which it was hired so would not have me needlessly injured and now methought i'll take a walk the evening is fresh and not very chill so i opened the glass door and stepped into the berceau i went to my own alley had it been dark or even dusk i should have hardly ventured there for i had not yet forgotten the curious illusion of vision if illusion it were experienced in that place some months ago but a ray of the setting sun burnished still the grey crown of jean baptiste nor had all the birds of the garden yet vanished into their nests amongst the tufted shrubs and thick wall ivy i paced up and down thinking almost the same thoughts i had pondered that night when i buried my glass jar how i should make some advance in life take another step towards an independent position for this train of reflection though not lately pursued had never by me been wholly abandoned and whenever a certain eye was averted from me and a certain countenance grew dark with unkindness and injustice into that track of speculation did i at once strike so that little by little i had laid half a plan living costs little said i to myself in this economical town of villette where people are more sensible than i understand they are in dear old england infinitely less worried about appearance and less emulous of display when nobody is in the least ashamed to be quite as homely and saving as he finds convenient house rent in a prudently chosen situation need not be high when i shall have saved one thousand francs i will take a tenement with one large room and two or three smaller ones furnish the first with a few benches and desks a black tableau an estrade for myself upon it a chair and table with a sponge and some white chalks begin with taking day pupils and so work my way upwards madame beck's commencement was as i have often heard her say from no higher starting point and where is she now all these premises and this garden are hers bought with her money she has a competency already secured for old age and a flourishing establishment under her direction which will furnish a career for her children courage lucy snow with self-denial and economy now and steady exertion by and by an object in life need not fail you venture not to complain that such an object is too selfish too limited and lacks interest be content to labour for independence until you have proved by winning that prize your right to look higher but afterwards is there nothing more for me in life no true home nothing to be dearer to me than myself and by its paramount preciousness to draw from me better things than i care to culture for myself only nothing at whose feet i can willingly lay down the whole burden of human egotism and gloriously take up the nobler charge of labouring and living for others i suppose lucy snow the orb of your life is not to be so rounded for you the crescent phase must suffice very good i see a huge mass of my fellow-creatures in no better circumstances i see that a great many men and more women hold their span of life on conditions of denial and privation i find no reason why i should be of the few favoured i believe in some blending of hope and sunshine sweetening the worst lots i believe that this life is not all neither the beginning nor the end i believe while i tremble i trust while i weep so this subject is done with it is right to look our life accounts bravely in the face now and then and settle them honestly and he is a poor self-swindler who lies to himself while he reckons the items and sets down under the head happiness that which is misery call anguish anguish and despair despair write both down in strong characters with a resolute pen you will the better pay your debt to doom 
falsify, insert privilege where you should have written pain, and see if your mighty creditor will allow the fraud to pass, or accept the coin with which you would cheat him. Offer to the strongest, if the darkest angel of God's host, water when he has asked blood, will he take it? Not a whole pale sea for one red drop. I settled another account. Pausing before Methuselah, the giant and patriarch of the garden, and leaning my brow against his knotty trunk, my foot rested on the stone sealing the small sepulchre at his root, and I recalled the passage of feeling therein buried. I recalled Dr. John, my warm affection for him, my faith in his excellence, my delight in his grace. What was become of that curious one-sided friendship which was half marble and half life, only on one hand truth, and on the other perhaps a jest? Was this feeling dead? I do not know, but it was buried. Sometimes I thought the tomb unquiet, and dreamed strangely of disturbed earth, and of hair still golden and living, obtruded through coffin chinks. Had I been too hasty? I used to ask myself, and this question would occur with a cruel sharpness after some brief chance interview with Dr. John. He had still such kind looks, such a warm hand, his voice still kept so pleasant a tone for my name. I never liked Lucy so well as when he uttered it, but I learned in time that this benignity, this cordiality, this music belonged in no shape to me. It was a part of himself. It was the honey of his temper. It was the balm of his mellow mood. He imparted it as the ripe fruit rewards with sweetness the rifling bee. He diffused it about him as sweet plants shed their perfume. Does the nectarine love either the bee or bird it feeds? Is the sweetbriar enamoured of the air? Good night, Dr. John. You are good. You are beautiful but you are not mine. Good night, and God bless you. Thus I closed my musings. Good night left my lips in sound. I heard the word spoken, and then I heard an echo, quite close. Good night, mademoiselle, or oh, rather good evening. The sun is scarce set. I hope you slept well. I started, but was only discomposed a moment. I knew the voice and speaker. Slept, monsieur. When? Where? You may well inquire when, where. It seems you turn day into night and choose a desk for a pillow. Rather hard lodging. It was softened for me, monsieur, while I slept. That unseen, gift-bringing thing which haunts my desk remembered me. No matter how I fell asleep, I awoke pillowed and covered. Did the shores keep you warm? Very warm. Do you ask thanks for them? No, you look pale in your slumbers. Are you homesick? To be homesick, one must have a home, which I have not. Then you have more need of a careful friend. I scarcely know anyone, Miss Lucy, who needs a friend more absolutely than you. Your very faults imperatively require it. You want so much checking, regulating, and keeping down. This idea of keeping down never left Monsieur Paul's head. The most habitual subjugation would, in my case, have failed to relieve him of it. No matter, what did it signify? I listened to him and did not trouble myself to be too submissive. His occupation would have been gone had I left him nothing to keep down. You need watching, and watching over, he pursued. And it is well for you that I see this, and do my best to discharge both duties. I watch you and others pretty closely, pretty constantly, nearer and oftener than you or they think. Do you see that window with the light in it? He pointed to a lattice in one of the college boarding houses. That, said he, is a room I have hired, nominally for a study, virtually for a post of observation. There I sit and read for hours together. It is my way, 
my taste. My book is this garden. Its contents are human nature, female human nature. I know you all by heart. Ah, I know you well. Saint Pierre, the Parisienne, said the maîtresse femme, my cousin Beck herself. It is not right, monsieur. Comment, it is not right? By whose creed? Does some dogma of Calvin or Luther condemn it? What is that to me? I am no Protestant. My rich father, for, though I have known poverty, and once starved for a year in a garret in Rome, starved wretchedly, often on a meal a day, and sometimes not that, yet I was born to wealth. My rich father was a good Catholic, and he gave me a priest and a Jesuit for a tutor. I retain his lessons, and to what discoveries, grand Dieu, have they not aided me? Discoveries made by stealth seem to me dishonourable discoveries. Puritan, I doubt it not. You see how my Jesuit system works. You know the Saint-Pierre? Partially. He laughed. You say right, partially, whereas I know her thoroughly. There is the difference. She played before me the amiable, offered me pâte de velours, caressed, flattered, found on me. Now I am accessible to a woman's flattery, accessible against my reason, though never pretty. She was, when I first knew her, young, or knew how to look young. Like all her country women, she had the art of dressing. She had a certain cool, easy, social assurance, which spared me the pain of embarrassment. Monsieur, that must have been unnecessary. I never saw you embarrassed in my life. Mademoiselle, you know little of me. I can be embarrassed as a petit pensionnaire. There is a fount of modesty and diffidence in my nature. Monsieur, I never saw it. Mademoiselle, it is there. You ought to have seen it. Monsieur, I have observed you in public, on platforms, in tribunes, before titles and crowned heads, and you were as easy as you are in the third division. Mademoiselle, neither titles nor crowned heads excite my modesty, and publicity is very much my element. I like it well, and breath in it quite freely. But, but in short, here is the sentiment brought into action, at this very moment. However, I disdain to be worse by it. If, mademoiselle, I were a marrying man, which I am not, and you may spare yourself the trouble of any sneer you may be contemplating at the thought, and found it necessary to ask a lady whether she could look upon me in the light of a future husband, then would it be proved that I am, as I say, modest. I quite believed him now, and in believing I honoured him with a sincerity of esteem which made my heart ache. As to the Saint-Pierre, he went on, recovering himself, for his voice had altered a little. She once intended to be Madame Emmanuel, and I don't know whither I might have been led, but for yonder little lattice with the light. Ah, magic lattice, which miracles of discovery hast thou wrought? Yes, he pursued. I have seen her rancours, her vanities, her levities, not only here, but elsewhere. I have witnessed what bucklers me against all her arts. I am safe from poor Zélie and my pupils he presently recommenced those blonde jeunes filles so mild and meek i have seen the most reserved romp like boys the demurest snatch grapes from the walls shake pears from the trees when the english teacher came i saw her mark her early preference for disallie noticed her taste for seclusion 
watched her well, long before she and I came to speaking terms. Do you recollect my once coming silently and offering you a little knot of white violets when we were strangers? I recollect it. I dried the violets, kept them, and have them still. It pleased me when you took them peacefully and promptly, without prudery. That sentiment, which I ever dread to excite, and which, when it is revealed in eye or gesture, I vindictively detest. To return, not only did I watch you, but often, especially at eventide, another guardian angel was noiselessly hovering near. Night after night, my cousin Beck has stolen down yonder steps and glidingly pursued your movements when you did not see her. But, monsieur, you could not from the distance of that window see what passed in this garden at night. By moonlight, I possibly might with a glass. I use a glass, but the garden itself is open to me. In the shed at the bottom, there is a door leading into a court which communicates with the college. Of that door, I possess the key and thus come and go at pleasure. This afternoon I came through it and found you asleep in class. Again, this evening I have availed myself of the same entrance. I could not help saying, if you were a wicked designing man, how terrible would all this be? His attention seemed incapable of being arrested by this view of the subject. He lit his cigar, and while he puffed it, leaning against a tree and looking at me in a cool, amused way he had when his humour was tranquil, I thought proper to go on sermonising him. He often lectured me by the hour together. I did not see why I should not speak my mind for once. So I told him my impressions concerning his Jesuit system. The knowledge it brings you is bought too dear, monsieur. This coming and going by stealth degrades your own dignity. My dignity, he cried, laughing. When did you ever see me trouble my head about my dignity? It is you, Miss Lucy, who are digne. How often, in your high, insular presence, have I taken a pleasure in trampling upon what you are pleased to call my dignity, tearing it, scattering it to the winds in those mad transports you witness with such hauteur, and which I know you think very like the ravings of a third-rate London actor. Monsieur, I tell you, every glance you cast from that lattice is a wrong done to the best part of your own nature. To study the human heart thus is to banquet secretly and sacrilegiously on Eve's apples. I wish you were a Protestant. Indifferent to the wish, he smoked on. After a space of smiling yet thoughtful silence, he said, rather suddenly, I have seen other things. What other things? Taking the weed from his lips, he threw the remnant amongst the shrubs, where, for a moment, it lay glowing in the gloom. Look at it, said he. Is it not that spark like an eye watching you and me? He took a turn down the walk. Presently returning, he went on. I have seen, Miss Lucy, things to me unaccountable that have made me watch all night for a solution, and I have not yet found it. The tone was peculiar. My veins thrilled. He saw me shiver. Are you afraid? Whether is it of my words or that red jealous eye just twinking itself out? I am cold. The night grows dark and late, and the air is changed. It is time to go in. It is little past eight, but you shall go in soon. Answer me only this question. Yet he paused ere he put it. The garden was truly growing dark. Dusk had come on with clouds, and drops of rain began to patter through the trees. I hoped he would feel this, but, for the moment, he seemed too much absorbed to be sensible of the change. 
Mademoiselle, do you Protestants believe in the supernatural? There is a difference of theory and belief on this point amongst Protestants as amongst other sects, I answered. Why, monsieur, do you ask such a question? Why do you shrink and speak so faintly? Are you superstitious? I am constitutionally nervous. I dislike the discussion of such subjects. I dislike it the more because... You believe? No, but it has happened to me to experience impressions. Since you came here? Yes, not many months ago. Here? In this house? Yes. Bon, I am glad of it. I knew it somehow. Before you told me, I was conscious of rapport between you and myself. You are patient, and I am choleric. You are quiet and pale, and I am tanned and fiery. You are a strict protestant, and I am a sort of lay Jesuit. But we are alike. There is affinity between us. Do you see it? Mademoiselle, when you look in the glass, do you observe that your forehead is shaped like mine? That your eyes are cut like mine? Do you hear that you have some of my tones of voice? Do you know that you have many of my looks? I perceive all this, and believe that you were born under my star. Yes, you were born under my star. Tremble, for were that is the case with mortals, the threads of their destinies are difficult to be disentangled. Nothings and catchings occur. Sudden breaks leave damage in the web. But these impressions, as you say, with English caution, I too had my impressions. Monsieur, tell me them. I desire no better, and intend no less. You know the legion of this house and garden? I know it, yes. They say that hundreds of years ago a nun was buried here alive at the foot of this very tree, beneath the ground which now bears us. And that in former days a nun's ghost used to come and go here. Monsieur, what if it comes and goes here still? Something comes and goes here. There is a shape frequenting this house by night, different to any forms that show themselves by day. I have indisputably seen something, more than once, and to me its conventional weeds were a strange sight, saying more than they can do to any other living being. A nun. Monsieur, I too have seen it. I anticipated that. Whether this nun be flesh and blood, or something that remains when blood is dried and flesh is wasted, her business is as much with you as with me, probably. Well, I mean to make it out. It has baffled me so far, but I mean to follow up the mystery. I mean... Instead of telling me what he meant, he raised his head suddenly. I made the same movement in the same instant. We both looked to one point, the high tree shadowing the great berceau, and resting some of its boughs on the roof of the first class. There had been a strange and inexplicable sound from that quarter, as if the arms of that tree had swayed of their own motion, and its weight of foliage had rushed and crushed against the massive trunk. Yes, there scarce stirred a breeze, and that heavy tree was convulsed, whilst the feathery shrubs stood still. For some minutes amongst the wood and leafage a rending and heaving went on. Dark as it was, it seemed to me that something more solid than either night shadow or branch shadow blackened out of the boles. At last the struggle ceased. What birth succeeded this travail? What dryad was born of these throes? We watched fixedly. A sudden bell rang in the house, the prayer bell. Instantly into our alley there came, out of the berceau, an apparition, all black and white. With a sort of angry rush close, close past our faces, swept swiftly the very nun herself. 
Never had I seen her so clearly. She looked tall of stature and fierce of gesture. As she went, the wind rose, sobbing. The rain poured wild and cold. The whole night seemed to feel her. End of chapter 31《Chapter 32 of Villette. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Villette by Charlotte Bronte. Chapter 32. The First Letter. Where, it becomes time to inquire, was Paulina Mary? How fared my intercourse with the sumptuous Hôtel Crécy? That intercourse had, for an interval, been suspended by absence. Monsieur and Miss de Bassompierre had been travelling dividing some weeks between the provinces and capital of France. Chance apprised me of their return very shortly after it took place. I was walking one mild afternoon on a quiet boulevard, wandering slowly on, enjoying the benign April sun, and some thoughts not unpleasing, when I saw before me a group of riders, stopping as if they had just encountered, and exchanging greetings in the midst of the broad, smooth, linden-bordered path. On one side a middle-aged gentleman and young lady, on the other a young and handsome man. Very graceful was the lady's mien, choice her appointments, delicate and stately her whole aspect. Still, as I looked, I felt they were known to me, and drawing a little nearer, I fully recognized them all, the Count Holm de Bassompierre, his daughter, and Dr. Graham Breton. How animated was Graham's face! How true, how warm, yet how retiring the joy it expressed! This was the state of things, this the combination of circumstances, at once to attract and enchain, to subdue and excite Dr. John. The pearl he admired was in itself of great price and truest purity, but he was not the man who, in appreciating the gem, could forget its setting. Had he seen Paulina with the same youth, beauty, and grace, but on foot, alone, unguarded, and in simple attire, a dependent worker, a demi-grisette, he would have thought her a pretty little creature, and would have loved with his eye her movements and her mien. But it required other than this to conquer him as he was now vanquished, to bring him safe under dominion as now, without loss and even with gain to his manly honour, one saw that he was reduced. There was about Dr. John all the man of the world. To satisfy himself did not suffice. Society must approve, the world must admire what he did, or he counted his measures false and futile. In his victrix he required all that was here visible, the imprint of high cultivation, the consecration of a careful and authoritative protection, the adjuncts that fashion decrees, wealth purchases, and taste adjusts. For these conditions his spirit stipulated ere it surrendered. They were here to the utmost fulfilled, and now, proud, impassioned, yet fearing, he did homage to Paulina as his sovereign. As for her, the smile of feeling, rather than of conscious power, slept soft in her eyes. They parted. He passed me at speed, hardly feeling the earth he skimmed, and seeing nothing on either hand. He looked very handsome. Metal and purpose were roused in him fully. "'Papa, there is Lucy!' cried a musical, friendly voice. "'Lucy, dear Lucy, do come here!' I hastened to her. She threw back her veil, and stooped from her saddle to kiss me. "'I was coming to see you tomorrow said she. But now to-morrow you will come and see me. She named the hour, and I promised compliance. The morrow's evening found me with her. She and I shut into her own room. I had not seen her since that occasion when her claims were brought into comparison with those of Ginevra Fanshawe, and had so signally prevailed. She had much to tell me of her travels in the interval. A most animated, rapid speaker was she in such a tete-a-tete. -tete a most lively describer. Yet with her artless diction and clear soft voice, she never seemed to speak too fast or to say too much. 
my own attention i think would not soon have flagged but by and by she herself seemed to need some change of subject she hastened to wind up her narrative briefly yet why she terminated with so concise an abridgment did not immediately appear silence followed a restless silence not without symptoms of abstraction then turning to me in a diffident half appealing voice lucy well i am at your side is my cousin ginevra still at matin beck's your cousin is still there you must be longing to see her no not much you want to invite her to spend another evening no i suppose she still talks about being married not to any one you care for but of course she still thinks of dr breton she cannot have changed her mind on that point because it was so fixed two months ago why you know it does not matter you saw the terms on which they stood there was a little misunderstanding that evening certainly does she seem unhappy not she to change the subject have you heard or seen nothing of or from graham during your absence papa had letters from him once or twice about business i think he undertook the management of some affair which required attention while we were away dr breton seems to respect papa and to have pleasure in obliging him yes you met him yesterday on the boulevard you would be able to judge from his aspect that his friends need not be painfully anxious about his health papa seems to have thought with you i could not help smiling he is not particularly observant you know because he is often thinking of other things than what pass before his eyes but he said as dr breton rode away really it does a man good to see the spirit and energy of that boy he called dr breton a boy i believe he almost thinks him so just as he thinks me a little girl he was not speaking to me but dropped that remark to himself lucy again fell the appealing accent and at the same instant she left her chair and came and sat on the stool at my feet i liked her it is not a declaration i have often made concerning my acquaintance in the course of this book the reader will bear with it for once intimate intercourse close inspection disclosed in Paulina only what was delicate, intelligent, and sincere. Therefore my regard for her lay deep. An admiration more superficial might have been more demonstrative. Mine, however, was quiet. "'What have you to ask of Lucy?' said I. "'Be brave, and speak it out.' But there was no courage in her eye. As it met mine, it fell and there was no coolness on her cheek, not a transient surface blush, but a gathering inward excitement raised its tint and its temperature. "'Lucy, I do wish to know your thoughts of Dr. Breton. Do, do give me your real opinion of his character, his disposition.' "'His character stands high, and deservedly high.' "'And his disposition. Tell me about his disposition,' she urged. "'You know him well.' "'I know him pretty well.' "'You know his home side.' You have seen him with his mother. Speak of him as a son. He is a fine-hearted son, his mother's comfort and hope, her pride and pleasure. She held my hand between hers, and at each favourable word gave it a little caressing stroke. In what other way is he good, Lucy? Dr. Breton is benevolent, humanely disposed towards all his race. Dr. Breton would have benignity for the lowest savage or the worst criminal. I heard some gentlemen, some of papa's friends, who were talking about him, say the same. They say many of the poor patients at the hospitals, who tremble before some pitiless and selfish surgeons, welcome him. They are right. I have witnessed as much. He once took me over a hospital. I saw how he was received. Your father's friends are right. The softest gratitude animated her eye as she lifted it a moment. She had yet more to say but seemed hesitating about time and place. Dusk was beginning to rain, her parlour fire already glowed with twilight ruddiness, but I thought she wished the room dimmer, the hour later. "'How quiet and secluded we feel here,' I remarked, to reassure her. "'Do we? Yes, it is a still evening, and I shall not be called down to tea. Papa is dining out.' Still holding my hand, she played with the fingers unconsciously dressed them, now in her own rings, and now circled them with a twine of her beautiful hair. 
She patted the palm against her hot cheek, and at last, having cleared a voice that was naturally liquid as a lark's, she said, You must think it rather strange that I should talk so much about Dr. Breton, ask so many questions, take such an interest, but— Not at all strange. Perfectly natural. You like him. And if I did— said she, with slight quickness. Is that a reason why I should talk? I suppose you think me weak, like my cousin Ginevra. If I thought you one wit like Madame Ginevra, I would not sit here waiting for your communications. I would get up, walk at my ease about the room, and anticipate all you had to say by a round lecture. Go on. I mean to go on, retorted she. What else do you suppose I mean to do? And she looked and spoke the little Polly of Breton, petulant, sensitive. If, said she, emphatically, if I liked Dr. John till I was fit to die for liking him, that alone could not license me to be otherwise than dumb, dumb as the grave, dumb as you, Lucy Snow, you know it, and you know you would despise me if I failed in self-control, and whined about some rickety liking that was all on my side. It is true I little respect women or girls who are loquacious either in boasting the triumphs or bemoaning the mortifications of feelings. But as to you, Paulina, speak, for I earnestly wish to hear you. Tell me all it will give you pleasure or relief to tell. I ask no more. Do you care for me, Lucy? Yes, I do, Paulina. And I love you. I had an odd content in being with you even when I was a little troublesome, disobedient girl. It was charming to me, then, to lavish on you my naughtiness and whims. Now you are acceptable to me, and I like to talk with and trust you. So listen, Lucy. And she settled herself, resting against my arm. Resting gently, not with honest Mistress Fanshawe's fatiguing and selfish weight. A few minutes since you asked whether we had not heard from Graham during our absence, and I said there were two letters for Papa and business. This was true, but I did not tell you all. You evaded? I shuffled and equivocated, you know. However, I am going to speak the truth now. It is getting darker. One can talk at one's ease. Papa often lets me open the letter-bag, and give him out the contents. One morning, about three weeks ago, you don't know how surprised I was to find, amongst a dozen letters for Monsieur de Bossompierre, a note addressed to Miss de Bossompierre. I spied it at once, amidst all the rest. The handwriting was not strange. It attracted me directly. I was going to say, Papa, here is another letter from Dr. Breton but the miss struck me mute. I actually never received a letter from a gentleman before. Ought I to have shown it to papa, and let him open it, and read it first? I could not for my life, Lucy. I know so well papa's ideas about me. He forgets my age. He thinks I am a mere schoolgirl. He is not aware that other people see I am grown up as tall as I shall be. So, with a curious mixture of feelings, some of them self-reproachful, and some so fluttering and strong I cannot describe them, I gave papa his twelve letters, his herd of possessions, and kept back my one, my ewe lamb. It lay in my lap during breakfast, looking up at me with an inexplicable meaning, making me feel myself a thing double existent. A child to that dear papa, but no more a child to myself. After breakfast, I carried my letter upstairs, and having secured myself by turning the key in the door, I began to study the outside of my treasure. It was some minutes before I could get over the direction, and penetrate the seal. One does not take a strong place of this kind by instant storm. One sits down a while before it, as beleaguers say. Graham's hand is like himself, Lucy, and so is his seal, all clear, firm, and rounded, no slovenly splash of wax, a full, solid, steady drop, a distinct impress, no pointed turns harshly pricking the optic nerve, but a clean, mellow, pleasant manuscript that soothes you as you read. It is like his face, just like the chiselling of his features. Do you know his autograph? I have seen it. Go on. The seal was too beautiful to be broken, so I cut it round with my scissors. On the point of reading the letter at last, I once more drew back voluntarily. It was too soon yet to drink that draught. The sparkle in the cup was so beautiful. I would watch it yet a minute. Then I remembered all at once that I had not said my prayers that morning. Having heard Papa go down to breakfast a little earlier than usual, I had been afraid of keeping him waiting, and had hastened to join him as soon as dressed thinking no harm to put off prayers till afterwards. Some people would say I ought to have served God first, and then men. But I don't think heaven could be jealous of anything I might do for papa. I believe I am superstitious. A voice seemed now to say that another feeling than filial affection was in question, to urge me to pray before I dared to read what I so longed to read, 
to deny myself yet a moment, and remember first a great duty. I have had these impulses ever since I can remember. I put the letter down and said my prayers, adding at the end a strong entreaty that whatever happened, I might not be tempted or led to cause papa any sorrow, and might never, in caring for others, neglect him. The very thought of such a possibility so pierced my heart that it made me cry. But still, Lucy, I felt that in time papa would have to be taught the truth, managed and induced to hear reason. I read the letter. Lucy, in life is said to be all disappointment. I was not disappointed. Ere I read, and while I read, my heart did more than throb. It trembled fast. Every quiver seemed like the pant of an animal athirst, laid down at a well and drinking. And the well proved quite full, gloriously clear. It rose up munificently of its own impulse. I saw the sun through its gush. Not a moat, Lucy, no moss, no insect, no atom in the thrice-refined golden gurgle. Life, she went on, is said to be full of pain to some. I have read biographies where the wayfarer seemed to journey on from suffering to suffering, where hope flew before him fast, never alighting so near, or lingering so long, as to give his hand a chance of one realising grasp. I have read of those who sowed in tears, and whose harvest, so far from being reaped in joy, perished by untimely blight, or was borne off by sudden whirlwind. And, alas, some of these met the winter with empty garners, and died of utter want in the darkest and coldest of the year. Was it their fault, Paulina, that they of whom you speak thus died? Not always their fault. Some of them were good endeavouring people. I am not endeavouring, nor actively good. Yet God has caused me to grow in sun, do moisture, and safe protection, sheltered, fostered, taught by my dear father. And now, now, another comes. Graham loves me. For some minutes we both paused on this climax. Does your father know? I inquired in a low voice. Graham spoke with deep respect to papa, but implied that he dared not approach that quarter as yet. He must first prove his worth. He added that he must have some light respecting myself, and my own feelings ere he ventured to risk a step in the matter elsewhere. How did you reply? I replied briefly, but I did not repulse him. Yet I almost trembled for fear of making the answer too cordial. Graham's tastes are so fastidious. I wrote it three times, chastening and subduing the phrases at every rescript, at last having confected it till it seemed to me to resemble a morsel of ice, flavoured with ever so slight a zest of fruit or sugar, I ventured to seal and dispatch it. Excellent, Paulina. Your instinct is fine. You understand, Dr. Breton. But how must I manage about papa? There I am still in pain. Do not manage at all. Wait now. Only maintain no further correspondence till your father knows all, and gives his sanction. Will he ever give it? Time will show. Wait. Dr. Breton wrote one other letter, deeply grateful for my calm brief note, but I anticipated your advice, by saying that while my sentiments continued the same, I could not without my father's knowledge write again. You acted as you ought to have done. So Dr. Breton will feel. It will increase his pride in you, his love for you, if either be capable of increase. Paulina, that gentle hoar frost of yours, surrounding so much pure, fine flame, is a priceless privilege of nature. You see, I feel Graham's disposition, said she. I feel that no delicacy can be too exquisite for his treatment. It is perfectly proved that you comprehend him. And then, whatever Dr. Breton's disposition, were he one who expected to be more nearly met, you would still act truthfully, openly, tenderly with your father. Lucy, I trust I shall thus act always. Oh, it will be pain to wake papa from his dream, and tell him I am no more a little girl. Be in no hurry to do so, Paulina. Leave the revelation to time and your kind fate. I also have noticed the gentleness of her cares for you. Doubt not she will benignantly order the circumstances, and fitly appoint the hour. Yes, I have thought over your life just as you have yourself thought it over. I have made comparisons like those to which you adverted. We know not the future, but the past has been propitious. As a child I feared for you. Nothing that his life was ever more susceptible than your nature in infancy. And a harshness or neglect— Neither your outward nor your inward self would have ripened to what they are now. Much pain, much fear, much struggle would have troubled the very lines of your features, broken their regularity, would have harassed your nerves into the fever of habitual irritation, 
you would have lost in health and cheerfulness, in grace and sweetness. Providence has protected and cultured you, not only for your own sake, but I believe for Graham's. His star, too, was fortunate, to develop fully the best of his nature. A companion like you was needed. There you are, ready. You must be united. I knew it the first day I saw you together at La Terrasse. In all that mutually concerns you and Graham, there seems to me promise, plan, harmony. I do not think the sunny youth of either will prove the forerunner of stormy age. I think it is deemed good that you two should live in peace and be happy, not as angels, but as few are happy amongst mortals. Some lives are thus blessed. It is God's will. It is the attesting trace and lingering evidence of Eden. Other lives run from the first another course. Other travellers encounter weather fitful and gusty, wild and variable, breast adverse winds, are belated and overtaken by early closing winter night. Neither can this happen without the sanction of God, and I know that amidst his boundless works is somewhere stored the secret of this last fate's justice. I know that his treasures contain the proof as the promise of its mercy. End of chapter 32Chapter 33 of Villette. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Villette by Charlotte Bronte. Chapter 33. Monsieur Paul keeps his promise. On the 1st of May, we had all, i.e., the twenty boarders and the four teachers, noticed to rise at five o'clock of the morning, to be dressed and ready by six, to put ourselves under the command of Monsieur le Professeur Emmanuel, who was to head our march forth from Villette for it was on this day he proposed to fulfil his promise of taking us to breakfast in the country i indeed as the reader may perhaps remember had not had the honour of an invitation when this excursion was first projected rather the contrary but on my now making allusion to this fact and wishing to know how it was to be my ear received a pull of which i did not venture to challenge the repetition by raising further difficulties je vous conseille de vous faire prier said monsieur emmanuel imperially menacing the other ear one napoleonic compliment however was enough so i made up my mind to be of the party the morning broke calm as summer with the singing of birds in the garden and a light dew mist that promised heat we all said it would be warm and we all felt pleasure in folding away heavy garments and in assuming the attire suiting a sunny season. The clean, fresh print dress and the light straw bonnet, each made and trimmed as the French workwoman alone can make and trim, so as to unite the utterly unpretending with the perfectly becoming, was the rule of costume. Nobody flaunted in faded silk, nobody wore a second-hand best article. At six the bell rang merrily, and we poured down the staircase, through the carré, along the corridor, into the vestibule. There stood our professor, wearing not his savage-looking paletot and severe bonnet grec, but a young-looking belted blouse and cheerful straw hat. He had for us all the kindest good morrow, and most of us for him had a thanksgiving smile. We were marshalled in order, and soon started. The streets were yet quiet, and the boulevards were fresh and peaceful as fields. I believe we were very happy as we walked along. This chief of ours had the secret of giving a certain impetus to happiness when he would, just as, in an opposite mood, he could give a thrill to fear. He did not lead nor follow us, but walked along the line, giving a word to every one talking much to his favourites, and not wholly neglecting even those he disliked. It was rather my wish, for a reason I had, to keep slightly aloof from notice, and being paired with Ginevra Farnshaw, bearing on my arm the dear pressure of that angel's not unsubstantial limb, 
She continued an excellent case, and I can assure the reader it was no trifling business to bear the burden of her loveliness. Many a time in the course of that warm day I wished to goodness there had been less of the charming commodity. However, having her, as I said, I tried to make her useful by interposing her always between myself and Monsieur Paul, shifting my place according as I heard him coming up to the right hand or the left. My private motive for this manoeuvre might be traced to the circumstance of the new print dress I wore, being pink in colour, a fact which under our present convoy made me feel something as I have felt when, clad in a shawl with a red border, necessitated to traverse a meadow where pastured a bull. For a while the shifting system, together with some modifications in the arrangement of a black silk scarf, answered my purpose, but by and by he found out that whether he came to this side or to that, Miss Fanshawe was still his neighbour. The course of acquaintance between Ginevra and him had never run so smooth that his temper did not undergo a certain crisping process whenever he heard her English accent. Nothing in their dispositions fitted. They jarred if they came in contact. He held her empty and affected. She deemed him bearish, meddling, repellent. At last, when he had changed his place for about the sixth time, finding still the same untoward results to the experiment, he thrust his head forward, settled his eyes on mine, and demanded with impatience, Qu'est-ce que c'est? Vous me jouez des tours? The words were hardly out of his mouth, however, ere with his customary quickness he seized the root of this proceeding. In vain I shook out the long fringe and spread forth the broad end of my scarf. Ah, c'est la robe rose, broke from his lips, affecting me very much like the sudden and irate low of some lord of the meadow. It is only cotton, I alleged hurriedly, and cheaper and what is better than any other colour. Et mademoiselle Lucie est coquette comme dit parisienne, he answered. A-t-on jamais vu une anglaise pareille Regardez plutôt son chapeau, et ses gants, et ses brodequins. These articles of dress were just like what my companions wore, certainly not one whit smarter, perhaps rather plainer than most. But Monsieur had now got hold of his text, and I began to chafe under the expected sermon. It went off, however, as mildly as the menace of a storm sometimes passes on a summer day. I got but one flash of sheet lightning, in the shape of a single bantering smile from his eyes, and then he said, Courage! À vrai dire, je ne suis pas fâché. Peut-être même suis-je content qu'on s'est fait si belle pour ma petite fête. Mais ma robe n'est pas belle, monsieur. Elle n'est que propre. J'aime la propreté, said he. In short, he was not to be dissatisfied. The sun of good humour was to triumph on this auspicious morning. It consumed scudding clouds ere they sullied its disk. And now we were in the country, amongst what they called Le Bois et le Petit Sentier. These woods and lanes a month later would offer but a dusty and doubtful seclusion. Now, however, in their May greenness and morning repose, they looked very pleasant. We reached a certain well, planted round in the taste of Le Bassacur, with an orderly circle of lime trees. Here a halt was called. On the green swell of ground surrounding this well we were ordered to be seated, Monsieur taking his place in our midst, and suffering us to gather in a knot round him. Those who liked him more than they feared came close, and these were chiefly little ones. Those who feared more than they liked kept somewhat aloof. Those in whom much affection had given, even to what remained of fear, a pleasurable zest, observed the greatest distance. He began to tell us a story. Well could he narrate. In such a diction as children love and learned men emulate, a diction simple in its strength and strong in its simplicity. There were beautiful touches in that little tale, sweet glimpses of feeling and hues of description that, while I listened, sunk into my mind and since have never faded. He tinted a twilight scene. I hold it in memory still. Such a picture I have never looked on from artist's pencil. 
I have said that, for myself, I had no impromptu faculty, and perhaps that very deficiency made me marvel the more at one who possessed it in perfection. Monsieur Emmanuel was not a man to write books, but I have heard him lavish with careless, unconscious prodigality such mental wealth as books seldom boast. His mind was indeed my library, and whenever it was opened to me I entered bliss. Intellectually imperfect as I was, I could read little. There were few bound and printed volumes that did not weary me, whose perusal did not fag and blind. But his tomes of thought were collyrium to the spirit's eyes. Over their contents, inward sight grew clear and strong. I used to think what a delight it would be for one who loved him better than he loved himself, to gather and store up those handfuls of gold dust, so recklessly flung to heaven's reckless winds. His story done, he approached the little knoll where I and Ginevra sat apart. In his usual mode of demanding an opinion, he had not reticence to wait till it was voluntarily offered, he asked, Were you interested? According to my wonted, undemonstrative fashion, I simply answered, Yes. Was it good? Very good. Yet I could not write that down, said he. Why not, monsieur? I hate the mechanical labour. I hate to stoop and sit still. I could dictate it, though, with pleasure to an amanuensis who suited me. Would Mademoiselle Lucy write for me if I asked her? Monsieur would be too quick. He would urge me and be angry if my pen did not keep pace with his lips. Try some day. Let us see the monster I can make of myself under the circumstances. But just now, there is no question of dictation. I mean to make you useful in another office. Do you see yonder farmhouse? Surrounded with trees. Yes. There we are to breakfast, and while the good fermier makes the café au lait in a cauldron, you and five others whom I have select will spread with butter half a hundred rows. Having formed his troop into line once more, he marched us straight on the farm, which, on seeing our force, surrendered without capitulation. Clean knives and plates, and fresh butter being provided, half a dozen of us, chosen by our professor, set to work under his directions to prepare for breakfast a huge basket of rolls, with which the baker had been ordered to provision the farm in anticipation of our coming. Coffee and chocolate were already made hot, cream and new-laid eggs were added to the treat, and Monsieur Emmanuel, always generous, would have given a large order for jambon and confiture in addition but that some of us, who presumed, perhaps, upon our influence, insisted that it would be a most reckless waste of victual. He railed at us for our pains, terming us, Des ménagères avares. But we let him talk, and managed the economy of the repast our own way. With what a pleasant countenance he stood on the farm kitchen hearth looking on! He was a man whom it made happy to see others happy, he liked to have movement, animation, abundance, and enjoyment round him. We asked where he would sit. He told us we knew well he was our slave, and we his tyrants, and that he dared not so much as choose a chair without our leave. So we set him the farmer's great chair at the head of the long table, and put him into it. Well might we like him with all his passions and hurricanes, when he could be so benignant and docile at times, as he was just now. Indeed, at the worst, it was only his nerves that were irritable, not his temper that was radically bad. Soothe, comprehend, comfort him, and he was a lamb, he would not harm a fly. Only to the very stupid, perverse, or unsympathizing was he in the slightest degree dangerous. Mindful always of his religion, he made the youngest of the party say a little prayer before we began breakfast, crossing himself as devotedly as a woman. I had never seen him pray before, or make that pious sign. He did it so simply, with such childlike faith, I could not help smiling pleasurably as I watched. His eyes met my smile. He just stretched out his kind hand, saying, Donnez-moi la main, 
I see we worship the same God, in the same spirit, though by different rites. Most of Monsieur Emmanuel's brother professors were emancipated free thinkers, infidels, atheists, and many of them men whose lives would not bear scrutiny. He was more like a knight of old, religious in his way, and of spotless fame. Innocent childhood, beautiful youth were safe at his side. He had vivid passions, keen feelings, but his pure honour and his artless piety were the strong charm that kept the lions kusha. That breakfast was a merry meal, and the merriment was not mere vacant clatter. Monsieur Paul originated, led, controlled, and heightened it. His social, lively temper played unfettered and unclouded. Surrounded only by women and children, there was nothing to cross and thwart him. He had his own way, and a pleasant way it was. The meal over, the party were free to run and play in the meadows. A few stayed to help the farmer's wife to put away her earthenware. Monsieur Paul called me from among these to come out and sit near him under a tree, whence he could view the troop gambling over a wide pasture, and read to him whilst he took his cigar. He sat on a rustic bench, and I at the tree root. While I read, a pocket classic, a cornet, I did not like it, but he did, finding therein beauties I never could be brought to perceive. He listened with a sweetness of calm, the more impressive from the impetuosity of his general nature. The deepest happiness filled his blue eye, and smoothed his broad forehead. I too was happy, happy with the bright day, happier with his presence, happiest with his kindness. He asked by and by, If I would not rather run to my companions than sit there? I said no. I felt content to be where he was. He asked whether, If I were his sister, I should always be content to stay with a brother such as he. I said, I believed I should, and I felt it. Again he inquired whether, If he were to leave Villette and go far away, I should be sorry. And I dropped Cornet, and made no reply. Petite sœur, said he, How long could you remember me, if we were separated? That, monsieur, I can never tell, because I do not know how long it will be before I shall cease to remember everything earthly. If I were to go beyond sea for two, three, five years, should you welcome me on my return? Monsieur, how could I live in the interval? Pourtant, j'ai été pour vous bien dur, bien exigeant. I hid my face with the book, for it was covered with tears. I asked him why he talked so. And he said, He would talk so no more, and cheered me again with the kindest encouragement. Still, the gentleness with which he treated me during the rest of the day went somehow to my heart. It was too tender. It was mournful. I would rather he had been abrupt, whimsical, and irate as was his wont. When hot noon arrived, for the day turned out as we had anticipated, glowing as June, our shepherd collected his sheep from the pasture, and proceeded to lead us all softly home. But we had a whole league to walk. Thus far from Villette was the farm where he had breakfasted. The children, especially, were tired with their play. The spirits of most flagged at the prospect of this midday walk over chaussée, flinty, glaring, and dusty. This state of things had been foreseen and provided for. Just beyond the boundary of the farm we met two spacious vehicles coming to fetch us, such conveyances as are hired out purposely for the accommodation of school parties. Here, with good management, room was found for all, and in another hour Monsieur Paul made safe consignment of his charge at the Rue Fossette. It had been a pleasant day. It would have been perfect, but for the breathing of melancholy which had dimmed its sunshine a moment. That tarnish was renewed the same evening. Just about sunset I saw Monsieur Emmanuel come out of the front door, accompanied by Madame Beck. They paced the centre alley for nearly an hour, talking earnestly, he looking grave yet restless. She, 
wearing an amazed, expostulatory, dissuasive air. I wondered what was under discussion, and when Madame Beck re-entered the house as it darkened, leaving her kinsman Paul yet lingering in the garden, I said to myself, He called me Petite Sir this morning. If he were really my brother, how I should like to go to him just now, and ask what it is that presses on his mind. See how he leans against that tree, with his arms crossed and his brow bent. He wants consolation, I know. Madame does not console, she only remonstrates. What now? Starting from quiescence to action, Monsieur Paul came striding erect and quick down the garden. The carré doors were yet open. I thought he was probably going to water the orange trees in the tubs, after his occasional custom. On reaching the court, however, he took an abrupt turn and made for the berceau and the first-class glass door. There, in that first class, I was. Thence I had been watching him but there I could not find courage to await his approach. He had turned so suddenly, he strode so fast, he looked so strange, the coward within me grew pale, shrank, and, not waiting to listen to reason, and hearing the shrubs crush and the gravel crunch to his advance, she was gone on the wings of panic. Nor did I pause till I had taken sanctuary in the oratory, now empty, Listening there with beating pulses, and an unaccountable, undefined apprehension, I heard him pass through all the schoolrooms, clashing the doors impatiently as he went. I heard him invade the refectory, which the lecture Pius was now holding under hallowed constraint. I heard him pronounce these words, Où est ma belle Lucie? And, just as summoning my courage, I was preparing to go down and do what, after all, I most wished to do in the world, viz. meet him, the wiry voice of Saint-Pierre replied glibly and falsely, Eleolite. And he passed, with the stamp of vexation, into the corridor. There Madame Beck met, captured, chid, convoyed to the street door, and finally dismissed him. As that street door closed, a sudden amazement at my own perverse proceeding struck like a blow upon me. I felt from the first it was me he wanted, me he was seeking. And had not I wanted him, too? What, then, had carried me away? What had wrapped me beyond his reach? He had something to tell. He was going to tell me that something. My ear strained its nerve to hear it, and I had made the confidence impossible, yearning to listen and console, while I thought audience and solace beyond hope's reach. No sooner did opportunity suddenly and fully arrive, than I evaded it, as I would have evaded the levelled shaft of mortality. Well, my insane inconsistency had its reward. Instead of the comfort, the certain satisfaction I might have won, could I but have put choking panic down, and stood firm two minutes, here was dead, blank, dark doubt, and drear suspense. I took my wages to my pillow, and passed the night counting them. End of chapter 33Chapter 34 of Villette. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Villette by Charlotte Bronte. Chapter 34. Malevola. Madame Beck called me on Thursday afternoon and asked whether I had any occupation to hinder me from going into town and executing some little commissions for her at the shops. Being disengaged and placing myself at her service, I was presently furnished with a list of the walls, silks, embroidering thread, etc., wanted in the pupil's work, and having equipped myself in a manner suiting the threatening aspect of a cloudy and sultry day, I was just drawing the spring bolt of the street door in act to issue forth, when Madame's voice again summoned me to the salle à manger. 
pardon miss lucy cried she in the seeming haste of an impromptu thought i have just recollected one more errand for you if your good nature will not deem itself overburdened of course i confounded myself in asseverations to the contrary and madame running into the little salon brought thence a pretty basket filled with fine hothouse fruit rosy perfect and tempting reposing amongst the dark green wax-like leaves and pale yellow stars of i know not what exotic plant there she said it is not heavy and will not shame your neat toilette as if it were a household servant-like detail do me the favour to leave this little basket at the house of madame walravens with my felicitations on her fete she lives down in the old town numero trois rue des mages i fear you will find the walk rather long but you have the whole afternoon before you and do not hurry if you are not back in time for dinner i will order a portion to be saved or gauton with whom you are a favourite will have pleasure in tossing up some trifle for your special benefit you shall not be forgotten my bonne miss and oh please calling me back once more be sure to insist on seeing madame walravens herself and giving the basket into her own hands in order that there may be no mistake for she is rather a punctilious personage adieu au revoir and at last i got away the shop commissions took some time to execute that choosing and matching of silks and wools being always a tedious business but at last i got through my list the patterns for the slippers the bell ropes the cabar were selected the slides and tassels for the purses chosen the whole tree potage in short was off my mind nothing but the fruit and the felicitations remained to be attended to i rather liked the prospect of a long walk deep into the old and grim basse ville and i liked it no worse because the evening sky over the city was settling into a mass of black blue metal heated at the rim and inflaming slowly to a heavy red i fear a high wind because storm demands that exertion of strength and use of action i always yield with pain but the sullen downfall the thick snow descent or dark rush of rain ask only resignation the quiet abandonment of garments and person to be drenched in return it sweeps a great capital clean before you it makes you a quiet path through broad grand streets it petrifies a living city as if by eastern enchantment it transforms a valette into a tadmore let then the rains fall and the floods descend only i must first get rid of this basket of fruit an unknown clock from an unknown tower jean baptiste's voice was now too distant to be audible was tolling the third quarter past five when i reached that street and house whereof madame beck had given me the address it was no street at all it seemed rather to be part of a square it was quiet grass grew between the broad grey flags the houses were large and looked very old behind them rose the appearance of trees indicating gardens at the back antiquity brooded above this region business was banished thence rich men had once possessed this quarter and once grandeur had made her seat here that church whose dark half ruinous turrets overlooked the square was the venerable and formerly opulent shrine of the magi but wealth and greatness had long since stretched their gilded pinions and fled hence leaving these their ancient nests perhaps to house penury for a time or perhaps to stand cold and empty mouldering untenanted in the course of winters as i crossed this deserted place on whose pavement drops almost as large as a five-franc piece were now slowly darkening i saw in its whole expanse no symptom or evidence of life except what was given in the figure of an infirm old priest who went past bending and propped on a staff the type of eld and decay he had issued from the very house to which i was directed and when i paused before the door just closed after him and rang the bell he turned to look at me nor did he soon avert his gaze perhaps he thought me with my basket of summer fruit and my lack of the dignity age confers an incongruous figure in such a scene 
I know, had a young, ruddy-faced bon opened the door to admit me, I should have thought such a one little in harmony with a dwelling. But, when I found myself confronted by a very old woman, wearing a very antique peasant costume, a cap alike hideous and costly, with long flaps of native lace, a petticoat and jacket of cloth, and sabots more like little boats than shoes, it seemed all right, and soothingly in character. The expression of her face was not quite so soothing as the cut of her costume. Anything more cantankerous I have seldom seen. She would scarcely reply to my inquiry after Madame Walravens. I believe she would have snatched the basket of fruit from my hand, had not the old priest hobbling up checked her, and himself lent an ear to the message with which I was charged. His apparent deafness rendered it a little difficult to make him fully understand that I must see Madame Walravens, and consign the fruit into her own hands. At last, however, he comprehended the fact that such were my orders, and that duty enjoined their literal fulfilment. Addressing the aged Bon, not in French, but in the aboriginal tongue of La Bassacur, he persuaded her at last to let me cross the inhospitable threshold, and himself escorting me upstairs, I was ushered into a sort of salon, and there left. The room was large, and had a fine old ceiling, and almost church-like windows of coloured glass, but it was desolate, and in the shadow of a coming storm looked strangely lowering. Within opened a smaller room. There, however, the blind of the single casement was closed. Through the deep gloom few details of furniture were apparent. These few I amused myself by puzzling to make out, and in particular I was attracted by the outline of a picture on the wall. By and by the picture seemed to give way. To my bewilderment it shook, it sunk, it rolled back into nothing. Its vanishing left an opening, arched, leading into an arched passage, with a mystic winding stair. Both passage and stair were of cold stone, uncarpeted and unpainted. Down this donjon stair descended a tap, tap, like a stick. Soon there fell on the steps a shadow, and last of all I was aware of a substance. Yet was it actual substance, this appearance approaching me? this obstruction partially darkening the arch? It drew near, and I saw it well. I began to comprehend where I was. Well might this old square be named Quarter of the Magi. Well might the three towers overlooking it own for godfathers three mystic sages of a dead and dark art. Hoar enchantment here prevailed. A spell had opened for me Elfland. That cell-like room, that vanishing picture, that arch and passage and stair of stone were all parts of a fairy tale. Distincter even than these scenic details stood the chief figure, Cunegonde, the sorceress, Malevola, the evil fairy. How was she? She might be three feet high, but she had no shape. Her skinny hands rested upon each other and pressed the gold knob of a wand-like ivory staff. Her face was large, set not upon her shoulders, but before her breast. She seemed to have no neck. I should have said there were a hundred years in her features, and more, perhaps, in her eyes. Her malign, unfriendly eyes, with thick grey brows above, and livid lids all round. How severely they viewed me, with a sort of dull displeasure! This being wore a gown of brocade, dyed bright blue, full-tinted as the gentianella flower, and covered with satin foliage in a large pattern. Over the gown a costly shawl, gorgeously bordered, and so large for her that its many-coloured fringe swept the floor. But her chief points were her jewels. She had long, clear earrings, blazing with a luster which could not be borrowed or false. She had rings on her skeleton hands, with thick gold hoops and stones, purple, green, and blood-red. Hunchbacked, dwarfish, and doting, she was adorned like a barbarian queen. "'Comme voulez-vous?' said she, hoarsely, with the voice rather of male than of female old age, and indeed a silver beard bristled her chin. I delivered my basket and my message. "'Is that all?' she demanded. "'It is all.' 
said I. Truly, it was well worth while, she answered. Return to Madame Beck, and tell her I can buy fruit when I want it. Et quant à ses félicitations, je m'en moque. And this courteous dame turned her back. Just as she turned, a peal of thunder broke, and a flash of lightning blazed broad over salon and boudoir. The tale of magic seemed to proceed with due accompaniment of the elements. The wanderer, decoyed into the enchanted castle, heard rising outside the spell-wakened tempest. What in all this was I to think of Madame Beck? She owned strange acquaintance. She offered messages and gifts at an unique shrine, and inauspicious seemed the bearing of the uncouth thing she worshipped. There went that sullen Sidonia, tottering and trembling like palsy incarnate, tapping her ivory staff on the mosaic parquet, and muttering venomously as she vanished. Down washed the rain, deep lowered the welkin. The clouds, ruddy a while ago, had now, through all their blackness, turned deadly pale, as if in terror. Notwithstanding my late boast about not fearing a shower, I hardly liked to go out under this water-spout. Then the gleams of lightning were very fierce, the thunder crashed very near. This storm had gathered immediately above Villette. It seemed to have burst at the zenith. It rushed down prone. The forked, slant bolts pierced athwart vertical torrents. Red zigzags interlaced a descent blanched as white metal, and all broke from a sky heavily black in its swollen abundance. Leaving Madame Walravens in hospitable salon, I betook myself to her cold staircase. There was a seat on the landing. There I waited. Somebody came gliding along the gallery just above. It was the old priest. Indeed, uh, mademoiselle shall not sit there, said he. It would uh, displease you, our benefactor, if he knew a stranger were so treated in this house. And he begged me so earnestly to return to the salon, that without discourtesy I could not but comply. The smaller room was better furnished, and more habitable than the larger. Thither he introduced me. Partially withdrawing the blind, he disclosed what seemed more like an oratory than a boudoir, a very solemn little chamber, looking as if it were a place rather dedicated to relics and remembrance than designed for present use and comfort. The good father sat down, as if to keep me company, but instead of conversing he took out a book, fastened on the page his eyes, and employed his lips in whispering what sounded like a prayer or litany. A yellow electric light from the sky gilded his bald head. His figure remained in shade, deep in purple. He sat still as sculpture. He seemed to forget me for his prayers. He only looked up when a fiercer bolt or a harsher, closer rattle told of nearing danger. Even then it was not in fear, but in seeming awe he raised his eyes. I too was awestruck. Being, however, under no pressure of slavish terror, my thoughts and observations were free. To speak truth, I was beginning to fancy that the old priest resembled that Père Silas, before whom I had kneeled in the church of the Beccanage. The idea was vague, for I had seen my confessor only in dusk and in profile, yet still I seemed to trace a likeness. I thought also I recognized the voice. While I watched him, he betrayed by one lifted look that he felt my scrutiny. I turned to note the room. That, too, had its half-mystic interest. Beside a cross of curiously carved old ivory, yellow with thyme, and sloped above a dark red pre dieu furnished duly with rich missal and ebon rosary, hung the picture whose dim outline had drawn my eyes before, the picture which moved, fell away with the wall, and let in phantoms. Imperfectly seen I had taken it for a Madonna. Revealed by clearer light, it proved to be a woman's portrait in a nun's dress. The face, though not beautiful, was pleasing, pale, young, and shaded with the dejection of grief or ill-health. I say again, it was not beautiful, it was not even intellectual. Its very amiability was the amiability of a weak frame, inactive passions, acquiescent habits. Yet I looked long at that picture, and could not choose but look. The old priest, who at first had seemed to me so deaf and infirm, 
must yet have retained his faculties in tolerable preservation absorbed in his book as he appeared without once lifting his head or as far as i knew turning his eyes he perceived the point towards which my attention was drawn and in a slow distinct voice dropped concerning it these four observations she was much beloved she gave herself to god she died young she is still remembered still wept by that aged lady madame walravens i inquired fancying that i had discovered in the incurable grief of bereavement a key to that same aged lady's desperate ill-humour the father shook his head with half a smile no no said he a grande dame's affection for her children's children may be great and her sorrow for their loss lively but it is only the affianced lover to whom fate faith and death have trebly denied the bliss of union who mourns what he has lost as justine marie is still mourned i thought the father rather wished to be questioned and therefore i inquired who had lost and who still mourned justine marie i got in reply quite a little romantic narrative told not unimpressively with the accompaniment of the now subsiding storm i am bound to say it might have been made much more truly impressive if there had been less french rousseau-like sentimentalizing and wire-drawing and rather more healthful carelessness of effect but the worthy father was obviously a frenchman born and bred i became more and more persuaded of his resemblance to my confessor he was a true son of rome when he did lift his eyes he looked at me out of their corners with more and sharper subtlety than one would have thought could survive the wear and tear of seventy years yet i believe he was a good old man the hero of his tale was some former pupil of his whom he now called his benefactor and who it appears had loved this pale justine marie the daughter of rich parents at a time when his own worldly prospects were such as to justify his aspiring to a well-dowered hand the pupil's father once a rich banker had failed died and left behind him only debts and destitution the son was then forbidden to think of marie especially that old witch of a grand dame i had seen madame walravens opposed the match with all the violence of a temper which deformity made sometimes demoniac the mild marie had neither the treachery to be false nor the force to be quite staunch to her lover she gave up her first suitor but refusing to accept a second with a heavier purse withdrew to a convent and there died in her novitiate lasting anguish it seems had taken possession of the faithful heart which worshipped her and the truth of that love and grief had been shown in a manner which touched even me as i listened some years after justine marie's death ruin had come on her house too her father by nominal calling a jeweller but who also dealt a good deal on the bourse had been concerned in some financial transactions which entailed exposure and ruinous fines he died of grief for the loss and shame for the infamy his old hunchbacked mother and his bereaved wife were left penniless and might have died too of want but their lost daughter's once despised yet most true-hearted suitor hearing of the condition of these ladies came with singular devotedness to the rescue he took on their insolent pride the revenge of the purest charity housing caring for befriending them so as no son could have done it more tenderly and efficiently the mother on the whole a good woman died blessing him the strange godless loveless misanthrope grandmother lived still entirely supported by the self-sacrificing man her who had been the bane of his life blighting his hope and awarding him for love and domestic happiness long mourning and cheerless solitude he treated with the respect a good son might offer a kind mother he had brought her to this house and continued the priest while genuine tears rose to his eyes here too he shelters me his old tutor and agnes a superannuated servant of his father's family to our sustenance 
and to other charities I know he devotes three parts of his income, keeping only the fourth to provide himself with bread and the most modest accommodation. By this arrangement he has rendered it impossible to himself ever to marry. He has given himself to God and to his angel bride as much as if he were a priest like me. The father had wiped away his tears before he uttered these last words, and in pronouncing them he for one instant raised his eyes to mine. I caught this glance, despite its veiled character. The momentary gleam shot a meaning which struck me. These Romanists are strange beings, such a one among them, whom you know no more than the last Inca of Peru or the first Emperor of China, knows you and all your concerns, and has his reasons for saying to you so and so, when you simply thought the communication sprang impromptu from the instant's impulse. His plan in bringing it about that you shall come on such a day to such a place under such and such circumstances, when the whole arrangement seems to your crude apprehension the ordinance of chance, or the sequel of exigency. Madame Beck's suddenly recollected message and present, my artless embassy to the Place of the Magi, the old priest accidentally descending the steps and crossing the square, his interposition on my behalf with the bonne who would have sent me away, his reappearance on the staircase, my introduction to this room, the portrait, the narrative so affably volunteered. All these little incidents, taken as they fell out, seemed each independent of its successor. A handful of loose beads, but threaded through by that quick shot and crafty glance of a Jesuit eye, they dropped pendant in a long string, like that rosary on the prie dieu. Where lay the link of junction? Where the little clasp of this monastic necklace? I saw or felt union, but could not yet find the spot, or detect the means of connection. Perhaps the musing fit into which I had by this time fallen appeared somewhat suspicious in its abstraction. He gently interrupted. Mademoiselle, said he, I trust you have not far to go through these inundated streets. More than half a league. You live... Uh, in the Rue Fossette. No. With animation. Not at the pensionnat of Madame Beck. The same. Donc. Clapping his hands. Donc, uh, vous devez connaître mon noble élève, mon Paul. Monsieur Paul Emmanuel, professor of literature. He and none other. A brief silence fell. The spring of junction seemed suddenly to have become palpable. I felt it yield to pressure. Was it of Monsieur Paul you have been speaking? I presently inquired. Was he your pupil and the benefactor of Madame Walravens? Yes, and of Agnès, the old servant, and moreover, with a certain emphasis, he was and is the lover, true, constant, and eternal, of that saint in heaven, Justine Marie. And who, father? are you i continued and though i accentuated the question its utterance was well-nigh superfluous i was ere this quite prepared for the answer which actually came i daughter am per silas that unworthy son of holy church whom you once honour with a noble and touching confidence showing me the core of a heart and the inner shrine of a mind whereof in solemn tooth I coveted the direction, in behalf of the only true faith. Nor have I for a day lost sight of you, nor for an hour failed to take in you a rooted interest. Passed under the discipline of Rome, moulded by her high training, inoculated with her salutary doctrine, inspired by the zeal she alone gives, I realize what then might be your spiritual rank, your practical value, and I envy heresy her prey. This struck me as a special state of things. I half realized myself in that condition also. Passed under discipline, moulded, trained, inoculated, and so on. Not so, thought I. But I restrained deprecation, and sat quietly enough. 
"'I suppose Monsieur Paul does not live here,' I resumed, pursuing a theme which I thought more to the purpose than any wild renegade dreams. "'No, he only comes occasionally to worship his beloved saint, to make his confession to me, and to pay his respects to her he calls his mother. His own lodging consists but of two homes. He has no servant, and yet he will not suffer Madame Warhavens to dispose of those splendid jewels with which you see her adorned, and in which she takes a pareil pride as the ornament of her youth and the last relics of her son, the jewellers of wealth. How often, murmured I to myself, has this man, this Monsieur Emmanuel, seemed to me to lack magnanimity in trifles, yet how great he is in great things! I own I did not reckon amongst the proofs of his greatness, either the act of confession or the saint-worship. How long is it since that lady died? I inquired, looking at Justine Marie. Twenty years. She was somewhat older than Monsieur Emmanuel. He was then very young, for he is not much beyond the forty. Does he yet weep her? His heart will weep her always. The essence of Emmanuel's nature is constancy. This was said with marked emphasis. And now the sun broke out pallid and waterish. The rain yet fell, but there was no more tempest. That hot firmament had cloven and poured out its lightnings. A longer delay would scarce leave daylight for my return, so I rose, thanked the father for his hospitality and his tale, was benignantly answered by a boxer wobiscoma, which I made kindly welcome, because it seemed uttered with a true benevolence, but I liked less the mystic phrase accompanying it. Daughter, you shall be what you shall be. An oracle that made me shrug my shoulders as soon as I had got outside the door. Few of us know what we are to come to, certainly. But for all that had happened yet, I had good hopes of living and dying a sober-minded Protestant. There was a hollowness within and a flourish around Holy Church which tempted me but moderately. I went on my way, pondering many things. Whatever Romanism may be, there are good Romanists. This man, Emmanuel, seemed of the best, touched with superstition, influenced by priestcraft, yet wondrous for fond faith, for pious devotion, for sacrifice of self, for charity unbounded. It remained to see how Rome, by her agents, handled such qualities, whether she cherished them for their own sake and for God's, or put them out to usury and made booty of the interest. By the time I reached home it was sundown. Gautin had kindly saved me a portion of dinner, which indeed I needed. She called me into the little cabinet to partake of it, and there Madame Beck soon made her appearance, bringing me a glass of wine. Oh, well, began she, chuckling. And what sort of a reception did Madame Walravens give you? Elle est drôle, n'est-ce pas? I told her what had passed, delivering verbatim the courteous message with which I had been charged. Oh, la singulière petite bossu! laughed she. Et figurez-vous qu'elle me déteste, parce qu'elle me croit amoureuse de mon cousin Paul. Ce petit devoir que n'ose pas bouger, à moi que son confesseur ne lui donne la permission. Au reste, she went on, if he wanted to marry ever so much, soit moi, soit un autre, he could not do it. He has too large a family already on his hands. Mère Walravens, Persila, Dame Agnès, and a whole troop of nameless paupers. There never was a man like him for laying on himself burdens greater than he can bear, voluntarily incurring needless responsibilities. Besides, he harbours a romantic idea about some pale-faced Marie Justine, a personnage assez niais à ce que je pense. Such was Madame's irreverent remark who has been an angel in heaven or elsewhere this score of years, and to whom he means to go, free from all earthly ties, poor comme un lit, à ce qu'il dit. Oh, you would laugh, could you but know half Monsieur Emmanuel's crotchets and eccentricities. But I hinder you from taking refreshment, ma bonne miss, which you must need, 
eat your supper, drink your wine, oubliez les anges, les bossus, et surtout les professeurs, et bonsoir. End of chapter 34《Chapter 35 of Villette》This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Villette by Charlotte Bronte. Chapter 35 Fraternity. Oubliez les professeurs. So said Madame Beck. Madame Beck was a wise woman, but she should not have uttered those words. To do so was a mistake. That night she should have left me calm, not excited, indifferent, not interested isolated in my own estimation and that of others, not connected even in idea with this second person whom I was to forget. Forget him? Ah, they took a sage plan to make me forget him, the wise heads. They showed me how good he was. They made of my dear little man a stainless little hero. And then they had prated about his manner of loving, what means had I before this day of being certain whether he could love at all or not? I had known him jealous, suspicious. I had seen about him certain tendernesses, fitfulnesses, a softness which came like a warm air, and a ruth which passed like early dew, dried in the heat of his irritabilities. This was all I had seen. And they, Per Silas and Modesta Maria Beck, that these two wrought in concert I could not doubt, opened up the additum of his heart, showed me one grand love, the child of this southern nature's youth, born so strong and perfect that it had laughed at death himself, despised his mean rape of matter, clung to immortal spirit, and, in victory and faith, had watched beside a tomb twenty years. This had been done, not idly, this was not a mere hollow indulgence of sentiment. He had proven his fidelity by the consecration of his best energies to an unselfish purpose, and attested it by limitless personal sacrifices. For those once dear to her he prized, he had laid down vengeance and taken up a cross. Now, as for Justine Marie, I knew what she was as well as if I had seen her. I knew she was well enough. There were girls like her in Madame Beck's school, phlegmatics, pale, slow, inert, but kind-natured, neutral of evil, undistinguished for good. If she wore angel's wings, I knew whose poet fancy conferred them. If her forehead shone luminous with the reflex of a halo, I knew in the fire of whose irids that circle of holy flame had generation. Was I, then, to be frightened by Justine Marie? Was the picture of a pale dead nun to rise, an eternal barrier? And what of the charities which absorbed his worldly goods? What of his heart sworn to virginity? Madame Beck, Père Silas, you should not have suggested these questions. They were at once the deepest puzzle, the strongest obstruction, and the keenest stimulus I had ever felt. For a week of nights and days I fell asleep. I dreamt, and I woke upon these two questions. In the whole world there was no answer to them, except where one dark little man stood, sat, walked, lectured, under the headpiece of a bandit bonnet grec, and within the girth of a sorry paletot, much beinked, and no little adust. After that visit to the Rue des Marges, I did want to see him again. I felt as if, knowing what I now knew, his countenance would offer a page more lucid, more interesting than ever. I felt a longing to trace in it the imprint of that primitive devotedness, the signs of that half-knightly, half-saintly chivalry which the priest's narrative imputed to his nature. He had become my Christian hero. Under that character I wanted to view him. Nor was opportunity slow to favour. My new impressions underwent her test the next day, Yes, I was granted an interview with my Christian hero, an interview not very heroic or sentimental or biblical, but lively enough in its way. About three o'clock of the afternoon, the peace of the first class, safely established, as it seemed, under the serene sway of Madame Beck, who, in propria persona, 
was giving one of her orderly and useful lessons. This piece, I say, suffered a sudden fracture by the wild inburst of a paletot. Nobody at the moment was quieter than myself. Eased of responsibility by Madame Beck's presence, soothed by her uniform tones, pleased and edified with her clear exposition of the subject in hand, for she taught well, I sat bent over my desk, drawing, that is, copying an elaborate line engraving, tediously working up my copy to the finish of the original, for that was my practical notion of art, and, strange to say, I took extreme pleasure in the labour, and could even produce curiously finical Chinese facsimiles of steel or mezzotint plates, things about as valuable as so many achievements in worsted work, but I thought pretty well of them in those days. What was the matter? My drawing, my pencils, my precious copy, gathered into one crushed-up handful, perished from before my sight. I myself appeared to be shaken or emptied out of my chair, as a solitary and withered nutmeg might be emptied out of a spice-box by an excited cook. That chair and my desk, seized by the wild paletot, one under each sleeve, were borne afar. In a second I followed the furniture. In two minutes they and I were fixed in the centre of the grand salle, a vast adjoining room, seldom used save for dancing and choral singing lessons, fixed with an emphasis which seemed to prohibit the remotest hope of our ever being permitted to stir thence again. Having partially collected my scared wits, I found myself in the presence of two men. Gentlemen, I suppose I should say. One dark, the other light one having a stiff, half-military air, and wearing a braided surtout, the other partaking in garb and bearing more of the careless aspect of the student or artist class, both flourishing in full magnificence of moustaches, whiskers, and imperial. Monsieur Emmanuel stood a little apart from these. His countenance and eyes expressed strong colour. He held forth his hand with his tribune gesture. Mademoiselle! said he your business is to prove to these gentlemen that i am no liar you will answer to the best of your ability such questions as they shall put you will also write on such theme as they shall select in their eyes it appears i hold the position of an unprincipled impostor i write essays and with deliberate forgery sign them my pupils' names, and boast of them as their work. You will disprove this charge. Grand ciel! Here was the show trial, so long evaded, come on me like a thunderclap. These two fine, braided, mustachioed, sneering personages were none other than dandy professors of the college, Messieurs Brossec and Rochemort, a pair of cold-blooded fops and pedants sceptics and scoffers it seems that monsieur paul had been rashly exhibiting something i had written something he had never once praised or even mentioned in my hearing and which i deemed forgotten the essay was not remarkable at all it only seemed remarkable compared with the average production of foreign schoolgirls in an english establishment it would have passed scarce noticed Messieurs Boissac and Rochemont had thought proper to question its genuineness and insinuate a cheat. I was now to bear my testimony to the truth and to be put to the torture of their examination. A memorable scene ensued. They began with classics, a dead blank. They went on to French history. I hardly knew Merivar from Ferremond. They tried me in various ologies, and still only got a shake of the head and an unchanging je n'en sais rien after an expressive pause they proceeded to matters of general information broaching one or two subjects which i knew pretty well and on which i had often reflected monsieur emmanuel who had hitherto stood looking on dark as the winter solstice brightened up somewhat he thought i should now show myself at least no fool he learned his error Though answers to the questions surged up fast, my mind filling like a rising well, ideas were there, but not words. I either could not or would not speak. I am not sure which. 
Partly I think my nerves had got wrong, and partly my humour was crossed. I heard one of my examiners, he of the braided surtout, whisper to his co-professor, Est-il donc idiot? Yes, I thought. An idiot she is, and always will be, for such as you. But I suffered, suffered cruelly. I saw the damps gather on Monsieur Paul's brow, and his eye spoke a passionate yet sad reproach. He would not believe in my total lack of popular cleverness. He thought I could be prompt, if I would. At last, to relieve him, the professors, and myself, I stammered out, "'Gentlemen, you had better let me go. You will get no good of me. As you say, I am an idiot.' I wish I could have spoken with calm and dignity, or I wish my sense had sufficed to make me hold my tongue. That traitor tongue tripped, faltered. Beholding the judges cast on Monsieur Emmanuel a hard look of triumph, and hearing the distressed tremor of my own voice, out I burst in a fit of choking tears. The emotion was far more of anger than grief. Had I been a man and strong, I could have challenged that pair on the spot. But it was emotion, and I would rather have been scourged than betray it. The incapables! Could they not see at once the crude hand of a novice in that composition they called a forgery? The subject was classical. When Monsieur Paul dictated the trait on which the essay was to turn, I heard it for the first time. The matter was new to me, and I had no material for its treatment. But I got books, read up the facts, laboriously constructed a skeleton out of the dry bones of the real, and then clothed them, and tried to breathe into them life and in this last aim I had pleasure. With me it was a difficult and anxious time till my facts were found, selected, and properly jointed. Nor could I rest from research and effort till I was satisfied of correct anatomy. The strength of my inward repugnance to the idea of flaw or falsity sometimes enabled me to shun egregious blunders, but the knowledge was not there in my head, ready and mellow. It had not been sown in spring, grown in summer, harvested in autumn, and garnered through winter. Whatever I wanted I must go out and gather fresh, glean of wild herbs my lapful, and shred them green into the pot. Messieurs Boissac and Rochemont did not perceive this. They mistook my work for the work of a ripe scholar. They would not yet let me go. I must sit down and write before them. As I dipped my pen in the ink with a shaking hand, and surveyed the white paper with eyes half-blinded and overflowing, one of my judges began mincingly to apologize for the pain he caused. Nous agissons dans l'intérêt de la vérité. Nous ne voulons pas vous blesser, said he. Scorn gave me nerve. I only answered, Dictate, monsieur. Rochemort named this theme. Human justice. Human justice. What was I to make of it? Blank, cold abstraction, unsuggestive to me of one inspiring idea. And there stood Monsieur Emmanuel, sad as Saul and stern as Joab, and there triumphed his accusers. At these two I looked. I was gathering my courage to tell them that I would neither write nor speak another word for their satisfaction, that their theme did not suit nor their presence inspire me and that, notwithstanding, whoever threw the shadow of a doubt on Monsieur Emmanuel's honour, outraged that truth of which they had announced themselves the champions. I meant to utter all this, I say, when suddenly a light darted on memory. Those two faces looking out of the forest of long hair, moustache, and whisker, those two cold yet bold, trustless yet presumptuous visages, were the same faces, the very same that, projected in full gaslight from behind the pillars of a portico, had half frightened me to death on the night of my desolate arrival in Villette. These, I felt morally certain, were the very heroes who had driven a friendless foreigner beyond her reckoning and her strength, chased her breathless over a whole quarter of the town. Pious mentors, thought I, pure guides for youth. If human justice were what she ought to be, you two would scarce hold your present post or enjoy your present credit. An idea once seized, I fell to work. Human justice rushed before me in novel guise, a red, random beldame with arms akimbo, 
I saw her in her house, the den of confusion. Servants called to her for orders or help which she did not give. Beggars stood at her door, waiting and starving unnoticed. A swarm of children, sick and quarrelsome, crawled round her feet and yelled in her ears appeals for notice, sympathy, cure, redress. The honest woman cared for none of these things. She had a warm seat of her own by the fire. She had her own solace in a short black pipe and a bottle of Mrs. Sweeney's soothing syrup. She smoked and she sipped and she enjoyed her paradise. And whenever a cry of the suffering souls about her pierced her ears too keenly, my jolly dame seized the poker of the hearth-brush. If the offender was weak, wronged, and sickly, she effectually settled him. If he was strong, lively, and violent, she only menaced, then plunged her hand in her deep pouch and flung a liberal shower of sugar-plums. Such was the sketch of human justice, scrawled hurriedly on paper and placed at the service of Messieurs Boissac and Rochemort. Monsieur Emmanuel read it over my shoulder. Waiting no comment, I curtsied to the trio, and withdrew. After school that day, Monsieur Paul and I again met. Of course, the meeting did not at first run smooth. There was a crow to pluck with him. That forced examination could not be immediately digested. A crabbed dialogue terminated in my being called une petite moqueuse et sans coeur, and in Monsieur's temporary departure. Not wishing him to go quite away, only desiring he should feel that such a transport as he had that day given way to could not be indulged with perfect impunity. I was not sorry to see him soon after, gardening in the berceau. He approached the glass door. I drew near also. We spoke of some flowers growing round it. By and by Monsieur laid down his spade. By and by he recommenced conversation, passed to other subjects, and at last touched a point of interest. Conscious that his proceeding of that day was specially open to a charge of extravagance, Monsieur Paul half apologized. He half regretted, too, the fitfulness of his moods at all times, yet he hinted that some allowance ought to be made for him. But, said he, I can hardly expect it at your hands, Miss Lucy. You know neither me, nor my position, nor my history. His history. I took up the word at once. I pursued the idea. No, monsieur, I rejoined. Of course, as you say, I know neither your history, nor your position, nor your sacrifices, nor any of your sorrows, or trials, or affections, or fidelities. Oh, no, I know nothing about you. You are, for me, altogether a stranger, huh? he murmured, arching his brows in surprise. You know, monsieur, I only see you in class, stern, dogmatic, hasty, imperious. I only hear of you in town as active and willful, quick to originate, hasty to lead, but slow to persuade and hard to bend. A man like you, without ties, can have no attachments, without dependence, no duties. All we with whom you come into contact are machines which you thrust here and there, inconsiderate of their feelings. You seek their recreations in public by the light of the evening chandelier. This school and yonder college are your workshops, where you fabricate the ware called pupils. I don't so much as know where you live. It is natural to take it for granted that you have no home, and need none. I am judged, said he. Your opinion of me is just what I thought it was. For you I am neither a man nor a Christian. You see me void of affection and religion, unattached by friend or family, unpiloted by principle or faith. It is well, mademoiselle, such is our reward in this life. You are a philosopher, monsieur, a cynic philosopher. And I looked at his paletot, of which he straightway brushed the dim sleeve with his hand, despising the foibles of humanity, above its luxuries, independent of its comforts. Et vous, mademoiselle, vous êtes proprette et douillette et affreusement insensible par-dessus le marché. But in short, monsieur, now I think of it, you must live somewhere. Do tell me where, and what establishment of servants do you keep? With a fearful projection of the under lip, implying an impetus of scorn, the most decided, he broke out. Je vis dans un trou. 
I inhabit a den, miss, a cavern, where you would not put your dainty nose. Once, with base shame of speaking the whole truth, I talked about my study in that college. Know now that this study is my whole abode. My chamber is there and my drawing room. As for my establishment of servants, mimicking my voice, they number ten, les voilà. And he grimly spread close under my eyes his ten fingers. I black my boots, pursued he savagely. I brush my palto. No, monsieur, it is too plain. You never do that, was my parenthesis. Je fais mon lit et mon ménage. I seek my dinner in a restaurant. My supper takes care of itself. I pass days laborious and loveless, nights long and lonely. I am ferocious and bearded and monkish, and nothing no living in this world loves me except some old hearts, worn like my own, and some few beings impoverished, suffering, poor in purse and in spirit, whom the kingdoms of this world owe not, but to whom a will and testament not to be disputed has bequeathed the kingdom of heaven. Ah, monsieur, but I know. What do you know? Many things, I verily believe, yet not me. I know that you have a pleasant old house in a pleasant old square of the Basse Ville. Why don't you go and live there? Huh. muttered he again. I liked it much, monsieur, with the steps ascending to the door, the grey flags in front, the nodding trees behind, real trees, not shrubs, trees dark, high, and of old growth. And the boudoir oratoire. You should make that room your study. It is so quiet and solemn. He eyed me closely. He half smiled, half coloured. What did you pick up all that? Who told you? He asked. Nobody told me. Did I dream it, monsieur, do you think? Can I enter into your visions? Can I guess a woman's waking thoughts, much less her sleeping fantasies? If I dreamt it, I saw in my dream human beings as well as a house. I saw a priest, old, bent, and grey, and a domestic, old too, and picturesque, and a lady, splendid but strange. Her head would scarce reach to my elbow. Her magnificence might ransom a duke. She wore a gown bright as lapis lazuli, a shawl worth a thousand francs. She was decked with ornaments so brilliant I never saw any with such a beautiful sparkle. But her figure looked as if it had been broken in two and bent double. She seemed also to have outlived the common years of humanity, and to have attained those which are only labour and sorrow. She was become morose, almost malevolent. Yet somebody, it appears, cared for her in her infirmities. Somebody forgave her trespasses, hoping to have his trespasses forgiven. They lived together, these three people, the mistress, the chaplain, the servant, all old, all feeble, all sheltered under one kind wing. He covered with his hand the upper part of his face, but did not conceal his mouth, where I saw hovering an expression I liked. I see you have entered into my secrets, said he. But how was it done? So I told him how the commission on which I had been sent, the storm which had detained me, the abruptness of the lady, the kindness of the priest. As I sat waiting for the rain to cease, Pere Silas whiled away the time with a story. I said, A story? What story? Pere Silas is no romancist. Shall I tell Monsieur the tale? Yes. Begin at the beginning. Let me hear some Miss Lucy's French. Her best, of her worst, I don't much care which. Let us have a good poignet of barbarisms, and a bounteous dose of the insular accent. Monsieur is not going to be gratified by a tale of ambitious proportions, and the spectacle of the narrator sticking fast in the midst. But I will tell him the title. The Priest's Pupil. Bah! said he, 
the swarthy flush again dyeing his dark cheek. The good old father could not have chosen a worse subject. It is his weak point. But what of the priest's pupil? Oh, many things. You may as well define what things. I mean to know. There was the pupil's youth, the pupil's manhood, his avarice, his ingratitude, his implacability, his inconstancy. Such a bad pupil, monsieur, so thankless, cold-hearted, unchivalrous, unforgiving. Et puis? said he, taking a cigar. Et puis? I pursued. He underwent calamities which one did not pity, bore them in a spirit one did not admire, endured wrongs for which one felt no sympathy, finally took the unchristian revenge of heaping coals of fire on his adversary's head. You have not told me all said he. Nearly all, I think. I have indicated the heads of Père Silas's chapters. You have forgotten one that which touched on the pupil's lack of affection, on his hard, cold, monkish heart. True, I remember now. Père Silas did say that his vocation was almost that of a priest, that his life was considered consecrated. By what bonds or duties? by the ties of the past and the charities of the present. You have, then, the whole situation. I have now told, monsieur, all that was told me. Some meditative minutes passed. Now, Mademoiselle Lucy, look at me, and with that truth which I believe you never knowingly violate, answer me one question. Raise your eyes, rest them on mine, have no hesitation, fear not to trust me. I am a man to be trusted. I raised my eyes. Knowing me thoroughly now, all my antecedents, all my responsibilities, having long known my foes, can you and I still be friends? If monsieur wants a friend in me, I shall be glad to have a friend in him. But a close friend, I mean, intimate and real, kindred in all but blood. Will Miss Lucy be the sister of a very poor, fettered, burdened, encumbered man? I could not answer him in words, yet I suppose I did answer him. He took my hand, which found comfort, in the shelter of his. His friendship was not a doubtful, wavering benefit, a cold, distant hope, a sentiment so brittle as not to bear the weight of a finger. I at once felt, or thought I felt, its support like that of some rock. When I talk of friendship, I mean true friendship, he repeated emphatically, and I could hardly believe that words so earnest had blessed my ear. I hardly could credit the reality of that kind, anxious look he gave. If he really wished for my confidence and regard, and really would give me his, why, it seemed to me that life could offer nothing more or better. In that case I was become strong and rich, and a moment I was made substantially happy. To ascertain the fact, to fix and seal it, I asked, Is Monsieur quite serious? Does he really think he needs me, and can take an interest in me as a sister? Surely, surely, said he, a lonely man like me, who has no sister, must be but too glad to find in some woman's heart a sister's pure affection. And dare I rely on monsieur's regard? Dare I speak to him when I am so inclined? My little sister must make her own experiments, said he. I will give no promises. She must tease and try her wayward brother till she has drilled him into what she wishes. After all, he is no indictable material in some hands. While he spoke, the tone of his voice, the light of his now affectionate eye, gave me such a pleasure as certainly I had never felt. I envied no girl her lover, no bride her bridegroom, no wife her husband. I was content with this, my voluntary, self-offering friend. If he would but prove reliable, and he looked reliable, what beyond his friendship could I ever covet? But if all melted like a dream, 
as once before had happened. Kesedung, what is it? said he, as this thought threw its weight on my heart, its shadow on my countenance. I told him, and after a moment's pause and a thoughtful smile, he showed me how an equal fear, lest I should weary of him, a man of moods so difficult and fitful, had haunted his mind for more than one day or one month. On hearing this, a quiet courage cheered me. I ventured a word of reassurance. That word was not only tolerated, its repetition was courted. I grew quite happy, strangely happy, in making him secure, content, tranquil. Yesterday I could not have believed that earth held or life afforded moments like the few I was now passing. Countless times it had been my lot to watch apprehended sorrow close darkly in, but to see unhoped-for happiness take form, find place, and grow more real as the seconds sped, was indeed a new experience. Lucy, said Monsieur Paul, speaking low and still holding my hand, did you see a picture in the boudoir of the old house? I did, a picture painted on a panel. The portrait of a nun? Yes. You heard her history? Yes. You remember what we saw that night in the berceau? I shall never forget it. You did not connect the two ideas. That would be folly. I thought of the apparition when I saw the portrait, said I, which was true enough. You did not, nor will you fancy, pursued he, that a saint in heaven perturbs herself with rivalries on earth? Protestants are rarely superstitious. These morbid fancies will not be said you? I know not what to think of this matter, but I believe a perfectly natural solution of this seeming mystery will one day be arrived at. Doubtless, doubtless. Besides, no good living woman, much less a pure, happy spirit, would trouble amity like ours. N'est-ce pas vrai? Ere I could answer, Fifine Beck burst in, rosy and abrupt, calling out that I was wanted. Her mother was going into town to call on some English family, who had applied for a prospectus. My services were needed as interpreter. The interruption was not unseasonable. Sufficient for the day is always the evil. For this hour its good sufficed. Yet I should have liked to ask Monsieur Paul whether the morbid fancies against which he warned me wrought in his own brain. End of chapter 35《ハッピーオーバーラッシュ》ハッピーオーバーラッシュ。ハッピーオーバーラッシュ。ハッピーオーバーラッシュ。ハッピーオーバーラッシュ。ハッピーオーバーラッシュ。ハッピーオーバーラッシュ。ハッピーオーバーラッシュ。ハッピーオーバーラッシュ。ハッピーオーバーラッシュ。ハッピーオーバーラッシュ。ハッピーオーバーラッシュ。ハッピーオーバーラッシュ。ハッピーオーバーラッシュ。ハッピーオーバーラッシュ。ハッピーオーバーラッシュ。ハッピーオーバーラッシュ。ハッピーオーバーラッシュ。ハッピーオーバーラッシュ。ハッピーオーバーラッシュ。ハッピーオーバーラッシュ。ハッピーオーバーラッシュ。ハッピーオーバーラッシュ。and to which Monsieur Emmanuel drew nigh month by month, the sliding panel of the confessional. Why were you so glad to be friends with Monsieur Paul? asks the reader. Had he not long been a friend to you? Had he not given proof on proof of a certain partiality in his feelings? Yes, he had. But still, I liked to hear him say so earnestly that he was my close, true friend. I liked his modest doubts, his tender deference, that trust which longed to rest and was grateful when taught how. He had called me sister. It was well. Yes, he might call me what he pleased, so long as he confided in me. I was willing to be his sister, on condition that he did not invite me to fill that relation to some future wife of his, and tacitly vowed as he was to celibacy, of this dilemma there seemed little danger. Through most of the succeeding night I pondered that evening's interview. 
I wanted much the morning to break, and then listened for the bell to ring. And after rising and dressing, I deemed prayers and breakfast slow, and all the hours lingering, till that arrived at last which brought me the lesson of literature. My wish was to get a more thorough comprehension of this fraternal alliance, to note with how much of the brother he would demean himself when we met again, to prove how much of the sister was in my own feelings, to discover whether I could summon a sister's courage, and he a brother's frankness. He came. Life is so constructed that the event does not, cannot, will not match the expectation. That whole day he never accosted me. His lesson was given rather more quietly than usual, more mildly and also more gravely. He was fatherly to his pupils, but he was not brotherly to me. Ere he left the class, I expected a smile, if not a word. I got neither. To my portion fell one nod, hurried, shy. This distance, I argued, is accidental. It is involuntary. Patience, and it will vanish. It vanished not. It continued for days. It increased. I suppressed my surprise, and swallowed whatever other feelings began to surge. Well might I ask when he offered fraternity, dare I rely on you? Well might he, doubtless, knowing himself, withhold all pledge. True, he had bid me make my own experiments, tease and try him. Vain injunction! Privilege nominal and unavailable. Some women might use it. Nothing in my powers or instinct placed me amongst this brave band. Left alone, I was passive. Repulsed, I withdrew. Forgotten, my lips would not utter nor my eyes dart a reminder. It seemed there had been an error somewhere in my calculations, and I wanted for time to disclose it. But the day came when, as usual, he was to give me a lesson. One evening in seven he had long generously bestowed on me, devoting it to the examination of what had been done in various studies during the past week, and to the preparation of work for the week in prospect. On these occasions my schoolroom was anywhere, wherever the pupils and the other teachers happened to be, or in their close vicinage, very often in the large second division, where it was easy to choose a quiet nook when the crowding day pupils were absent, and the few boarders gathered in a knot about the surveillance estrade. On the customary evening, hearing the customary hour strike, I collected my books and papers, my pen and ink, and sought the large division. In class there was no one, and it lay all in cool deep shadow. But through the open double doors was seen the carré, filled with pupils and with light. Over hole and figures blushed the westering sun. It blushed so readily and vividly that the hues of the walls and the variegated tints of the dresses seemed all fused into one warm glow. The girls were seated, working or studying. In the midst of their circle stood Monsieur Emmanuel, speaking good-humouredly to a teacher. His dark paletot, his jetty hair, were tinged with many a reflex of crimson. His Spanish face, when he turned it momentarily, answered the son's animated kiss with an animated smile. I took my place at a desk. The orange trees and several plants, full and bright with bloom, basked also in the son's laughing bounty. They had partaken it the whole day, and now asked water. Monsieur Emmanuel had a taste for gardening. He liked to tend and foster plants. I used to think that working amongst shrubs with a spade or a watering pot soothed his nerves. It was a recreation to which he often had recourse, and now he looked to the orange trees, the geraniums, the gorgeous cactuses, and revived them all with the refreshment their draught needed. His lips, meantime, sustained his precious cigar, that, for him, first necessary and prime luxury of life. Its blue wreaths curled prettily enough amongst the flowers and in the evening light. He spoke no more to the pupils, nor to the mistresses, but gave many an endearing word to a small spanuless, if one may coin a word, 
that nominally belonged to the house, but virtually owned him as master, being fonder of him than any inmate. A delicate, silky, loving, and lovable little doggy she was, trotting at his side, looking with expressive, attached eyes into his face, and whenever he dropped his bonny grec or his handkerchief, which he occasionally did in play, crouching beside it with the air of a miniature lion guarding a kingdom's flag. There were many plants, and as the amateur gardener fetched all the water from the well in the court with his own active hands, his work spun on to some length. The great school clock ticked on. Another hour struck. The carré and the youthful group lost the illusion of sunset. Day was drooping. My lesson, I perceived, must to-night be very short. But the orange-trees, the cacti, the camellias were all served now. Was it my turn? Alas! In the garden were more plants to be looked after. Favourite rose-bushes, certain choice flowers. Little Sylvie's glad bark and whine followed the receding paletot down the alleys. I put up some of my books. I should not want them all. I sat and thought and waited, involuntarily deprecating the creeping invasion of twilight. Sylvie, gaily frisking, emerged into view once more, heralding the returning paletot. The watering pot was deposited beside the well. It had fulfilled its office. How glad I was! Monsieur washed his hands in a little stone bowl. There was no longer time for a lesson now. Ere long the prayer bell must ring. But still we should meet. He would speak. A chance would be offered of reading in his eyes the riddle of his shyness. His ablutions over, he stood, slowly rearranging his cuffs, looking at the horn of a young moon set pale in the opal sky and glimmering faint on the aureole of Jean-Baptiste. Sylvie watched the mood contemplative. Its stillness irked her. She whined and jumped to break it. He looked down. Petite exigeante, said he. You must not be forgetting one moment, it seems. He stopped, lifted her in his arms, sauntered across the court, within a yard of the line of windows near one of which I sat. He sauntered lingeringly, fondling the spaniel in his bosom, calling her tender names in a tender voice. On the front doorsteps he turned. Once again he looked at the moon, at the grey cathedral, over the remoter spires and house-roofs fading into a blue sea of night mist. He tasted the sweet breath of dusk, and noted the folded bloom of the garden. He suddenly looked round. A keen beam out of his eye raised the white façade of the classes, swiped the long line of crozet. I think he bowed. If he did, I had no time to return the courtesy. In a moment he was gone. The moonlit threshold lay pale and shadowless before the closed front door. Gathering in my arms all that was spread on the desk before me, I carried back the unused heap to its place in the third class. The prayer bell rang. I obeyed its summons. The morrow would not restore him to the roof or set, that day being devoted entirely to his college. I got through my teaching. I got over the intermediate hours. I saw evening approaching and armed myself for its heavy ennuis. Whether it was worse to stay with my co-inmates or to sit alone I had not considered. I naturally took up the latter alternative. If there was a hope of comfort for any moment, the heart or head of no human being in this house could yield it. Only under the lid of my desk could it harbour, nestling between the leaves of some book, gilding a pencil point, the nib of a pen, or tinging the black fluid in that ink glass. With a heavy heart I opened my desk lid, with a weary hand I turned up its contents. One by one, well-accustomed books, volumes sewn in familiar covers, were taken out and put back hopeless. They had no charm. They could not comfort. Is this something new, this pamphlet in lilac? I had not seen it before, and I rearranged my desk this very day, this very afternoon. 
The tract must have been introduced within the last hour, while we were at dinner. I opened it. What was it? What would it say to me? It was neither tale nor poem, neither essay nor history. It neither sung nor related, not discussed. It was a theological work. It preached and it persuaded. I lent to it my ear very willingly, for, small as it was, it possessed its own spell, and bound my attention at once. It preached Romanism. It persuaded to conversion. The voice of that sly little book was a honeyed voice. Its accents were all unction and balm. Here roared no utterance of Rome's thunders, no blasting of the breath of her displeasure. The Protestant was to turn papist not so much in fear of the heretic's hell, as on account of the comfort, the indulgence, the tenderness Holy Church offered. Far be it from her to threaten or to coerce, her wish was to guide and win. She persecute? Oh, dear, no, not on any account. This meek volume was not addressed to the hardened and worldly. It was not even strong meat for the strong. It was milk for babes. The mild effluence of a mother's love towards her tenderest and her youngest, intended wholly and solely for those whose head is to be reached through the heart. Its appeal was not to intellect. It sought to win the affectionate through their affections, the sympathizing through their sympathies. St. Vincent de Paul, gathering his orphans about him, never spoke more sweetly. I remember one capital inducement to apostasy was held out in the fact that the Catholic who had lost dear friends by death could enjoy the unspeakable solace of praying them out of purgatory. The writer did not touch on the firmer peace of those whose belief dispenses with purgatory altogether, but I thought of this, and on the whole preferred the latter doctrine as the most consolatory. The little book amused and did not painfully displease me. It was a canting, sentimental, shallow little book, yet something about it cheered my gloom and made me smile. I was amused with the gambols of this unlicked wolf-cub, muffled in the fleece, and mimicking the bleat of a guileless lamb. Portions of it reminded me of certain Wesleyan Methodist tracts I had once read when a child. They were flavoured with about the same seasoning of excitation to fanaticism. He that had written it was no bad man, and while perpetually betraying the trained cunning, the cloven hoof of his system, I should pause before accusing him of insincerity. His judgment, however, wanted surgical props. It was rickety. I smiled then over this dose of maternal tenderness, coming from the ruddy old lady of the Seven Hills, smiled too at my own disinclination not to say disability, to meet these melting favours. Glancing at the title-page, I found the name of Pear Silas. A fly-leaf bore in small but clear and well-known pencil characters, from P-C-D-E to L-Y. And when I saw this I laughed, but not in my former spirit. I was revived. A mortal bewilderment cleared suddenly from my head and vision. The solution of the Sphinx riddle was won. The conjunction of those two names, Pear Silas and Paul Emanuel, gave the key to all. The penitent had been with his director, permitted to withhold nothing, suffered to keep no corner of his heart sacred to God and to himself. The whole narrative of our late interview had been drawn from him. He had avowed the covenant of fraternity, and spoken of his adopted sister. How could such a covenant, such adoption, be sanctioned by the church? Fraternal communion with a heretic? I seemed to hear Pear Silas annulling the unholy pact, warning his penitent of its perils, entreating and joining reserve, nay, by the authority of his office, and in the name, and by the memory of all Monsieur Emmanuel held most dear and sacred, commanding the enforcement of that new system whose frost had pierced to the marrow of my bones. These may not seem pleasant hypotheses, yet by comparison they were welcome. The vision of a ghostly troubler hovering in the background was as nothing, matched with the fear of spontaneous change arising in Monsieur Paul himself. 
At this distance of time, I cannot be sure how far the above conjectures were self-suggested, or in what measure they owed their origin and confirmation to another quarter. Help was not wanting. This evening there was no bright sunset. West and east were one cloud. No summer night mist, blue yet rose-tinged, softened the distance. A clammy fog from the marshes crept grey round Villette. Tonight the watering-pot might rest in its niche by the wall. A small rain had been drizzling all the afternoon, and still it fell fast and quietly. This was no weather for rambling in the wet alleys, under the dripping trees, and I started to hear Sylvie's sudden bark in the garden. Her bark of welcome! Surely she was not accompanied, and yet this glad, quick bark was never uttered, save in homage to one presence. Through the glass door and the arching berceau, I commanded the deep vista of the Allée de Fondu. Thither rushed Sylvie, glistening through its gloom like a white gilder rose. She ran to and fro, whining, springing, harassing little birds amongst the bushes. I watched five minutes. No fulfilment followed the omen. I returned to my books. Sylvie's sharp bark suddenly ceased. Again I looked up. She was standing not many yards distant, wagging her white feathery tail as fast as the muscle would work, and intently watching the operations of a spade, plied fast by an indefatigable hand. There was Monsieur Emmanuel, bent over the soil, digging in the wet mould amongst the rain-laden and streaming shrubs, working as hard as if his day's pittance were yet to earn by the literal sweat of his brow. In this sign I read a ruffled mood. He would dig thus in frozen snow on the coldest winter day, when urged inwardly by painful emotion, whether of nervous excitation or sad thoughts of self-reproach. He would dig by the hour, with knit brow and set teeth, nor once lift his head or open his lips. Sylvie watched till she was tired, again scampering devious, bounding here, rushing there, snuffing and sniffing everywhere, she at last discovered me in class. Instantly she flew barking at the panes, as if to urge me forth to share her pleasure or her master's toil. She had seen me occasionally walking in that alley with Monsieur Paul, and, I doubt not, considered it my duty to join him now, wet as it was. She made such a bustle that Monsieur Paul at last looked up, and, of course, perceived why and at whom she barked. He whistled to call her off. She only barked the louder. She seemed quite bent upon having the glass door opened. Tired, I suppose, with her importunity, he threw down his spade, approached, and pushed the door ajar. Sylvie burst in, all impetuous, sprang to my lap, and, with her paws at my neck and her little nose and tongue somewhat overpoweringly busy about my face, mouth, and eyes, flourished her bushy tail over the desk, and scattered books and papers far and wide. Monsieur Emmanuel advanced to still the clamour and repair the disarrangement. Having gathered up the books, he captured Sylvie, and stowed her away under his paletot, where she nestled as quiet as a mouse, her head just peeping forth. She was very tiny, and had the prettiest little innocent face, the silkiest long ears, the finest dark eyes in the world. I never saw her, but I thought of Paulina de Bassompierre. Forgive the association, reader, it would occur. Monsieur Paul petted and patted her. The endearments she received were not to be wondered at. She invited affection by her beauty and her vivacious life. While caressing the spaniel, his eyes roved over the papers and books just replaced. It settled on the religious tract. His lips moved. He half checked the impulse to speak. What? Had he promised never to address me more? If so, his better nature pronounced the vow more honoured in the breach than in the observance, for with a second effort he spoke. You have not yet read the brochure, I presume. It is not sufficiently inviting. I replied that I had read it. He waited, as if wishing me to give an opinion upon it unasked. Unasked, however, I was in no mood to do or say anything. If any concessions were to be made, if any advances were demanded, that was the affair of the very docile pupil of Père Silas, not mine. 
His eye settled upon me gently. There was a mildness at the moment in its blue ray. There was solicitude, a shade of pathos. There were meanings composite and contrasted, reproach melting into remorse. At that moment, probably, he would have been glad to see something emotional in me. I could not show it. In another minute, however, I should have betrayed confusion, had I not bethought myself to take some quill-pens from my desk, and begin soberly to mend them. I knew that action would give a turn to his mood. He never liked to see me mend pens. My knife was always dull-edged. My hand, too, was unskilful. I hacked and chipped. On this occasion I cut my own finger, half on purpose. I wanted to restore him to his natural state, to set him at his ease, to get him to chide. Maladroit, he cried at last. She will make mincemeat of her hands. He put Sylvie down, making her lie quiet beside his bonnet grec, and, depriving me of the pens and penknife, proceeded to slice nib and point with the accuracy and celerity of a machine. Did I like the little book? he now inquired. Suppressing a yawn, I said I hardly knew. Had it moved me? I thought it had made me a little sleepy. After a pause. Allons donc. It was of no use taking that tone with him, bad as I was, and he would be sorry to have to name all my faults at a breath. God and nature had given me trop de sensibilité et de sympathie not to be profoundly affected by an appeal so touching. Indeed, I responded, rousing myself quickly. I was not affected at all, not a whit. And in proof I drew from my pocket a perfectly dry handkerchief, still clean and in its folds. Hereupon I was made the object of a string of strictures rather piquant than polite. I listened with zest. After those two days of unnatural silence, it was better than music to hear Monsieur Paul haranguing again, just in his old fashion. I listened, and meantime solaced myself and Sylvie with the contents of a bonbonniere, which Monsieur Emmanuel's gifts kept well supplied with chocolate comfits. It pleased him to see even a small matter from his hand duly appreciated. He looked at me and the spaniel while we shared the spoil. He put up his penknife. Touching my hand with the bundle of new-cut quills, he said, Dites donc, petite sœur, speak frankly. What have you thought of me during the last two days? But of this question I would take no manner of notice. Its purport made my eyes fill. I caressed Sylvie assiduously. Monsieur Paul, leaning over the desk, bent towards me. I called myself your brother, he said. I hardly know what I am, brother, friend, I cannot tell. I know I think of you. I feel I wish you well. But I must check myself. You are to be feared. My best friends point out danger and whisper caution. You do right to listen to your friends. By all means, be cautious. It is your religion, your strange, self-reliant, unvulnerable grade, whose influence seems to class you in, I know not what, unblessed panoply. You are good. Persilas calls you good and loves you. But your terrible, proud, earnest Protestantism, there is the danger. It expresses itself by your eye at times, and again it gives you certain tones and certain gestures that make my flesh creep. You are not demonstrative, and yet, just now, when you handled that tract, my God, I thought Lucifer smiled. Certainly I don't respect that tract. What then? Not respect that tract. But it is the pure essence of faith, love, charity. I thought it would touch you in its gentleness. I trust that it could not fail. I laid it on your desk with a prayer. 
I must indeed be a sinner. Heaven will not hear the petitions that come warmest from my heart, who scorn my little offering. Oh, cela me fait mal. Monsieur, I don't scorn it, at least not as your gift. Monsieur, sit down, listen to me. I am not a heathen, I am not hard-hearted, I am not unchristian, I am not dangerous, as they tell you. I would not trouble your faith. You believe in God and Christ and the Bible, and so do I. But do you believe in the Bible? Do you receive revelation? What limits are there to the wild, careless daring of your country and sect? Père Silas dropped dark hints. By dint of persuasion I made him half define these hints. They amounted to crafty Jesuit slanders. That night Monsieur Paul and I talked seriously and closely. He pleaded, he argued. I could not argue. A fortunate incapacity. It needed but triumphant logical opposition to affect all the director wished to be affected. But I could talk in my own way, the way Monsieur Paul was used to and of which he could follow the meanderings and fill the hiatus and pardon the strange stammerings, strange to him no longer. At ease with him I could defend my creed and faith in my own fashion. In some degree I could lull his prejudices. He was not satisfied when he went away. Hardly was he appeased. But he was made thoroughly to feel that Protestants were not necessarily the irreverent pagans his director had insinuated. He was made to comprehend something of their mode of honouring the light, the life, the word. He was enabled partly to perceive that, while their veneration for things venerable was not quite like that cultivated in his church, it had its own, perhaps deeper power, its own more solemn awe. I found that Père Silas, himself, I must repeat, not a bad man, though the advocate of a bad cause, had darkly stigmatized Protestants in general, and myself by inference, with strange names, had ascribed to us strange isms. Monsieur Emmanuel revealed all this in his frank fashion, which knew not secretiveness, looking at me as he spoke with a kind, earnest fear, almost trembling lest there should be truth in the charges. Père Silas, it seems, had closely watched me had ascertained that I went by turns and indiscriminately to the three Protestant chapels of Villette, the French, the German, and English, id est, the Presbyterian, Lutheran, Episcopalian. Such liberality argued in the father's eyes profound indifference. Who tolerates all, he reasoned, can be attached to none. Now, it happened that I had often secretly wondered at the minute and unimportant character of the differences between these three sects, at the unity and identity of their vital doctrines. I saw nothing to hinder them from being one day fused into one grand holy alliance, and I respected them all, though I thought that in each there were faults of form, encumbrances, and trivialities. Just what I thought, that did I tell Monsieur Emmanuel and explained to him that my own last appeal, the guide to which I looked, and the teacher which I owned, must always be the Bible itself, rather than any sect of whatever name or nation. He left me soothed, yet full of solicitude, breathing a wish as strong as a prayer, that if I were wrong, heaven would lead me right. I heard, poured forth on the threshold, some fervid murmurings to— Marie. Reine du ciel. Some deep aspiration that his hope might yet be mine. Strange, I had no feverish wish to turn him from the faith of his fathers. I thought Romanism wrong, a great mixed image of gold and clay. But it seemed to me that this Romanist held the purer elements of his creed with an innocency of heart which God must love. The preceding conversation passed between eight and nine o'clock of the evening, in a schoolroom of the Rue Fossette, opening on a sequestered garden. Probably about the same or a somewhat later hour of the succeeding evening, its echoes collected by holy obedience were breathed verbatim in an attendant ear at the panel of a confessional in the hoary church of the Magi. 
It ensued that Père Silas paid a visit to Madame Beck, and stirred by I know not what mixture of motives, persuaded her to let him undertake for a time the Englishwoman's spiritual direction. Hereupon I was put through a course of reading, that is, I just glanced at the books lent me. They were too little in my way to be thoroughly read, marked, learned, or inwardly digested. And besides, I had a book upstairs under my pillow, whereof certain chapters satisfied my needs in the article of spiritual law, furnishing such precept and example as to my heart's core I was convinced could not be improved on. Then Per Silas showed me the fair side of Rome, her good works, and bade me judge the tree by its fruits. In answer I felt and avowed that these works were not the fruits of Rome, they were but her abundant blossoming, but the fair promise she showed the world. That bloom when set savoured not of charity, the apple full-formed was ignorance, abasement, and bigotry. Out of men's afflictions and affections were forged the rivets of their servitude. Poverty was fed and clothed and sheltered, to bind it by obligation to the church. Orphanage was reared and educated, that it might grow up in the fold of the church. Sickness was tended, that it might die after the formula and in the ordinance of the church. And men were overwrought, and women most murderously sacrificed, and all lay down a world God made pleasant for his creature's good, and took up a cross monstrous in its galling weight, that they might serve Rome, prove her sanctity, confirm her power, and spread the reign of her tyrant church. For man's good was little done, for God's glory less. A thousand ways were opened with pain, with blood sweats, with lavishing of life. Mountains were cloven through their breasts, and rocks were split to their base, and all for what? That a priesthood might march straight on and straight upward to an all-dominating eminence, whence they might at last stretch the sceptre of their Moloch church. It will not be. God is not with Rome, and were human sorrows still for the Son of God, would he not mourn for her cruelties and ambitions, as once he mourned over the crimes and woes of doomed Jerusalem? O oh, lovers of power, O oh, mitred aspirants for this world's kingdoms, an hour will come even to you when it will be well for your hearts, pausing faint at each broken beat, that there is a mercy beyond human compassions. A love stronger than this strong death which even you must face, and before it, fall. A charity more potent than any sin, even yours. A pity which redeems worlds, nay, absolves priests. My third temptation was held out in the pomp of Rome, the glory of her kingdom. I was taken to the churches on solemn occasions, days of fete and state, I was shown the papal ritual and ceremonial. I looked at it. Many people, men and women, no doubt far my superiors in a thousand ways, have felt this display impressive, have declared that, though their reason protested, their imagination was subjugated. I cannot say the same. Neither full procession, nor high mass, nor swarming tapers, nor swinging censers, nor ecclesiastical millinery, nor celestial jewellery, touched my imagination a whit. What I saw struck me as tawdry, not grand, as grossly material, not poetically spiritual. This I did not tell Per Silas. He was old, he looked venerable. Through every abortive experiment, under every repeated disappointment, he remained personally kind to me, and I felt tender of hurting his feelings. But on the evening of a certain day, when from the balcony of a great house I had been made to witness a huge mingled procession of the church and the army, priests with relics and soldiers with weapons, an obese and aged archbishop, habited in cambric and lace, looking strangely like a grey door in bird-of-paradise plumage, and a band of young girls fantastically robed and garlanded, then I spoke my mind to Monsieur Paul. I did not like it, I told him. I did not respect such ceremonies. I wished to see it no more. And having relieved my conscience by this declaration, I was able to go on, and speaking more currently and clearly than my wont, to show him that I had a mind to keep to my reformed creed, 
The more I saw of popery, the closer I clung to Protestantism. Doubtless there were errors in every church, but I now perceived by contrast how severely pure was my own, compared with her whose painted and meretricious face had been unveiled for my admiration. I told him how we kept fewer forms between us and God, retaining indeed no more than perhaps the nature of mankind in the mass rendered necessary for due observance. I told him I could not look on flowers and tinsel, on wax lights and embroidery, at such times and under such circumstances as should be devoted to lifting the secret vision to him whose home is infinity, and his being eternity. That when I thought of sin and sorrow, of earthly corruption, mortal depravity, weighty temporal woe, I could not care for chanting priests or mumming officials, that when the pains of existence and the terrors of dissolution pressed before me, when the mighty hope and measureless doubt of the future arose in view, then even the scientific strain of the prayer in a language learned and dead harassed with hindrance a heart which only longed to cry, God be merciful to me, a sinner. When I had so spoken, so declared my faith, and so widely severed myself from him I addressed, then at last came a tone accordant, an echo responsive, one sweet chord of harmony in two conflicting spirits. Whatever say priests or controversialists, murmured Monsieur Emmanuel, God is good and loves all the sincere. Believe then what you can, believe it as you can, one prayer at least we have in common, I also cry. O oh Dieu, sois apaisé envers moi, qui suis pécheur. He leaned on the back of my chair. After some thought, he again spoke. How seem in the eyes of that God who made all firmaments, whose nostrils issued, whatever of life is here, or in the stars shining yonder, how seem the differences of man? But as time is not for God, nor space, so neither is measure, nor comparison. We obey ourselves in our littleness, and we do right, yet it may be that the constancy of one heart, the scrut and fate of one mind, according to the light he has appointed, import as much to him as the just motion of satellites about their planets, of planets about their suns, of suns around that mighty unseen center, uncomprehensible, irrealizable, with strange mental effort only divined. God guide us all. God bless you, Lucy. End of chapter 36《They kept their intention so far as demonstrative courtship went, but in feeling they soon drew very near. All that was best in Graham sought Paulina. Whatever in him was noble awoke and grew in her presence. With his past admiration of Miss Farnshaw, I suppose his intellect had little to do, but his whole intellect and his highest tastes came in question now. These, like all his faculties, were active, eager for nutriment, and alive to gratification when it came. I cannot say that Paulina designedly led him to talk of books, or formally proposed to herself for a moment the task of winning him to reflection, or planned the improvement of his mind, or so much as fancied his mind could in any one respect be improved. She thought him very perfect. 
It was Graham himself who, at first by the merest chance, mentioned some book he had been reading, and when in her response sounded a welcome harmony of sympathies, something pleasant to his soul, he talked on, more and better perhaps than he had ever talked before on such subjects. She listened with delight, and answered with animation. In each successive answer, Graham heard a music waxing finer and finer to his sense. In each he found a suggestive, persuasive magic accent that opened a scarce-known treasure-house within, showed him unsuspected power in his own mind, and, what was better, latent goodness in his heart. Each liked the way in which the other talked. The voice, the diction, the expression pleased. Each keenly relished the flavour of the other's wit. They met each other's meaning with strange quickness, their thoughts often matched like carefully chosen pearls. Graham had wealth of mirth by nature. Paulina possessed no such inherent flow of animal spirits. Unstimulated, she inclined to be thoughtful and pensive, but now she seemed merry as a lark. In her lover's genial presence she glanced like some soft glad light. How beautiful she grew in her happiness I can hardly express, but I wondered to see her. As to that gentle ice of hers, that reserve on which she had depended, where was it now? Ah, Graham would not long bear it. He brought with him a generous influence that soon thawed the timid self-imposed restriction. Now were the old Breton days talked over, perhaps brokenly at first with a sort of smiling diffidence then with opening candour and still growing confidence. Graham had made for himself a better opportunity than that he had wished me to give. He had earned independence of the collateral help that disobliging Lucy had refused. All his reminiscences of little Polly found their proper expression in his own pleasant tones, by his own kind and handsome lips. How much better than if suggested by me! More than once when we were alone, Paulina would tell me how wonderful and curious it was to discover the richness and accuracy of his memory in this matter, how, while he was looking at her, recollections would seem to be suddenly quickened in his mind. He reminded her that she had once gathered his head in her arms, caressed his lionine graces, and cried out, "'Grem, I do like you!' He told her how she would set a footstool beside him, and climb by its aid to his knee. At this day he said he could recall the sensation of her little hands smoothing his cheek, or burying themselves in his thick mane. He remembered the touch of her small forefinger, placed half-tremblingly, half-curiously, in the cleft of his chin. The lisp, the look with which she would name it, A pretty dimple, then seek his eyes and question why they pierced so telling him he had a nice, strange face, far nicer, far stranger, than either his mamma or Lucy Snow, child as I was, remarked Paulina. I wonder how I dared be so venturous. To me he seems now all sacred. His locks are inaccessible. And in Lucy, I feel a sort of fear, when I look at his firm, marble chin, at his straight Greek features. Women are called beautiful, Lucy. He is not like a woman. Therefore, I suppose, he is not beautiful. But what is he, then? Do other people see him with my eyes? Do you admire him? I'll tell you what I do, Paulina, was once my answer to her many questions. I never see him. I looked at him twice or thrice about a year ago before he recognized me, and then I shut my eyes, and if he were to cross their balls twelve times between each day's sunset and sunrise, except from memory I should hardly know what shape had gone by. Lucy, what do you mean? said she under her breath. I mean that I value vision, and dread being struck stone blind. It was best to answer her strongly, at once, and to silence for ever the tender, passionate confidences which left her lips sweet honey, and sometimes dropped in my ear molten lead. To me she commented no more on her lover's beauty. Yet speak of him she would sometimes shyly, in quiet, brief phrases, sometimes with a tenderness of cadence, and music of voice exquisite in itself, but which chafed me at times miserably. And then I know I gave her stern looks and words. 
but cloudless happiness had dazzled her native clear sight, and she only thought Lucy fitful. Spartan girl, proud Lucy, she would say, smiling at me. Graham says you are the most peculiar, capricious little woman he knows, but yet you are excellent. We both think so. You both think you know not what, said I. Have the goodness to make me as little the subject of your mutual talk and thoughts as possible. I have my sort of life apart from yours. But ours, Lucy, is a beautiful life, or it will be, and you shall share it. I shall share no man's or woman's life in this world, as you understand sharing. I think I have one friend of my own, but I'm not sure. Until I am sure, I live solitary. But solitude is sadness. Yes, it is sadness. Life, however, has worse than that. Deeper than melancholy lies heartbreak. Lucy, I wonder if anybody will ever comprehend you altogether. There is in lovers a certain infatuation of egotism. They will have a witness of their happiness, cost that witness what it may. Paulina had forbidden letters, yet Dr. Breton wrote. She had resolved against correspondence, yet she answered, were it only to chide. She showed me these letters, with something of the spoiled child's willfulness, and of the heiress's imperiousness, she made me read them. As I read Graham's, I scarce wondered at her exaction, and understood her pride. They were fine letters, manly and fond, modest and gallant. Hers must have appeared to him beautiful. They had not been written to show her talents, still less, I think, to express her love. On the contrary, it appeared that she had proposed to herself the task of hiding that feeling, and bridling her lover's ardour. But how could such letters serve such a purpose? Graham was become dear as her life. He drew her like a powerful magnet. For her there was influence unspeakable in all he uttered, wrote, thought, or looked. With this unconfessed confession, her letters glowed. It kindled them, from greeting to adieu. I wish Papa knew. I do wish Papa knew. Began now to be her anxious murmur. I wish, and yet I fear. I can hardly keep Graham back from telling him. There is nothing I long for more than to have this affair settled, to speak out candidly. And yet I dread the crisis. I know, I am certain Papa will be angry at the first. I fear he will dislike me almost. It will seem to him an untoward business. It will be a surprise, a shock. I can hardly foresee its whole effect on him. The fact was, her father, long calm, was beginning to be a little stirred. Long blind on one point, an importunate light was beginning to trespass on his eye. To her he said nothing, but when she was not looking at or perhaps thinking of him, I saw him gaze and meditate on her. One evening Paulina was in her dressing-room, writing, I believe, to Graham. She had left me in the library, reading. Monsieur de Bassompierre came in. He sat down. I was about to withdraw. He requested me to remain gently yet in a manner which showed he wished compliance he had taken his seat near the window at a distance from me he opened a desk he took from it what looked like a memorandum book of this book he studied a certain entry for several minutes miss snow said he laying it down do you know my little girl's age about eighteen is it not sir it seems so this old pocket-book tells me she was born on the 5th of May, in the year 18... 18 years ago. It is strange. I had lost the just reckoning of her age. I thought of her as 12, 14, an indefinite date. But she seemed a child. She is about 18, I repeated. She is grown up. She will be no taller. A little Joe said Monsieur de Bassompierre, in a tone which penetrated like some of his daughter's accents. He sat very thoughtful. "'Sir, don't grieve,' I said, for I knew his feelings, utterly unspoken as they were. "'She is the only pearl I have,' he said. "'And now others will find out that she is pure and of price. They will covet her.' I made no answer. 
Graham Breton had dined with us that day. He had shown both in converse and looks. I know not what pride of bloom embellished his aspect and mellowed his intercourse. Under the stimulus of a high hope, something had unfolded in his whole manner which compelled attention. I think he had purposed on that day to indicate the origin of his endeavours, and the aim of his ambition. Monsieur de Bassompierre had found himself forced, in a manner, to descry the direction and catch the character of his homage. Slow in remarking, he was logical in reasoning. Having once seized the thread, it had guided him through a long labyrinth. "'Where is she?' he asked. "'She is upstairs.' "'What is she doing?' She is writing. She writes, does she? Does she receive letters? None but such as she can show me. And, sir, she, they, have long wished to consult you. Pfft! <laughs> they don't think of me, an old father. I'm in the way. Ah, uh, Monsieur de Bassompierre, not so. That can't be. But Paulina must speak for herself. And Dr. Breton, too, must be his own advocate. It is a little late. Others are advanced, it seems. Sir, till you approve, nothing is done. Only they love each other. Only? He echoed. Invested by fate with the part of confidant and meditator, I was obliged to go on. Hundreds of times has Dr. Breton been on the point of appealing to you, sir, but with all his high courage, he fears you mortally. He may well, he may well fear me. He has touched the best thing I have. Had he but let her alone, she would have remained a child for years yet. So, are they engaged? They could not become engaged without your permission. It is well for you, Miss Snow, to talk and think with that propriety which always characterizes you. But this matter is a grief to me. My little girl was all I had. I have no more daughters and no son. Breton might as well have looked elsewhere. There are scores of rich and pretty women who would not, I dare say, dislike him. He has looks and conduct and connection. Would nothing serve him but my Polly? If he had never seen your Polly, others might and would have pleased him. Your niece, Miss Farnshaw, for instance. Ah, I would have given him Ginevra with all my heart. But, Polly, I can't let him have her. No, I can't. He is not her equal. He affirmed, rather gruffly. In what particular is he her match? They talk of fortune. I am not an avaricious or interested man. But the world thinks of these things, and Polly will be rich. Yes, that is known, said I. All Villette knows her as an heiress. Do they talk of my little girl in that light? They do, sir. He fell into deep thought. I ventured to say, Would you, sir, think any one Paulina's match? Would you prefer any other to Dr. Breton? Do you think higher rank or more wealth would make much difference in your feelings towards a future son-in-law? You touch me there, said he. Look at the aristocracy of Villette. You would not like them, sir. I should not. Never a duke, baron, or vicomte of the lot. I am told many of these persons think about her, sir, I went on, gaining courage on finding that I met attention rather than repulse. Other suitors will come, therefore, if Dr. Breton is refused. Wherever you go, I suppose, aspirants will not be wanting. Independent of heiress-ship, it appears to me that Paulina charms most of those who see her. Does she? How? A little girl is not thought a beauty. Sir, Mr. Bassompierre is very beautiful. Nonsense. Begging your pardon, Miss Snow, but I think you are too partial. I like Polly. I like all her ways and all her looks. But then I'm her father and even I never thought about beauty. She's amusing, fairy-like, interesting to me. You must be mistaken in supposing her handsome. She attracts, sir. She would attract without the advantages of your wealth and position. 
my wealth and position are these any bait to graham if i thought so dr breton knows these points perfectly as you may be sure monsieur de bassompierre and values them as any gentleman would as you would yourself under the same circumstances but they are not his baits he loves your daughter very much he feels her finest qualities and they influence him worthily what has my little pet fine qualities ah sir did you observe her that evening when so many men of eminence and learning dined here i certainly was rather struck and surprised with her manner that day its womanliness made me smile and did you see those accomplished frenchmen gather round her in the drawing-room i did but i thought it was by way of relaxation as one might amuse one's self with a pretty infant sir she demeaned herself with distinction and i heard the french gentleman say she was pétri d'esprit et de grâce dr breton thought the same she is a good dear child that is certain and i do believe she has some character when i think of it i was once ill polly nursed me they thought i should die she i recollect grew at once stronger and tenderer as i grew worse in health and as i recovered what a sunbeam she was in my sick room yes she played about my chair as noiselessly and as cheerful as light and now she is sought in marriage i don't want to part with her said he and he groaned you have known dr and mrs breton so long i suggested it would be less like separation to give her to him than to another he reflected rather gloomily true i have long known louisa breton he murmured she and i are indeed old old friends a sweet kind girl she was when she was young you talk of beauty miss snow she was handsome if you will tall straight and blooming not the mere child or elf my polly seems to me at eighteen louisa had a carriage and a stature fit for a princess she's a calmly and a good woman now the lad is like her i have always thought so and favoured and wished him well now he repays me by this robbery my little treasure used to love her old father dearly and truly it is all over now doubtless i'm an encumbrance the door opened his little treasure came in she was dressed so to speak in evening beauty that animation which sometimes comes with the close of day warmed her eye and cheek a tinge of summer crimson heightened her complexion her curls fell full and long on her lily neck her white dress suited the heat of june thinking me alone she had brought in her hand the letter just written brought it folded but unsealed i was to read it when she saw her father her tripping step faltered a little paused a moment the colour in her cheek flowed rosy over her whole face Polly said monsieur de bassompierre in a low voice with a grave smile do you blush at seeing papa that is something new i don't blush i never do blush affirmed she while another eddy from the heart sent up its scarlet but i thought you were in the dining-room and i wanted lucy you thought i was with john graham breton i suppose but he has just been called out he will be back soon polly he can post your letter for you it will save matthew of course as he calls it i don't post letters said she rather pettishly what do you do with them then come here and tell me both her mind and gesture seemed to hesitate a second to say shall i come but she approached how long is it since you became a letter writer polly it only seems yesterday that you were at your pot-hooks labouring away absolutely with both hands at the pen papa they are not letters to send to the post in your letter-bag they are only notes which i give now and then into the person's hands just to satisfy the person that means miss snow i suppose no papa not lucy who then perhaps mrs breton 
no papa not mrs breton who then my little daughter tell papa the truth oh papa she cried with earnestness i will i will tell you the truth all the truth i am glad to tell you glad though i tremble she did tremble growing excitement kindling feeling and also gathering courage shook her i hate to hide my actions from you papa i fear you and love you above everything but god read the letter look at the address she laid it on his knee he took it up and read it through his hand shaking his eyes glistening meantime he refolded it and viewed the writer with a strange tender mournful amaze can she write so the little thing that stood at my knee but yesterday can she feel so papa is it wrong does it pain you there is nothing wrong with it my innocent little mary but it pains me but papa listen you shall not be pained by me i would give up everything almost correcting herself i would die rather than make you unhappy that would be too wicked she shuddered does the letter not please you must it not go must it be torn it shall for your sake if you order it i order nothing order something papa express your wish only don't hurt don't grieve graham i cannot cannot bear that i love you papa but i love graham too because because it is impossible to help it this splendid graham is a young scamp polly that is my present notion of him it will surprise you to hear that for my part i do not love him one whit ah years ago i saw something in that lad's eye i never quite fathomed something his mother has not a depth which warned a man not to wade into that stream too far now suddenly i find myself taken over the crown of the head papa you don't you have not fallen in you are safe on the bank you can do as you please your power is despotic you can shut me up in a convent and break graham's heart to-morrow if you choose to be so cruel now autocrat now czar will you do this off with him to siberia red whiskers and all i say i don't like him polly and i wonder that you should papa said she do you know you are very naughty i never saw you look so disagreeable so unjust so almost vindictive before there is an expression in your face which does not belong to you off with him pursued mr home who certainly did look sorely crossed and annoyed even a little bitter but i suppose if he went polly would pack a bundle and run after him her heart is fairly won won and weaned from her old father papa i say it is naughty it is decidedly wrong to talk in that way i am not weaned from you and no human being and no mortal influence can wean me be married polly espouse the red whiskers cease to be a daughter go and be a wife red whiskers i wonder what you mean papa you should take care of prejudice you sometimes say to me that all the scotch your countrymen are the victims of prejudice it is proved now i think where no distinction is to be made between red and deep nut brown leave the prejudiced old scotchman go away she stood looking at him a minute she wanted to show firmness superiority to taunts knowing her father's character guessing his few foibles she had expected the sort of scene which was now transpiring it did not take her by surprise and she desired to let it pass with dignity reliant upon reaction her dignity stood her in no stead suddenly her soul melted in her eyes she fell on his neck i won't leave you papa i'll never leave you i won't pain you i'll never pain you was her cry my lamb my treasure murmured the loving though rugged sire he said no more for the moment indeed those two words were hoarse the room was now darkening i heard a movement a step without thinking it might be a servant coming with candles i gently opened to prevent intrusion in the ante-room stood no servant a tall gentleman was placing his hat on the table drawing off his glove slowly lingering waiting it seemed to me he called me neither by sign nor word yet his eye said lucy come here and i went 
Over his face a smile flowed while he looked down on me. No temper save his own would have expressed by a smile the sort of agitation which now fevered him. Monsieur de Bassompierre is there, is he not? He inquired, pointing to the library. Yes. He noticed me at dinner. He understood me? Yes, Graham. I am brought up for judgment, then, and so is she. Mr. Home, we now and always continued to term him Mr. Home at times, is talking to his daughter. These are sharp moments, Lucy. He was quite stirred up. His young hand trembled. A vital... I was going to write mortal, but such words ill apply to one all living like him. A vital suspense now held, now hurried his breath. In all this trouble his smile never faded. Is he very angry, Lucy? She is very faithful, Gran. What will be done unto me? Gran, your star must be fortunate. Must it? Kind prophet. So cheered I should be faint-heart indeed to quail. I think I find all women faithful, Lucy. I ought to love them, and I do. My mother is good, she's divine. And you are true steel, are you not? Yes, Gran. Then give me thy hand, my little god-sister. It is a friendly little hand to me, and always has been. And now for the great venture. God be with the right, Lucy. Say Amen. He turned and waited till I said Amen, which I did to please him. The old charm in doing as he bid me came back. I wished him success, and successful I knew he would be. He was born victor, as some are born vanquished. Follow me, he said, and I followed him into Mr. Holmes' presence. Sir? he asked. What is my sentence? The father looked at him. The daughter kept her face hid. Well, Breddon, said Mr. Holmes. You have given me the usual reward of hospitality. I entertained you. You have taken my best. I was always glad to see you. You were glad to see the one precious thing I had. You spoke me fair, and meantime I will not say you robbed me, but I am bereaved, and what I have lost you, it seems, have won. Sir, I cannot repent. Repent? not you you triumphed no doubt john graham you descended partly from a highlander and a chief and there is a trace of the celt in all you look speak and think you have his cunning and his charm the red well then polly the fair hair the tongue of guile the brain of oil are all come down by inheritance sir i feel honest enough said graham and a genuine English blush covered his face with its warm witness of sincerity. And yet, he added, I won't deny that in some respects you accuse me justly. In your presence I have always had a thought which I dared not show you. I did truly regard you as the possessor of the most valuable thing the world owns for me. I wished for it. I tried for it, sir. I ask for it now. John, you ask much? Very much, sir. It must come from your generosity as a gift, from your justice as a reward. I can never earn it. I listen to the Highland tongue, said Mr. Home. Look up, Polly. Answer this brow war. Send him away. She looked up. She shyly glanced at her eager, handsome suitor. She gazed tenderly on her furrowed sire. Papa, I love you both, said she. I can take care of you both. I need not send Graham away. He can live here. He will be no inconvenience she alleged with that simplicity of phraseology which at times was wont to make both her father and graham smile they smiled now he will be a prodigious inconvenience to me still persisted mr home i don't want him polly he's too tall he's in my way tell him to march you will get used to him papa he seemed exceedingly tall to me at first like a tower when i looked up at him but on the whole I would rather not have him otherwise. I object to him altogether, Polly. I can do without a son-in-law. I should never have requested the best man in the land to stand to me in that relation. Dismiss this gentleman. But he has known you so long, Papa, and suits you so well. Suits me, forsooth. Yes, he has pretended to make my opinions and tastes his own. He has humoured me for good reasons. I think, Polly, you and I will bid him good-bye. 
till tomorrow only. Shake hands with Grandpapa. No, I think not. I am not friends with him. Don't think to coax me between you. Indeed, indeed, you are friends. Graham, stretch out your right hand. Papa, put out yours. Now let them touch. Papa, don't be stiff. Close your fingers. Be pliant. There. But that is not a clasp. It is a grasp. Papa, you grasp like a vice. You crush Graham's hand to the bone. You hurt him. He must have hurt him, for he wore a massive ring, set round with brilliance, of which the sharp facets cut into Graham's flesh and drew blood. But pain only made Dr. John laugh, as anxiety had made him smile. Come with me into my study, at last said Mr. Home to the doctor. They went. Their intercourse was not long, but I suppose it was conclusive. The suitor had to undergo an interrogatory and a scrutiny on many things. Whether Dr. Breton was at times guileful in look and language or not, there was a sound foundation below. His answers, I understood afterwards, evinced both wisdom and integrity. He had managed his affairs well. He had struggled through entanglements. His fortunes were in the way of retrieval. He proved himself in a position to marry. Once more the father and lover appeared in the library. Monsieur de Bassompierre shut the door. He pointed to his daughter. Take her, he said. Take her, John Breton, and may God deal with you as you deal with her. Not long after, perhaps a fortnight, I saw three persons, Count de Bassompierre, his daughter, and Dr. Graham Breton sitting on one seat, under a low-spreading and umbrageous tree, in the grounds of the palace at bois le -Ton. They had come thither to enjoy a summer evening. Outside the magnificent gates their carriage waited to take them home. The green sweeps of turf spread round them quiet and dim. The palace rose at a distance. White as a crag on Pentelicus, the evening star shone above it. A forest of flowering shrubs embalmed the climate of this spot. The hour was still and sweet. The scene, but for this group, was solitary. Paulina sat between the two gentlemen. While they conversed, her little hands were busy at some work. I thought at first she was binding a nosegay. No. With the tiny pair of scissors glittering in her lap, she had severed spoils from each manly head beside her, and was now occupied in plaiting together the grey lock and the golden wave. The plate woven, no silk thread being at hand to bind it, a tress of her own hair was made to serve that purpose. She tied it like a knot, prisoned it in a locket, and laid it on her heart. Now, said she, there is an amulet made which has virtue to keep you two always friends. You can never quarrel so long as I wear this. An amulet was indeed made, a spell framed, which rendered enmity impossible. She was become a bond to both, an influence over each, a mutual concord. From them she drew her happiness, and what she borrowed she with interest gave back. Is there indeed such happiness on earth? I asked, as I watched the father, the daughter, the future husband, now united, all blessed and blessing. Yes, it is so. Without any colouring of romance, or any exaggeration of fancy, it is so. Some real lives do, for some certain days or years, actually anticipate the happiness of heaven, and, I believe, if such perfect happiness is once felt by good people, to the wicked it never comes, its sweet effect is never wholly lost. Whatever trials follow, Whatever pains of sickness or shades of death, the glory precedent still shines through, cheering the keen anguish and tinging the deep cloud. I will go farther. I do believe there are some human beings so born, so reared, so guided from a soft cradle to a calm and late grave, that no excessive suffering penetrates their lot, and no tempestuous blackness overcasts their journey. And often these are not pampered, selfish beings, but nature's elect, harmonious and benign, men and women mild with charity, kind agents of God's kind attributes. Let me not delay the happy truth. Graham Breton and Paulina de Bassompierre were married. 
and such an agent did Dr. Breton prove. He did not with time degenerate. His faults decayed, his virtues ripened. He rose in intellectual refinement, he won in moral profit. All dregs filtered away, the clear wine settled bright and tranquil. Bright, too, was the destiny of his sweet wife. She kept her husband's love, she aided in his progress. Of his happiness she was the cornerstone. This pair was blessed indeed, for years brought them with great prosperity great goodness. They imparted with open hand yet wisely. Doubtless they knew crosses, disappointments, difficulties. But these were well born. More than once, too, they had to look on him whose face flesh scarce can see and live. They had to pay their tribute to the King of Terrors. In the fullness of years, Monsieur de Bassompierre was taken. In ripe old age departed Louisa Breton. Once even there rose a cry in their halls of Rachel weeping for her children. But others sprang healthy and blooming to replace the lost. Dr. Breton saw himself live again in a son, who inherited his looks and his disposition. He had stately daughters, too, like himself. These children he reared with a suave yet a firm hand. They grew up according to inheritance and nurture. In short, I do but speak the truth when I say that these two lives of Graham and Paulina were blessed, like that of Jacob's favoured son, with blessings of heaven above, blessings of the deep that lies under. It was so, for God saw that it was good. End of chapter 37chapter 38 of Villette. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Villette by Charlotte Bronte. Chapter 38. Cloud. But it is not so for all. What then? His will be done, as done it surely will be, whether we humble ourselves to resignation or not. The impulse of creation forwards it. The strength of powers, seen and unseen, has its fulfilment in charge. Proof of a life to come must be given. In fire and in blood, if needful, must that proof be written. In fire and in blood do we trace the record throughout nature. In fire and in blood does it cross our own experience. Sufferer, faint not through terror of this burning evidence. Tired wayfarer, gird up thy loins, Look upward, march onward. Pilgrims and brother mourners, join in friendly company. Dark through the wilderness of this world stretches the way for most of us. Equal and steady be our tread, be our cross our banner. For staff we have his promise, whose word is tried, whose way perfect. For present hope his providence, who gives the shield of salvation, whose gentleness makes great, for final home, his bosom, who dwells in the height of heaven, for crowning prize, a glory exceeding and eternal. Let us so run that we may obtain, let us endure hardness as good soldiers, let us finish our course, and keep the faith, reliant in the issue to come off more than conquerors. Art thou not from everlasting, mine holy one? We shall not die. On a Thursday morning we were all assembled in class, waiting for the lesson of literature. The hour was come. We expected the master. The pupils of the first class sat very still. The cleanly written compositions, prepared since the last lesson, lay ready before them, neatly tied with ribbon, waiting to be gathered by the hand of the professor as he made his rapid round of the desks. The month was July, the morning fine. The glass door stood ajar. Through it played a fresh breeze, and plants growing at the lintel waved, bent, looked in, seeming to whisper tidings. Monsieur Emmanuel was not always quite punctual. 
we scarcely wondered at his being a little late but we wondered when the door at last opened and instead of him with his swiftness and his fire there came quietly upon us the cautious madame beck she approached monsieur paul's desk she stood before it she drew round her the light shawl covering her shoulders beginning to speak in low yet firm tones and with a fixed gaze she said this morning there will be no lesson of literature the second paragraph of her address followed after about two minutes pause it is probable the lessons will be suspended for a week i shall require at least that space of time to find an efficient substitute for monsieur emmanuel meanwhile it shall be our study to fill the blanks usefully your professor ladies she went on intends if possible duly to take leave of you at the present moment he has not leisure for that ceremony he is preparing for a long voyage a very sudden and urgent summons of duty calls him to a great distance he has decided to leave europe for an indefinite time perhaps he may tell you more himself ladies instead of the usual lesson with monsieur emmanuel you will this morning read english with mademoiselle lucy she bent her head courteously drew closer the folds of her shawl and passed from the class a great silence fell then a murmur went round the room i believe some pupils wept some time elapsed the noise the whispering the occasional sobbing increased i became conscious of a relaxation of discipline a sort of growing disorder as if my girls felt that vigilance was withdrawn and that surveillance had virtually left the class habit and the sense of duty enabled me to rally quickly to rise in my usual way to speak in my usual tone to enjoin and finally to establish quiet i made the english reading long and close i kept them at it the whole morning i remember feeling a sentiment of impatience towards the pupils who sobbed indeed their emotion was not of much value it was only an hysteric agitation i told them so unsparingly i half ridiculed them i was severe the truth was i could not do with their tears or that gasping sound i could not bear it a rather weak-minded low-spirited pupil kept it up when the others had done relentless necessity obliged and assisted me so to accost her that she dared not carry on the demonstration that she was forced to conquer the convulsion that girl would have had a right to hate me except that when school was over and her companions departing i ordered her to stay and when they were gone i did what i had never done to one among them before pressed her to my heart and kissed her cheek but this impulse yielded to i speedily put her out of the class for upon that poignant strain she wept more bitterly than ever i filled with occupation every minute of that day and should have liked to sit up all night if i might have kept a candle burning the night however proved a bad time and left bad effects preparing me ill for the next day's ordeal of insufferable gossip of course this news fell under general discussion some little reserve had accompanied the first surprise that soon wore off every mouth opened every tongue wagged teachers pupils the very servants mouthed the name of emmanuel he whose connection with the school was contemporary with its commencement thus suddenly to withdraw all felt it strange they talked so much so long so often that out of the very multitude of their words and rumours grew at last some intelligence about the third day i heard it said that he was to sail in a week then that he was bound for the west indies i looked at madame beck's face and into her eyes for disproof or confirmation of this report i perused her all over for information but no part of her disclosed more than what was unperturbed and commonplace this secession was an immense loss to her she alleged 
she did not know how she should fill up the vacancy. She was so used to her kinsman, he had become her right hand. What should she do without him? She had opposed this step, but Monsieur Paul had convinced her it was his duty. She said all this in public, in class, at the dinner-table, speaking audibly to Zélie St. Pierre. Why was it his duty? I could have asked her that. I had impulses to take hold of her suddenly, as she calmly passed me in class, to stretch out my hand and grasp her fast and say, Stop! Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Why is it his duty to go into banishment? But Madame always addressed some other teacher, and never looked at me, never seemed conscious I could have a care in the question. The week wore on. Nothing more was said about Monsieur Emmanuel coming to bid us good-bye, and none seemed anxious for his coming. None questioned whether or not he would come. None betrayed torment lest he should depart silent and unseen. Incessantly did they talk, and never in all their talk touched on this vital point. As to Madame, she of course could see him, and say to him as much as she pleased. What should she care whether or not he appeared in the schoolroom? The week consumed. We were told that he was going on such a day, that his destination was Bastia in Guadeloupe. The business which called him abroad related to a friend's interests, not his own. I thought as much. Bastia in Guadeloupe. I had little sleep about this time, but whenever I did slumber it followed infallibly that I was quickly roused with a start, while the words Bastia, Guadeloupe, seemed pronounced over my pillow, or ran athwart the darkness round and before me in zigzag characters of red or violet light. For what I felt there was no help, and how could I help feeling? Monsieur Emmanuel had been very kind to me of late days. He had been growing hourly better and kinder. It was now a month since we had settled the theological difference, and in all that time there had been no quarrel. Nor had our peace been the cold daughter of divorce. We had not lived aloof. He had come oftener, he had talked with me more than before. He had spent hours with me, with temper soothed, with eye content, with manner homelike and mild. Kind subjects of conversation had grown between us. He had inquired into my plans of life, and I had communicated them. The school project pleased him. He made me repeat it more than once, though he called it an Alnishar dream. The jar was over. The mutual understanding was settling and fixing. Feelings of union and hope made themselves profoundly felt in the heart. Affection and deep esteem and dawning trust had each fastened its bond. What quiet lessons I had about this time! No more taunts on my intellect, no more menaces of grating public shows. How sweetly, for the jealous gibe and the more jealous, half-passionate eulogy, were substituted a mute, indulgent help, a fond guidance, and a tender forbearance which forgave but never praised. There were times when he would sit for many minutes and not speak at all, and when dusk or duty brought separation, he would leave with words like these. Il est doux le repos. Il est précieux, le calme bonheur. One evening, not ten short days since, he joined me whilst walking in my alley. He took my hand. I looked up in his face. I thought he meant to arrest my attention. Bonne petite amie, said he softly. Douce consolatrice. But through his touch, and with his words, a new feeling and a strange thought found a course. Could it be that he was becoming more than friend or brother? Did his look speak a kindness beyond fraternity or amity? His eloquent look had more to say. His hand drew me forward. His interpreting lips stirred. No, 
not now. Here into the twilight alley broke an interruption. It came dual and ominous. We faced two bodeful forms, a woman's and a priest's, Madame Beck and Père Silas. The aspect of the latter I shall never forget. On the first impulse it expressed a Jean-Jacques sensibility, stirred by the signs of affection just surprised, then immediately darkened over it the jaundice of ecclesiastical jealousy. He spoke to me with unction. He looked on his pupil with sternness. As to Madame Beck, she, of course, saw nothing. Nothing, though her kinsman retained in her presence the hand of the heretic foreigner, not suffering withdrawal, but clasping it close and fast. Following these incidents, that sudden announcement of departure had struck me at first as incredible. Indeed, it was only frequent repetition and the credence of the hundred and fifty minds round me which forced on me its full acceptance. As to that week of suspense with its blank yet burning days, which brought from him no word of explanation, I remember, but I cannot describe its passage. The last day broke. Now would he visit us. Now he would come and speak his farewell, or he would vanish mute and be seen by us never more. This alternative seemed to be present in the mind of not a living creature in that school. All rose at the usual hour, or breakfasted as usual, or without reference to or apparent thought of their late professor, betook themselves with wanted phlegm to their ordinary duties. So oblivious was the house, so tame, so trained its proceedings, so inexpectant its aspect. I scarce knew how to breathe in an atmosphere thus stagnant, thus smothering. Would no one lend me a voice? Had no one a wish, no one a word, no one a prayer to which I could say amen? I had seen them unanimous in demand for the merest trifle, a treat, a holiday, a lesson's remission. They could not, they would not now band to besiege Madame Beck, and insist on a last interview with a master who had certainly been loved, at least by some, loved as they could love. But, oh, what is the love of the multitude? I knew where he lived. I knew where he was to be heard of, or communicated with. The distance was scarce a stone's throw. Had it been in the next room, unsummoned I could make no use of my knowledge. To follow, to seek out, to remind, to recall. For these things I had no faculty. Monsieur Emmanuel might have passed within reach of my arm. Had he passed silent and unnoticing? Silent and stirless should I have suffered him to go by. Morning wasted. Afternoon came, and I thought all was over. My heart trembled in its place. My blood was troubled in its current. I was quite sick, and hardly knew how to keep at my post or do my work. Yet the little world round me plodded on indifferent. All seemed jocund, free of care or fear or thought. The very pupils who seven days since had wept hysterically at a startling piece of news appeared quite to have forgotten the news, its import, and their emotion. A little before five o'clock, the hour of dismissal, Madame Beck sent for me to her chamber, to read over and translate some English letter she had received, and to write for her the answer. Before settling to this work, I observed that she softly closed the two doors of her chamber. She even shut and fastened the casement, though it was a hot day, and free circulation of air was usually regarded by her as indispensable. Why this precaution? A keen suspicion, an almost fierce distrust, suggested such question. Did she want to exclude sound? What sound? I listened as I had never listened before. I listened like the evening and winter wolf, snuffing the snow, scenting prey and hearing far off the traveller's tramp. Yet I could both listen and write. 
About the middle of the letter I heard what checked my pen, a tread in the vestibule. No doorbell had rung. Rosine, acting doubtless by orders, had anticipated such réveillé. Madame saw me halt. She coughed, made a bustle, spoke louder. The tread had passed on to the classes. Proceed, said Madame. But my hand was fettered, my ear enchained, my thoughts were carried off captive. The classes formed another building. The hall parted them from the dwelling-house. Despite distance and partition, I heard the sudden stir of numbers, a whole division rising at once. They are putting away work, said Madame. It was indeed the hour to put away work. But why that sudden hush, that instant quell of the tumult? Wait, madame, I will see what it is. And I put down my pen and left her. Left her? No, she would not be left. Powerless to detain me, she rose and followed, close as my shadow. I turned on the last step of the stair. Are you coming too? I asked. Yes, said she meeting my glance with a peculiar aspect, a look clouded yet resolute. We proceeded then, not together, but she walked in my steps. He was come. Entering the first class I saw him. There once more appeared the form most familiar. I doubt not they had tried to keep him away, but he was come. The girls stood in a semicircle. He was passing round, giving his farewells, pressing each hand, touching with his lips each cheek. This last ceremony foreign custom permitted at such a parting, so solemn to last so long. I felt it hard that Madame Beck should dog me thus, following and watching me close. My neck and shoulder shrunk in fever under her breath. I became terribly goaded. He was approaching. The semicircle was almost travelled round. He came to the last pupil. He turned. But Madame was before me. She had stepped out suddenly. She seemed to magnify her proportions and amplify her drapery. She eclipsed me. I was hid. She knew my weakness and deficiency. She could calculate the degree of moral paralysis, the total default of self-assertion, with which in a crisis I could be struck. She hastened to her kinsman, she broke upon him volubly, she mastered his attention, she hurried him to the door, the glass door opening on the garden. I think he looked round. Could I but have caught his eye, courage, I think, would have rushed in to aid feeling, and there would have been a charge, and perhaps a rescue. But already the room was all confusion, the semicircle broken into groups. My figure was lost among thirty more conspicuous. Madame had her will. Yes, she got him away, and he had not seen me. He thought me absent. Five o'clock struck. The loud dismissal bell rang. The school separated, the room emptied. There seems to my memory an entire darkness and distraction in some certain minutes I then passed alone, a grief inexpressible over a loss unendurable. What should I do? Oh, what should I do when all my life's hope was thus torn by the roots out of my riven, outraged heart? What I should have done, I know not, when a little child, the least child in the school, broke with its simplicity and its unconsciousness into the raging yet silent centre of that inward conflict. Mademoiselle, lisped the treble voice, I am to give you that. Monsieur Paul said I was to seek you all over the house from the grenier to the cellar, and when I found you, to give you that. And the child delivered a note. The little dove dropped on my knee its olive leaf plucked off. I found neither address nor name, only these words. It was not my intention to take leave of you when I said good-bye to the rest, but I hope to see you in class. I was disappointed. The interview is deferred. Be ready for me. Ere I sail, I must see you at leisure and speak with you at length. 
be ready my moments are numbered and just now monopolized besides i have a private business on hand which i will not share with any nor communicate even to you paul be ready then it must be this evening was he not to go on the morrow yes of that point i was certain i had seen the date of his vessel's departure advertised oh i would be ready but could that longed-for meeting really be achieved the time was so short the schemers seemed so watchful so active so hostile the way of access appeared straight as a gully deep as a chasm apollyon straddled across it breathing flames could my great heart overcome could my guide reach me who might tell yet i began to take some courage some comfort it seemed to me that i felt a pulse of his heart beating yet true to the whole throb of mine i waited my champion apollyon came trailing his hell behind him i think if eternity held torment its form would not be fiery rack nor its nature despair i think that on a certain day amongst those days which never dawned and will not set an angel entered hades stood shone smiled delivered a prophecy of conditional pardon kindled a doubtful hope of bliss to come not now but at a day and hour unlooked for revealed in his own glory and grandeur the height and compass of his promise spoke thus then towering became a star and vanished into his own heaven his legacy was suspense a worse boon than despair all that evening i waited trusting in the dove sent olive leaf yet in the midst of my trust terribly fearing my fear pressed heavy cold and peculiar i knew it for the partner of a rarely belied presentiment the first hours seemed long and slow in spirit i clung to the flying skirts of the last they passed like drift cloud like the rack scudding before a storm they passed all the long hot summer day burned away like a yule log the crimson of its clothes perished i was left bent among the cool blue shades over the pale and ashen gleams of its night prayers were over it was bedtime my co-inmates were all retired i still remained in the gloomy first class forgetting or at least disregarding rules i had never forgotten or disregarded before how long i paced that class i cannot tell i must have been afoot many hours mechanically had i moved aside benches and desks and had made for myself a path down its length there i walked and there when certain that the whole household were abed and quite out of hearing there i at last wept reliant on night confiding in solitude i kept my tears sealed my sobs chained no longer they heaved my heart they tore their way in this house what grief could be sacred soon after eleven o'clock a very late hour in the rue fossette the door unclosed quietly but not stealthily a lamp's flame invaded the moonlight madame beck entered with the same composed air as if coming on an ordinary occasion at an ordinary season instead of at once addressing me she went to her desk took her keys and seemed to seek something she loitered over this feigned search long too long she was calm too calm my mood scarce endured the pretence driven beyond common range two hours since had i left behind me wanted respects and fears led by a touch and ruled by a word under usual circumstances no yoke could now be borne no curb obeyed it is more than time for retirement said madame the rule of the house has already been transgressed too long madame met no answer i did not check my walk when she came in my way i put her out of it let me persuade you to calm miss let me lead you to your chamber said she trying to speak softly no i said neither you nor another shall persuade or lead me 
your bed shall be warmed gothon is sitting up still she shall make you comfortable she shall give you a sedative madame i broke out you are a sensualist under all your serenity your peace and your decorum you are an undenied sensualist make your own bed warm and soft take sedatives and meats and drink spiced and sweet as much as you will if you have any sorrow or disappointment and perhaps you have nay i know you have seek your own palliatives and your own chosen resources leave me however leave me i say i must send another to watch you miss i must send Gauton. i forbid it let me alone keep your hand off me and my life and my troubles oh madame in your hand there is both chill and poison you envenom and you paralyse what have i done miss you must not marry paul he cannot marry dog in the manger i said for i knew she secretly wanted him and had always wanted him she called him insupportable she rallied at him for a devil she did not love but she wanted to marry that she might bind him to her interest deep into some of madame's secrets i had entered i know not how by an intuition or an inspiration which came to me i know not whence in the course of living with her too i had slowly learned that unless with an inferior she must ever be a rival she was my rival heart and soul though secretly under the smoothest bearing and utterly unknown to all save her and myself two minutes i stood over madame feeling that the whole woman was in my power because in some moods such as the present in some stimulated states of perception like that of this instant her habitual disguise her mask and her domino were to me a mere network reticulated with holes and i saw underneath a being heartless self-indulgent and ignoble she quietly retreated from me meek and self-possessed though very uneasy she said if i would not be persuaded to take rest she must reluctantly leave me which she did incontinent perhaps even more glad to get away than i was to see her vanish this was the sole flash eliciting truth exhorting rencontre which ever occurred between me and madame beck the short night scene was never repeated it did not one whit change her manner to me i do not know that she revenged it i do not know that she hated me the worse for my fell candour i think she bucklered herself with the secret philosophy of her strong mind and resolved to forget what it irked her to remember i know that to the end of our mutual lives there occurred no repetition of no allusion to that fiery passage that night passed all nights even the starless nights before dissolution must wear away about six o'clock the hour which called up the household i went out to the court and washed my face in its cold fresh well water entering by the carré a piece of mirror glass set in an oaken cabinet repeated my image it said i was changed my cheeks and lips were sodden white my eyes were glassy and my eyelids swollen and purple on rejoining my companions i knew they all looked at me my heart seemed discovered to them i believed myself self-betrayed hideously certain did it seem that the very youngest of the school must guess why and for whom i despaired isabel the child whom i had once nursed in sickness approached me would she too mock me que vous êtes pas là vous êtes donc bien malade mademoiselle said she putting her finger in her mouth and staring with a wistful stupidity which at the moment seemed to me more beautiful than the keenest intelligence isabel did not long stand alone in the recommendation of ignorance before the day was over i gathered cause of gratitude towards the whole blind household the multitude have something else to do than to read hearts and interpret dark sayings who wills may keep his own counsel be his own secret sovereign in the course of that day proof met me on proof not only that the cause of my present sorrow was unguessed 
but that my whole inner life for the last six months was still mine only. It was not known, it had not been noted, that I held in peculiar value one life among all lives. Gossip had passed me by, curiosity had looked me over, both subtle influences, hovering always round, had never become centred upon me. A given organization may live in a full-fever hospital and escape typhus. Monsieur Emmanuel had come and gone. I had been taught and sought. In season and out of season he had called me, and I had obeyed him. Monsieur Paul wants Miss Lucy. Miss Lucy is with Monsieur Paul. Such had been the perpetual bulletin, and nobody commented, far less condemned. Nobody hinted, nobody jested. Madame Beck read the riddle, none else resolved it. What I now suffered was called illness, a headache. I accepted the baptism. But what bodily illness was ever like this pain? This certainty that he was gone without a farewell, this cruel conviction that fate and pursuing furies, a woman's envy and a priest's bigotry, would suffer me to see him no more. What wonder that the second evening found me like the first, untamed, tortured, again pacing a solitary room in an unalterable passion of silent desolation. Madame Beck did not herself summon me to bed that night. She did not come near me. She sent Ginevra Farnshaw, a more efficient agent for the purpose she could not have employed. Ginevra's first words, Is your headache very bad tonight? For Ginevra, like the rest, thought I had a headache, an intolerable headache which made me frightfully white in the face and insanely restless in the foot. Her first words, I say, inspired the impulse to flee anywhere so that it were only out of reach, and soon what followed, plaints about her own headaches, completed the business. I went upstairs. Presently I was in my bed, my miserable bed, haunted with quick scorpions. I had not been laid down five minutes, when another emissary arrived. Gautin came, bringing me something to drink. I was consumed with thirst. I drank eagerly. The beverage was sweet, but I tasted a drug. Madame says it will make you sleep, Chouchou, said Gautin, as she received back the emptied cup. Ah, the sedative had been administered. In fact, they had given me a strong opiate. I was to be held quiet for one night. The household came to bed. The night light was lit, the dormitory hushed. Sleep soon reigned. Over those pillows sleep won an easy supremacy. Contented sovereign over heads and hearts which did not ache, he passed by the unquiet. The drug wrought. I know not whether Madame had overcharged or undercharged the dose. Its result was not that she intended. Instead of stupor came excitement. I became alive to new thought, to reverie peculiar in colouring. A gathering call ran among the faculties. Their bugles sang, their trumpets rang an untimely summons. Imagination was roused from her rest, and she came forth impetuous and venturous. With scorn she looked on matter, her mate. Rise, she said. Sluggard, this night I will have my will, Sh nor shalt thou prevail. Look forth and view the night, was her cry, and when I lifted the heavy blind from the casement close at hand, with her own royal gesture she showed me a moon supreme, and an element deep and splendid. To my gasping senses she made the glimmering gloom, the narrow limits, the oppressive heat of the dormitory intolerable. She lured me to leave this den and follow her forth and to do coolness and glory. She brought me upon a strange vision of Villette at midnight. Especially she showed me the park, the summer park, with its long alleys all silent, lone, and safe. Among these lay a huge stone basin, that basin I knew, and beside which I had often stood, deep set in the tree shadows, brimming with cool water clear with a green leafy rushy bed what of all this the park gates were shut up locked sentinelled the place could not be entered could it not 
a point worth considering, and while resolving it I mechanically dressed. Utterly incapable of sleeping or lying still, excited from head to foot, what could I do better than dress? The gates were locked, soldiers set before them. Was there then no admission to the park? The other day in walking past, I had seen, without then attending to the circumstance, a gap in the paling, one stake broken down. I now saw this gap again in recollection, saw it very plainly, the narrow, irregular aperture visible between the stems of the lindens, planted orderly as a call on aid. A man could not have made his way through that aperture, nor could a stout woman, perhaps not Madame Beck, but I thought I might. I fancied I should like to try, and once within, at this hour, the whole park would be mine, the moonlight midnight park. How soundly the dormitory slept! What deep slumbers! What quiet breathing! How very still the whole large house! What was the time? I felt restless to know. There stood a clock in the class below. What hindered me from venturing down to consult it? By such a moon its large white face and jet-black figures must be vividly distinct. As for hindrance to this step, there offered not so much as a creaking hinge or a clicking latch. On these hot July nights close air could not be tolerated, and the chamber door stood wide open. Will the dormitory planks sustain my tread on traitorous? Yes, I know wherever a board is loose, and will avoid it. The oak staircase creaks somewhat as I descend, but not much. I am in the carré. The great class doors are close shut. They are bolted. On the other hand, the entrance to the corridor stands open. The classes seem to my thought great dreary jails, buried far back beyond thoroughfares, and for me filled with spectral and intolerable memories, laid miserable amongst their straw and their manacles. The corridor offers a cheerful vista, leading to the high vestibule which opens direct upon the street. Hush! The clock strikes. Ghostly deep as is the stillness of this convent, it is only eleven. While my ear follows to silence the hum of the last stroke, I catch faintly from the built-out capital a sound like bells, or like a band, a sound where sweetness, where victory, where mourning blend. Oh, to approach this music nearer, to listen to it alone by the rushy basin! Let me go! Oh, let me go! What hinders, what does not aid freedom? There, in the corridor, hangs my garden costume, my large hat, my shawl. There is no lock on the huge, heavy porte-cochere. There is no key to seek. It fastens with a sort of spring-bolt, not to be opened from the outside, but which, from within, may be noiselessly withdrawn. Can I manage it? It yields to my hand, yields with propitious facility. I wonder, as that portal seems almost spontaneously to unclose, I wonder as I cross the threshold and step on the paved street, wonder at the strange ease with which this prison has been forced. It seems as if I had been pioneered invisibly, as if some dissolving force had gone before me. For myself I have scarce made an effort. Quiet, Rufosset! I find on this pavement that wanderer wooing summer night, of which I mused. I see its moon over me. I feel its dew in the air. But here I cannot stay. I am still too near old haunts. So close under the dungeon I can hear the prisoners moan. This solemn peace is not what I seek. It is not what I can bear. To me the face of that sky bears the aspect of a world's death. The park also will be calm. I know a mortal serenity prevails everywhere. Yet let me seek the park. I took a route well known, and went up towards the palatial and royal Hauteville. Thence the music I had heard certainly floated. It was hushed now, but it might rewaken. I went on. Neither band nor bell music came to meet me. Another sound replaced it, a sound like a strong tide, a great flow, deepening as I proceeded. Light broke, movement gathered, chimes pealed. To what was I coming? 
entering on the level of a grand place, I found myself, with the suddenness of magic, plunged amidst a gay, living, joyous crowd. Villette is one blaze, one broad illumination. The whole world seems abroad. Moonlight and heaven are banished. The town, by her own flambeau, beholds her own splendour. Gay dresses, grand equipages, fine horses and gallant riders throng the bright streets. I see even scores of masks. It is a strange scene, stranger than dreams. But where is the park? I ought to be near it. In the midst of this glare the park must be shadowy and calm. There, at least, are neither torches, lamps, nor crowd. I was asking this question when an open carriage passed me, filled with known faces. Through the deep throng it could pass but slowly. The spirited horses fretted in their curbed ardour. I saw the occupants of that carriage well. Me they could not see, or at least not know. Folded close in my large shawl, screened with my straw hat, in that motley crowd no dress was noticeably strange. I saw the Count de Bassompierre. I saw my godmother, handsomely apparelled, comely and cheerful. I saw, too, Paulina Mary, compassed with the triple halo of her beauty, her youth, and her happiness. In looking on her countenance of joy and eyes of festal light, one scarce remembered to note the gala elegance of what she wore. I only know that the drapery floating about her was all white and light and bridal. Seated opposite to her, I saw a grand Breton. It was in looking up at him her aspect had caught its lustre. The light repeated in her eyes, beamed first out of his. It gave me strange pleasure to follow these friends viewlessly, and I did follow them, as I thought, to the park. I watched them alight, carriages were inadmissible, amidst new and unanticipated splendours. Lo! The iron gateway between the stone columns was spanned by a flaming arch built of massed stars, and following them cautiously beneath that arch, where were they, and where was I? In a land of enchantment, a garden most gorgeous, a plain sprinkled with coloured meteors, a forest with sparks of purple and ruby and golden fire gemming the foliage, a region not of trees and shadow, but of strangest architectural wealth of altar and of temple, of pyramid, obelisk, and sphinx. Incredible to say, the wonders and the symbols of Egypt teemed throughout the park of Villette. No matter that in five minutes the secret was mine, the key of the mystery picked up and its illusion unveiled. No matter that I quickly recognized the material of these solemn fragments, the timber, the paint, and the pasteboard, these inevitable discoveries failed to quite destroy the charm or undermine the marvel of that night. No matter that I now seized the explanation of the whole great fete, a fete of which the conventual Rue Fossette had not tasted, though it had opened at dawn that morning, and was still in full vigour near midnight. In past days there had been, said history, an awful crisis in the fate of Le Bassacur, involving I know not what peril to the rights and liberties of her gallant citizens. Rumours of wars there had been, if not wars themselves, a kind of struggling in the streets, a bustle running to and fro, some rearing of barricades, some burger rioting, some calling out of troops, much interchange of brickbats, and even a little of shot. Tradition held that patriots had fallen, and the old basse ville was shown an enclosure, solemnly built in and set apart, holding, it was said, the sacred bones of martyrs. Be this as it may, a certain day in the year was still kept as a festival in honour of the said patriots and martyrs of somewhat apocryphal memory, the morning being given to a solemn te deum in St. Jean-Baptiste, the evening devoted to spectacles, decorations, and illuminations, such as these I now saw. While looking up to the image of a white ibis fixed on a column, while fathoming the deep, torch-lit perspective of an avenue at the close of which was couched a sphinx, I lost sight of the party which, from the middle of the great square, I had followed, or rather they vanished like a group of apparitions. 
On this whole scene was impressed a dream-like character. Every shape was wavering, every movement floating, every voice echo-like, half mocking, half uncertain. Paulina and her friends been gone, I scarce could avouch that I had really seen them. Nor did I miss them as guides through the chaos, far less regret them as protectors amidst the night. That festal night would have been safe for a very child. Half the peasantry had come in from the outlying environs of Alette, and the decent burghers were all abroad and around, dressed in their best. My straw hat passed amidst cap and jacket, short petticoat and long calico mantle, without perhaps attracting a glance. I only took the precaution to bind down the broad leaf gypsy-wise, with a supplementary ribbon, and then I felt safe as if masked. Safe I passed down the avenues, safe I mixed with the crowd where it was deepest. To be still was not in my power, nor quietly to observe. I took a revel of the scene. I drank the elastic night air, the swell of sound, the dubious light, now flashing, now fading. As to happiness or hope, they and I had shaken hands, but just now I scorned despair. My vague aim, as I went, was to find the stone basin, with its clear depth and green lining. That coolness and verdure I thought with the passionate thirst of unconscious fever. Amidst the glare and hurry and throng and noise, I still secretly and chiefly longed to come on that circular mirror of crystal, and surprise the moon glassing therein her pearly front. I knew my route, yet it seemed as if I was hindered from pursuing it direct. Now a sight and now a sound called me aside, luring me down this alley and down that. Already I saw the thick planted trees which framed this tremulous and rippled glass, when— Quiring out of a glade to the right broke such a sound as I thought might be heard if heaven were to open, such a sound perhaps as was heard above the plain of Bethlehem on the night of glad tidings. The song, the sweet music, rose afar, but rushing swiftly on fast strengthening pinions, there swept through these shades so full a storm of harmonies that had no tree been near against which to lean. I think I must have dropped. Voices were there, it seemed to me, unnumbered, instruments varied and countless. Bugle, horn, and trumpet I knew. The effect was as a sea breaking into song with all its waves. The swaying tide swept this way, and then it fell back, and I followed its retreat. It led me toward a Byzantine building, a sort of kiosk near the park centre. Round about stood crowded thousands— gathered to a grand concert in the open air. What I heard was, I think, a wild Jaeger chorus. The night, the space, the scene, and my own mood had but enhanced the sounds in their impression. Here were assembled ladies, looking by this light most beautiful. Some of their dresses were gauzy, and some had the sheen of satin. The flowers in the blonde trembled, and the veils waved about their decorated bonnets, as that host-like chorus, with its greatly gathering sound, sundered the air above them. Most of these ladies occupied the little light park chairs, and behind them and beside them stood guardian gentlemen. The outer ranks of the crowd were made up of citizens, plebeians, and police. In this outer rank I took my place. I rather liked to find myself the silent, unknown, consequently unaccosted neighbour of the short petticoat and the sabot, and only the distant gazer, the silk robe, the velvet mantle, and the plumed chapeau. Amidst so much life and joy, too, it suited me to be alone, quite alone. Having neither wish nor power to force my way through a mass so close-packed, my station was on the farthest confines, where indeed I might hear, but could see little. "'Mademoiselle is not well placed,' said a voice at my elbow. Who dared accost me, a being in a mood so little social? I turned rather to repel than to reply. I saw a man, a burgher, an entire stranger, as I deemed him for one moment, but the next recognized in him a certain tradesman, a bookseller, whose shop furnished the roof or set with its books and stationery, a man notorious in our pensionnat for the excessive brittleness of his temper, and frequent snappishness of his manner, even to us as principal customers. But whom, for my solitary self, I had ever been disposed to like, and had always found civil, 
sometimes kind once in aiding me about some troublesome little exchange of foreign money he had done me a service he was an intelligent man under his asperity he was a good-hearted man the thought had sometimes crossed me that a part of his nature bore affinity to a part of m emmanuel's whom he knew well and whom i had often seen sitting on Murray's counter turning over the current month's publications and it was in this affinity i read the explanation of that conciliatory feeling with which i instinctively regarded him strange to say this man knew me under my straw hat and closely folded shawl and though i deprecated the effort he insisted on making a way for me through the crowd and finding me a better situation he carried his disinterested civility further and from some quarter procured me a chair once and again i have found that the most cross-grained are by no means the worst of mankind nor the humblest in station the least polished in feeling this man in his courtesy seemed to find nothing strange in my being here alone only a reason for extending to me as far as he could a retiring yet efficient attention having secured me a place and a seat he withdrew without asking question without obtruding a remark without adding a superfluous word no wonder that Professor Emmanuel liked to take his cigar in his lounge, and to read his feuilleton in Monsieur Muret's shop. The two must have suited. I had not been seated five minutes, ere I became aware that chance and my worthy burgher friend had brought me once more within view of a familiar and domestic group. Right before me sat the Bretons and de Bassompierre's. Within reach of my hand, had I chosen to extend it, sat a figure like a fairy queen's whose array lilies and their leaves seemed to have suggested whatever was not spotless white being forest green my good mother too sat so near that had i leaned forward my breath might have stirred the ribbon of her bonnet they were too near having just been recognized by a comparative stranger i felt uneasy at this close vicinage of intimate acquaintance it made me quite start when mrs breton turning to mr home and speaking out of a kind impulse of memory said i wonder what my steady little lucy would say to all this if she were here i wish she had brought her she would have enjoyed it much so she would so she would in her grave sensible fashion it is a pity but we had asked her rejoined the kind gentleman and added i like to see her so quietly pleased so little moved yet so content dear were they both to me dear are they to this day in their remembered benevolence little knew they the rack of pain which had driven lucy almost into fever and brought her out guideless and reckless urged and drugged to the brink of frenzy i had half a mind to bend over the elders shoulders and answer their goodness with the thanks of my eyes monsieur de bassompierre did not well know me but i knew him and honoured and admired his nature with all its plain sincerity its warm affection and unconscious enthusiasm possibly i might have spoken but just then graham turned he turned with one of his stately firm movements so different from those of a sharp-tempered undersized man there was behind him a throng a hundred ranks deep there were thousands to meet his eyes and divide its scrutiny why then did he concentrate all on me oppressing me with the whole force of that full blue steadfast orb why if he would look did not one glance satisfy him why did he turn on his chair rest his elbow on its back and study me leisurely he could not see my face i held it down surely he could not recognize me i stooped i turned i would not be known he rose by some means he contrived to approach in two minutes he would have had my secret my identity would have been grasped between his never tyrannous but always powerful hands there was but one way to evade or to check him i implied by a sort of supplicatory gesture that it was my prayer to be let alone after that had he persisted he would perhaps have seen the spectacle of lucy incensed not all that was grand or good or kind in him and lucy felt the full amount 
should have kept her quite tame or absolutely inoffensive and shadow-like he looked but he desisted he shook his handsome head but he was mute he resumed his seat nor did he again turn or disturb me by a glance except indeed for one single instant when a look rather solicitous than curious stole my way speaking what somehow stilled my heart like the south wind quieting the earth cram's thoughts of me were not entirely those of frozen indifference after all i believe in that goodly mansion his heart he kept one little place under the skylights where lucy might have entertainment if she chose to call it was not so handsome as the chambers where he lodged his male friends it was not like the hall where he accommodated his philanthropy or the library where he treasured his science still less did it resemble the pavilion where his marriage feast was splendidly spread yet gradually by long and equal kindness he proved to me that he kept one little closet over the door of which was written lucy's room i kept a place for him too a place of which i never took the measure either by rule or compass i think it was like the tent of paris Banou. all my life long i carried it folded in the hollow of my hand yet released from that hold and constriction i know not but its innate capacity for expanse might have magnified it into a tabernacle for a host forbearing as he was to-night i could not stay in this proximity this dangerous place and seat must be given up i watched my opportunity rose and stole away he might think he might even believe that lucy was contained within that shawl and sheltered under that hat he never could be certain for he did not see my face surely the spirit of restlessness was by this time appeased had i not had enough of adventure did i not begin to flag quail and wish for safety under a roof not so i still loathed my bed in the school dormitory more than words can express i clung to whatever could distract thought somehow i felt too that the night's drama was but begun that the prologue was scarce spoken throughout this woody and turfy theatre reigned a shadow of mystery actors and incidents unlooked for waited behind the scenes i thought so foreboding told me as much straying at random obeying the push of every chance elbow i was brought to a quarter where trees planted in clusters or towering singly broke up somewhat the dense packing of the crowd and gave it a more scattered character these confines were far from the music and somewhat aloof even from the lamps but there was sound enough to soothe and with that full high moon lamps were scarce needed here I had chiefly settled family groups burger parents some of them late as was the hour actually surrounded by their children with whom it had not been thought advisable to venture into the closer throng three fine tall trees growing close almost twined stem within stem lifted a thick canopy of shade above a green knoll crowned with a seat a seat which might have held several yet it seemed abandoned to one the remaining members of the fortunate party in possession of this site standing dutifully round yet amongst this reverend circle was a lady holding by the hand a little girl when i caught sight of this little girl she was twisting herself round on her heel swinging from her conductress's hand flinging herself from side to side with wanton and fantastic gyrations these perverse movements arrested my attention they struck me as of a character fearfully familiar on close inspection no less so appeared the child's equipment the lilac silk pelisse the small swans-down boa the white bonnet the whole holiday toilette in short was the gala garb of a cherub but too well known of that tadpole desiree beck and desiree beck it was she or an imp in her likeness i might have taken this discovery as a thunderclap but such hyperbole would have been premature discovery was destined to rise more than one degree ere it reached its climax on whose hand could the amiable desiree swing thus selfishly whose glove could she tear thus recklessly 
whose arm thus strain with impunity, or on the borders of whose dress thus turn and trample insolently, if not the hand, glove, arm, and robe of her lady mother. And there, in an Indian shawl and a pale green crape bonnet, there, fresh, portly, blithe, and pleasant, there stood Madame Beck. Curious! I had certainly deemed Madame in her bed, and Desiree in her crib at this blessed minute, sleeping both of them. The sleep of the just, within the sacred walls, amidst the profound seclusion of the Rue Fossette. Most certainly also they did not picture Miss Lucy otherwise engaged. And here we all three were taking our air bar in the fete blazing park at midnight. The fact was, Madame was only acting according to her quite justifiable want. I remembered now, I had heard it said among the teachers, though without at the time particularly noticing the gossip, that often when we thought Madame in her chamber, sleeping, she was gone full dressed to take her pleasure at operas or plays or balls. Madame had no sort of taste for a monastic life, and took care, largely though discreetly, to season her existence with a relish of the world. Half a dozen gentlemen of her friends stood about her. Amongst these I was not slow to recognize two or three. There was her brother, Monsieur Victor Kint. There was another person, moustached and with long hair, a calm, taciturn man, but whose traits bore a stamp and a semblance I could not mark unmoved. Amidst reserve and phlegm, amidst contrasts of character and of countenance, Something there still was which recalled a face, mobile, fervent, feeling. A face changeable, now clouded and now alight, a face from my world taken away, for my eyes lost, and where my best spring hours of life had alternated in shadow and in glow. That face where I had often seen movements so near the sign of genius, that why there did not shine fully out the undoubted fire, the thing, the spirit, and the secret itself, I could never tell. Yes, this Joseph Emmanuel, this man of peace, reminded me of his ardent brother. Besides Messieurs Victor and Joseph, I knew another of this party. This third person stood behind and in the shade. His attitude, too, was stooping, yet his dress and bald white head made him the most conspicuous figure of the group. He was an ecclesiastic. He was Père Silas. Do not fancy, reader, that there was any inconsistency in the priest's presence at this fete. This was not considered a show of vanity fair, but a commemoration of patriotic sacrifice. The church patronized it, even with ostentation. There were troops of priests in the park that night. Père Silas stooped over the seat with its single occupant, the rustic bench and that which sat upon it. A strange mass it was, bearing no shape yet magnificent. You saw indeed the outline of her face and features, but these were so cadaverous and so strangely placed, you could almost have fancied a head severed from its trunk and flung at random on a pile of rich merchandise. The distant lamp rays glanced on clear pendants, on broad rings. Neither the chasteness of moonlight nor the distance of the torches could quite subdue the gorgeous dyes of the drapery. Hail, Madame Warravens. I think you looked more witch-like than ever. And presently the good lady proved that she was indeed no corpse or ghost, but a harsh and hardy old woman, for upon some aggravation in the clamorous petition of Desiree Beck to her mother to go to the kiosk and take sweetmeats, the hunchback suddenly fetched her a resounding rap with her gold-knobbed cane. There, then, were Madame Warravens, Madame Beck, Pear Silas, the whole conjuration, the secret junta, the sight of them thus assembled did me good. I cannot say that I felt weak before them, or abashed, or dismayed. They outnumbered me, and I was worsted and under their feet. But as yet I was not dead. End of chapter 38
Villette by Charlotte Bronte, Chapter Thirty Nine, Old and New Acquaintance. Fascinated as by a basilisk with three heads, I could not leave this clique. The ground near them seemed to hold my feet. The canopy of entwined trees held out shadow. The night whispered a pledge of protection, and an officious lamp flashed just one beam to show me an obscure, safe seat, and then vanished. Let me now briefly tell the reader all that, during the past dark fortnight, I have been silently gathering from rumour, respecting the origin and the object of Monsieur Emmanuel's departure. The tale is short and not new. Its alpha is mammon, and its omega interest. If Madame Walravens was hideous as a Hindu idol, she seemed also to possess, in the estimation of these her votaries, an idol's consequence. The fact was she had been rich, very rich, and though for the present without the command of money, she was likely one day to be rich again. At Basse-Terre in Guadeloupe she possessed a large estate, received in dowry on her marriage sixty years ago, sequestered since her husband's failure, but now it was supposed, cleared of claim, and if duly looked after by a competent agent of integrity, considered capable of being made in a few years largely productive. Pere Silas took an interest in this prospective improvement for the sake of religion and the church whereof Magloire Walravens was a devout daughter. Madame Beck, distantly related to the hunchback and knowing her to be without family of her own, had long brooded over contingencies with a mother's calculating foresight, and harshly treated as she was by Madame Walravens, never ceased to court her for interest's sake. Madame Beck and the priest were thus, for money reasons, equally and sincerely interested in the nursing of the West Indian estate. But the distance was great, and the climate hazardous. The competent and upright agent wanted must be a devoted man. Just such a man had Madame Walravens retained for twenty years in her service, blighting his life and then living on him like an old fungus. Such a man had Père Silas trained, taught, and bound to him by the ties of gratitude, habit, and belief. Such a man Madame Beck knew, and could, in some measure, influence. My pupil, said Père Silas, if he remains in Europe, runs the risk of apostasy, for he has become entangled with a heretic. Madame Beck made also her private comment, and preferred in her own breast her secret reason for desiring expatriation. The thing she could not obtain, she desired not another to win, rather would she destroy it. As to Madame Walravens, she wanted her money and her land, and knew Paul, if he liked, could make the best and faithfulest steward. So the three self-seekers banded and beset the one unselfish. They reasoned, they appealed, they implored. On his mercy they cast themselves, into his hands they confidingly thrust their interests. They asked but two or three years of devotion. After that he should live for himself. One of the number, perhaps, wished that in the meantime he might die. No living being ever humbly laid his advantage at Monsieur Emmanuel's feet, or confidingly put it into his hands, that he spurned the trust or repulsed the repository. What might be his private pain or inward reluctance to leave Europe, what his calculations for his own future, none asked or knew or reported. All this was a blank to me. His conferences with his confessor, I might guess, the part duty and religion were made to play in the persuasions used, I might conjecture. He was gone, and had made no sign. There my knowledge closed. With my head bent and my forehead resting on my hands, I sat amidst group tree stems and branching brushwood. Whatever talk passed amongst my neighbours I might hear, if I would. I was near enough, but for some time there was scarce motive to attend. They gossiped about the dresses, the music, the illuminations, the fine night. I listened to hear them say, It is calm weather for his voyage. 
the Antigua, his ship, will sail prosperously. No such remark fell. Neither the Antigua, nor her course, nor her passenger were named. Perhaps the light chat scarcely interested old Madame Walravens more than it did me. She appeared restless, turning her head now to this side, now that, looking through the trees and among the crowd, as if expectant of an arrival and impatient of delay. Où sont-ils? Pourquoi ne viennent-ils? I heard her mutter more than once and at last as if determined to have an answer to her question which hitherto none seemed to mind she spoke aloud this phrase a phrase brief enough simple enough but it sent a shock through me monsieur et madame said she où donc est justine marie justine marie what was this justine marie the dead nun where was she why in her grave madame wall ravens what can you want with her you shall go to her but she shall not come to you thus i should have answered had the response lain with me but nobody seemed to be of my mind nobody seemed surprised startled or at a loss the quietest commonplace answer met the strange the dead disturbing the witch of endor query of the hunchback justine marie said one is coming she is in the kiosk she will be here presently out of this question and reply sprang a change in the chat chat it still remained easy desultory familiar gossip hint allusion comment went round the circle but all so broken so dependent on references to persons not named or circumstances not defined that listen as intently as i would and i did listen now with a fated interest i could make out no more than that some scheme was on foot in which this ghostly justine marie dead or alive was concerned this family hunter seemed grasping at her somehow for some reason there seemed question of a marriage of a fortune for whom i could not quite make out perhaps for victor kint perhaps for joseph manuel both were bachelors once i thought the hints and jests rained upon a fair-haired foreigner of the party whom they called heinrich muller amidst all the badinage madame warraven still obtruded from time to time hoarse cross-grained speeches her impatience being diverted only by an implacable surveillance of desiree who could not stir but the old woman menaced her with her staff la voilà suddenly cried one of the gentlemen voilà justine marie qui arrive this moment was for me peculiar i called up to memory the pictured nun on the panel present to my mind was the sad love story i saw in thought the vision of the garret the apparition of the alley the strange birth of the berceau i underwent a presentiment of discovery a strong conviction of coming disclosure ah when imagination once runs riot where do we stop what winter tree so bare and branchless what wayside hedge munching animal so humble that fancy a passing cloud and a struggling moonbeam will not clothe it in spirituality and make of it a phantom with solemn force pressed on my heart the expectation of mystery breaking up hitherto i had seen the spectre only through a glass darkly now was i to behold it face to face i leaned forward i looked she comes cried joseph emmanuel the circle opened as if opening to admit a new and welcome member at this instant a torch chanced to be carried past its blaze aided the pale moon in doing justice to the crisis and lighting to perfection the denouement pressing on surely those near me must have felt some little of the anxiety i felt in degrees so unmetted of that group the coolest must have held his breath for a time as for me my life stood still it is over the moment and the nun are come the crisis and revelation are passed by the flambeau glares still within a yard held up in a park keeper's hand its long eager tongue of flame almost licks the figure of the expected 
there where she stands full in my sight what is she like what does she wear how does she look who is she there are so many masks in the park to-night and as the hour wears late so strange a feeling of revelry and mystery begins to spread abroad that scarce would you discredit me reader were i to say that she is like the nun of the attic that she wears black skirts and white head-clothes that she looks the resurrection of the flesh and that she is a risen ghost all falsities all figments we will not deal in this gear let us be honest and cut as heretofore from the homely web of truth homely though is an ill-chosen word what i see is not precisely homely a girl of villette stands there a girl fresh from her pensionnat she is very comely with the beauty indigenous to this country she looks well nourished fair and fat of flesh her cheeks are round her eyes good her hair is abundant she is handsomely dressed she is not alone her escort consists of three persons two being elderly these she addresses as mon oncle and ma tante she laughs she chats good-humoured buxom and blooming she looks at all points the bourgeois belle so much for justine marie so much for ghosts and mystery not that this last was solved this girl certainly is not my nun what i saw in the garret and garden must have been taller by a span we have looked at the city bell we have cursorily glanced at the respectable old uncle and aunt have we a stray glance to give to the third member of this company can we spare him a moment's notice we ought to distinguish him so far reader he has claims on us we do not now meet him for the first time i clasped my hands very hard and i drew my breath very deep i held in the cry i devoured the ejaculation i forbade the start i spoke and i stirred no more than a stone but i knew what i looked on through the dimness left in my eyes by many nights weeping i knew him they said he was to sail by the antigua madame beck said so she lied or she had uttered what was once truth and failed to contradict it when it became false the antigua was gone and there stood paul emmanuel was i glad a huge load left me was it a fact to warrant joy i know not ask first what were the circumstances attendant on this respite how far did this delay concern me were there not those whom it might touch more nearly after all who may this young girl this justine marie be not a stranger reader she is known to me by sight she visits at the rue fossette she is often of madame beck's sunday parties she is a relation of both the becks and war ravens she derives her baptismal name from the sainted nun who would have been her aunt had she lived her patronymic is sauveur she is an heiress and an orphan and monsieur emmanuel is her guardian some say her godfather the family hunter wish this heiress to be married to one of their band which is it vital question which is it i felt very glad now that the drug administered in the sweet draught had filled me with a possession which made bed and chamber intolerable i always through my whole life liked to penetrate to the real truth i like seeking the goddess in her temple and handling the veil and daring the dread glance o oh, titaness among deities the covered outline of thine aspect sickens often through its uncertainty but define to us one trait show us one lineament clear in awful sincerity we may gasp in untold terror but with that gasp we drink in a breath of thy divinity our heart shakes and its currents sway like rivers lifted by earthquake but we have swallowed strength to see and know the worst 
is to take from fear her main advantage. The War Raven's party, augmented in numbers, now became very gay. The gentlemen fetched refreshments from the kiosk, all sat down on the turf under the trees. They drank healths and sentiments. They laughed, they jested. Monsieur Emmanuel underwent some raillery. Half good-humoured, half, I thought, malicious, especially on Madame Beck's part. I soon gathered that his voyage had been temporarily deferred of his own will, without the concurrence, even against the advice of his friends. He had let the Antigua go, and had taken his berth in the Paul et Virginie, appointed to sail a fortnight later. It was his reason for this resolve which they teased him to assign, and which he would only vaguely indicate as the settlement of a little piece of business which he had set his heart upon what was this business nobody knew yes there was one who seemed partly at least in his confidence a meaning look passed between him and justine marie la petite va m'aider n'est-ce pas said he the answer was prompt enough god knows mais oui je vous aiderai de tout mon coeur vous ferez de moi tout ce que vous voudrez mon parent and this dear parent took her hand and lifted it to his grateful lips upon which demonstration i saw the light-complexioned young teuton heinrich muller grow restless as if he did not like it he even grumbled a few words whereat m emmanuel actually laughed in his face and with the ruthless triumph of the assured conqueror he drew his ward nearer to him Monsieur Emmanuel was indeed very joyous that night. He seemed not one whit subdued by the change of scene and action impending. He was the true life of the party, a little despotic, perhaps, determined to be chief in mirth as well as in labour, yet from moment to moment proving indisputably his right of leadership. His was the wittiest word, the pleasantest anecdote, the frankest laugh, restlessly active after his manner he multiplied himself to wait on all but oh i saw which was his favourite i saw at whose feet he lay on the turf i saw whom he folded carefully from the night air whom he tended watched and cherished as the apple of his eye still hint and raillery flew thick and still i gathered that while monsieur paul should be absent working for others these others not quite ungrateful would guard for him the treasure he left in europe let him bring them an indian fortune they would give him in return a young bride and a rich inheritance as for the saintly consecration the vow of constancy that was forgotten the blooming and charming present prevailed over the past and at length his nun was indeed buried thus it must be the revelation was indeed come. Presentiment had not been mistaken in her impulse. There is a kind of presentiment which never is mistaken. It was I who had for a moment miscalculated, not seeing the true bearing of the oracle. I had thought she muttered a vision when in truth her prediction touched reality. I might have passed longer upon what I saw. I might have deliberated ere I drew inferences. Some, perhaps, would have held the premises doubtful, the proofs insufficient. Some slow sceptics would have incredulously examined her they conclusively accepted the project of a marriage between a poor and unselfish man of forty and his wealthy ward of eighteen. But far from me such shifts and palliatives, far from me such temporary evasion of the actual, such coward fleeing from the dread, the swift-footed, the all-overtaking fact, such feeble suspense of submission to her, the sole sovereign, such paltering and faltering resistance to the power whose errand is to march conquering and to conquer, such traitor defection from the truth. No, I hastened to accept the whole plan. I extended my grasp and took it all in. I gathered it to me with a sort of rage of haste, and folded it round me, as the soldier struck on the field folds his colours about his breast. I invoked conviction to nail upon me the certainty, abhorred while embraced, 
to fix it with the strongest spikes her strongest strokes could drive. And when the iron had entered well my soul, I stood up, as I thought, renovated. In my infatuation, I said, Truth, you are a good mistress to your faithful servants. When a lie pressed me, how I suffered, even when the falsehood was still sweet, still flattering to the fancy and warm to the feelings, it wasted me with hourly torment. The persuasion that affection was won could not be divorced from the dread that by another turn of the wheel it might be lost. Truth stripped away falsehood and flattery and expectancy, and here I stand, free. Nothing remained now but to take my freedom to my chamber, to carry it with me to my bed and see what I could make of it. The play was not yet indeed quite played out. I might have waited and watched longer that love scene under the trees, that sylvan courtship. Had there been nothing of love in the demonstration, my fancy in this hour was so generous, so creative, she could have modelled for it the most salient lineaments and given it the deepest life and highest colour of passion. I would not look. I had fixed my resolve, but I would not violate my nature. And then something tore me so cruelly under my shawl, something so dug into my side, a vulture so strong in beak and talon, I must be alone to grapple with it. I think I never felt jealousy till now. This was not like enduring the endearments of Dr. John and Paulina, against which, while I sealed my eyes and my ears, while I withdrew thence my thoughts, my sense of harmony still acknowledged in it a charm. This was an outrage. The love born of beauty was not mine. I had nothing in common with it. I could not dare to meddle with it. But another love, venturing diffidently into life after long acquaintance, furnace tried by pain, stamped by constancy, consolidated by affection's pure and durable alloy, submitted by intellect to intellect's own tests, and finally wrought up by his own process, to his own unflawed completeness, this love that laughed at passion, his fast frenzies, and his hot and hurried extinction, in this love I had a vested interest, and whatever tended either to its culture or its destruction, I could not view impassibly. I turned from the group of trees, and the Marie Compagnie in its shade. Midnight was long past. The concert was over, the crowds were thinning. I followed the ebb, leaving the radiant park and well-lit Hauteville still well-lit. This, it seems, was to be a nuit blanche in Villette. I sought the dim lower quarter. Dim, I should not say, for the beauty of moonlight, forgotten in the park, here once more flowed in upon perception. High she rode, and calm and stainlessly she shone. The music and the mirth of the fete, the fire and bright hues of those lamps, had outdone and outshone her for an hour. But now again her glory and her silence triumphed. The rival lamps were dying. She held her course like a white fate. Drum, trumpet, bugle had uttered their clangour, and were forgotten. With pencil ray she wrote on heaven and on earth records for archives everlasting. She and those stars seemed to me at once the types and witnesses of truth all regnant. The night sky lit her reign, like its slow-wheeling progress advanced to victory, that onward movement which has been and is and will be from eternity to eternity. These oil-twinkling streets are very still. I like them for their lowliness and peace. Homeward-bound burghers pass me now and then, but these companies are pedestrians, make little noise, and are soon gone. So well do I love Villette under her present aspect. Not willingly would I re-enter under a roof, but that I am bent on pursuing my strange adventure to a successful close, and quietly regaining my bed in the great dormitory before Madame Beck comes home. Only one street lies between me and the Rue Fossette. As I enter it, for the first time, the sound of a carriage tears up the deep peace of this quarter. It comes this way, comes very fast. How loud sounds its rattle on the paved path! 
The street is narrow, and I keep carefully to the causeway. The carriage thunders past. But what do I see, or fancy I see as it rushes by? Surely something white fluttered from that window. Surely a hand waved a handkerchief. Was that signal meant for me? Am I known? Who could recognize me? That is not Monsieur de Bassompierre's carriage, nor Mrs. Breton's. And besides, neither the Hôtel Crecy nor the Chateau of La Terrasse lies in that direction. Well, I have no time for conjecture. I must hurry home. Gaining the Rue Fossette, reaching the pensionnat, all there was still. No fiacre had yet arrived with Madame and Desiree. I had left the great door ajar. Should I find it thus? Perhaps the wind or some other accident may have thrown it to with sufficient force to start the spring-bolt. In that case hopeless became admission. My adventure must issue in catastrophe. I lightly pushed the heavy leaf. Would it yield? Yes, as soundless, as unresisting, as if some propitious genius had waited on a sesame charm in the vestibule within. Entering with bated breath, quietly making all fast, shoelessly mounting the staircase, I sought the dormitory and reached my couch. Aye, I reached it, and once more drew a free inspiration. The next moment I almost shrieked, almost, but not quite, thank heaven. Throughout the dormitory, throughout the house, there reigned at this hour the stillness of death. All slept, and in such hush it seemed that none dreamed. Stretched on the nineteen beds lay nineteen forms, at full length and motionless. On mine, the twentieth couch, nothing ought to have lain. I had left it void, and void should have found it. What, then, do I see between the half-drawn curtains? What dark, usurping shape, supine, long, and strange? Is it a robber who has made his way through the open street door and lies there in wait? It looks very black. I think it looks... not human. Can it be a wandering dog that has come in from the street and crept and nestled hither? Will it spring? Will it leap out if I approach? Approach I must. Courage. One step. My head reeled, for by the faint night lamp I saw stretched on my bed the old phantom, the nun. A cry at this moment might have ruined me. Be the spectacle what it might, I could afford neither consternation, scream, nor swoon. Besides, I was not overcome. Tempered by late incidents, my nerves disdained hysteria. Warm from illuminations and music and thronging thousands, thoroughly lashed up by a new scourge, I defied spectra. In a moment, without exclamation, I had rushed on the haunted couch. Nothing leaped out or sprung or stirred. All the movement was mine. So was all the life, the reality, the substance, the force, as my instinct felt. I tore her up, the incubus. I held her on high, the goblin. I shook her loose, the mystery. And down she fell, down all around me, down in shreds and fragments, and I trode upon her. Here again behold the branchless tree, the unstable Rosinante, the film of cloud, the flicker of moonshine. The long nun proved a long bolster, dressed in a long black stole, and artfully invested with a white veil. The garments, in very truth, strange as it may seem, were genuine nun's garments, and by some hand they had been disposed with a view to illusion. Whence came these vestments? Who contrived this artifice? These questions still remained. To the head bandage was pinned a slip of paper. It bore in pencil these mocking words. The nun of the attic bequeaths to Lucy Snow her wardrobe. She will be seen in the Rue Fossette no more. And what and who was she that had haunted me? She I had actually seen three times. 
not a woman of my acquaintance had the stature of that ghost she was not of a female height not to any man i knew could the machination for a moment be attributed still mystified beyond expression but as thoroughly as suddenly relieved from all sense of the spectral and unearthly scorning also to wear out my brain with the fret of a trivial though insoluble riddle i just bundled together stole veil and bandages thrust them beneath my pillow lay down listened till i heard the wheels of madame's home returning fiacre then turned and worn out by many nights vigils conquered too perhaps by the now reacting narcotic i deeply slept End of chapter thirty nine Chapter forty of Villette. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Villette by Charlotte Bronte. Chapter forty. The Happy Pair. The day succeeding this remarkable midsummer night proved no common day. I do not mean that it brought signs in heaven above, or portents on the earth beneath, nor do I allude to meteorological phenomena, to storm, flood, or whirlwind. On the contrary, the sun rose jocund with a July face morning decked her beauty with rubies and so filled her lap with roses that they fell from her in showers making her path blush the hours woke fresh as nymphs and emptying on the early hills their dew vials they stepped out dismantled of vapour shadowless azure and glorious they led the sun's steeds on a burning and unclouded course in short it was as fine a day as the finest summer could boast but i doubt whether i was not the sole inhabitant of the rue fossette who cared or remembered to note this pleasant fact another thought busied all other heads a thought indeed which had its share in my meditations but this master consideration not possessing for me so entire a novelty so overwhelming a suddenness especially so dense a mystery as it offered to the majority of my co-speculators thereon left me somewhat more open than the rest to any collateral observation or impression still while walking in the garden feeling the sunshine and marking the blooming and growing plants i pondered the same subject the whole house discussed what subject merely this when matins came to be said there was a place vacant in the first rank of boarders when breakfast was served there remained a coffee cup unclaimed when the housemaid made the beds she found in one a bolster laid lengthwise clad in a cap and nightgown and when ginevra farnshaw's music mistress came early as usual to give the morning lesson that accomplished and promising young person her pupil failed utterly to be forthcoming high and low was miss farnshaw sought through length and breadth was the house ransacked vainly not a trace not an indication not so much as a scrap of a billet rewarded the search the nymph was vanished engulfed in the past night like a shooting star swallowed up by darkness deep was the dismay of surveillant teachers deeper the horror of the defaulting directress never had i seen madame beck so pale or so appalled here was a blow struck at her tender part her weak side here was damaged unto her interest how too had the untoward event happened by what outlet had the fugitive taken wing not a casement was found unfastened not a pane of glass broken all the doors were bolted secure never to this day has madame beck obtained satisfaction on this point nor indeed has anybody else concerned save an excepting one lucy snow who could not forget how to facilitate a certain enterprise a great door had been drawn softly to its lintel closed indeed but neither bolted nor secure the thundering carriage and pair encountered were now likewise recalled as well as that puzzling signal the waved handkerchief from these premises and one or two others inaccessible to any but myself i could draw but one inference it was a case of elopement morally certain on this head and seeing madame beck's profound embarrassment 
I at last communicated my conviction. Having alluded to Monsieur de Hamal's suit, I found, as I expected, that Madame Beck was perfectly au fait to that affair. She had long since discussed it with Mrs. Chumley, and laid her own responsibility in the business on that lady's shoulders. To Mrs. Chumley and Monsieur de Bassompierre, she now had recourse. We found that the Hôtel Crecy was already alive to what had happened. Ginevra had written to her cousin, Paulina, vaguely signifying hymeneal intentions. Communications had been received from the family of de Hamal. Monsieur de Bassompierre was on the track of the fugitives. He overtook them too late. In the course of the week, the post brought me a note. I may as well transcribe it. It contains explanation on more than one point. Dear old Tim, short for Timon, I am off, you see, gone like a shot. Alfred and I intended to be married in this way almost from the first. We never meant to be spliced in the humdrum way of other people. Alfred has too much spirit for that, and so have I. Dieu merci. Do you know, Alfred, who used to call you the dragon, has seen so much of you during the last few months that he begins to feel quite friendly towards you. He hopes you won't miss him now that he has gone. He begs to apologize for any little trouble he may have given you. He is afraid he rather inconvenienced you once when he came upon you in the grenier, just as you were reading a letter, seemingly of the most special interest. But he could not resist the temptation to give you a start. You appeared so wonderfully taken up with your correspondent. En revanche, he says you once frightened him by rushing in for a dress or a shawl, or some other chiffon, at the moment when he had struck a light, or was going to take a quiet whiff of his cigar while waiting for me. Do you begin to comprehend by this time that Monsieur le Comte de Hamal was the nun of the attic, and that he came to see your humble servant? I will tell you how he managed it. You know he has the entree of the Athenée, where two or three of his nephews, the sons of his eldest sister, Madame de Melcy, are students. You know the court of the Athenée is on the other side of the high wall bounding your walk, the allée défendue. Alfred can climb as well as he can dance or fence. His amusement was to make the escalade of our pensionnat by mounting first the wall, then by the aid of that high tree overspreading the crombe and resting some of its boughs on the roof of the lower buildings of our premises. He managed to scale the first class and the grand salle. One night, by the way, he fell out of this tree, tore down some of the branches, nearly broke his own neck, and after all, in running away, got a terrible fright, and was nearly caught by two people, Madame Beck and Monsieur Emmanuel, he thinks, walking in the alley. From the Grand Salle the ascent is not difficult to the highest block of the building, finishing in the great garret. The skylight, you know, is day and night, left half open for air. By the skylight he entered. Nearly a year ago I chanced to tell him our legend of the nun, that suggested his romantic idea of the spectral disguise, which I think you must allow he has very cleverly carried out. But for the nun's black gown and white veil, he would have been caught again and again, both by you and that tiger Jesuit, Monsieur Paul. He thinks you both capital ghostiers, and very brave. What I wonder at is, rather your secretiveness than your courage, how could you endure the visitations of that long spectre time after time, without crying out, telling everybody, and rousing the whole house and neighbourhood? Oh, and how did you like the nun as a bedfellow? I dressed her up. Didn't I do it well? Did you shriek when you saw her? I should have gone mad. But then you have such nerves, real iron and bend leather. I believe you feel nothing. You haven't the same sensitiveness that a person of my constitution has. You seem to me insensible both to pain and fear, and grief. You are a real old Diogenes. Well, dear grandmother, and are you not mightily angry at my moonlight flitting and runaway match? I assure you it is excellent fun, and I did it partly to spite that minx Paulina and that bear Dr. John, to show them that, with all their airs, I could get married as well as they. Monsieur de Bassompierre was at first in a strange fume with Alfred. He threatened a prosecution for détournement du mineur, and I know not what. He was so abominably in earnest that I found myself forced to do a little bit of the melodramatic go down on my knees, sob, cry, drench three pocket-handkerchiefs. Of course, mon oncle soon gave in. Indeed, where was the use of making a fuss? 
I am married, and that's all about it. He still says our marriage is not legal, because I am not of age, forsooth. As if that made any difference. I am just as much married as if I were a hundred. However, we are to be married again, and I am to have a trousseau, and Mrs. Chumley is going to superintend it, and there are some hopes that Monsieur de Bassompierre will give me a decent portion, which will be very convenient, as dear Alfred has nothing but his nobility, native and hereditary, and his pay. I only wish Uncle would do things unconditionally, in a generous, gentlemanlike fashion. He is so disagreeable as to make the dowry depend on Alfred's giving his written promise that he will never touch cards or dice from the day it is paid down. They accuse my angel of a tendency to play. I don't know anything about that, but I do know he is a dear, adorable creature. I cannot sufficiently extol the genius with which de Hamel managed our flight. How clever in him to select the night of the fete, when madame, for he knows her habits, as he said, would infallibly be absent at the concert in the park. I suppose you must have gone with her. I watched you rise and leave the dormitory about eleven o'clock. How you returned alone and on foot I cannot conjecture. That surely was you we met in the narrow old Rue Saint-Jean. Did you see me wave my handkerchief from the carriage window? Adieu. Rejoice in my good luck. Congratulate me on my supreme happiness. And believe me, dear cynic and misanthrope, yours, in the best of health and spirits, Genevra Laura de Hamal, née Fanchal. P.S. Remember, I am a countess now. Papa, mamma, and the girls at home will be delighted to hear that. My daughter the countess, my sister the countess. Sounds rather better than Mrs. John Breton, hm? In winding up Mistress Fanshawe's memoirs, the reader will no doubt expect to hear that she came finally to bitter expiation of her youthful levities. Of course a large share of suffering lies in reserve for her future. A few words will embody my farther knowledge respecting her. I saw her towards the close of her honeymoon. She called on Madame Beck, and sent for me into the salon. She rushed into my arms, laughing. She looked very blooming and beautiful. Her curls were longer, her cheeks rosier than ever, her white bonnet and her Flanders veil, her orange flowers and her bride's dress became her mightily. "'I have got my portion!' she cried at once. Ginevra ever stuck to the substantial. I always thought there was a good trading element in her composition, much as she scorned the bourgeoise. And Uncle de Bassompierre is quite reconciled. I don't mind his calling Alfred an nincompoop. That's only his coarse Scottish breeding, and I believe Paulina envies me, and Dr. John is wild with jealousy, fit to blow his brains out. I am so happy. I really think I've hardly anything left to wish for unless it be a carriage and an hotel, and, oh, I must introduce you to mon mari. Alfred, come here. And Alfred appeared from the inner salon, where he was talking to Madame Beck, receiving the blended felicitations and reprimands of that lady. I was presented under my various names, the Dragon, Diogenes, and Timon. The young colonel was very polite. He made me a prettily turned, neatly worded apology about the ghost visits, etc., concluding with saying that the best excuse for all his iniquities stood there, pointing to his bride. And then the bride sent him back to Madame Beck, and she took me to herself and proceeded literally to suffocate me with her unrestrained spirits, her girlish, giddy, wild nonsense. She showed her ring exultingly. She called herself Madame la Comtesse de Hamel, and asked how it sounded a score of times. I said very little. I gave her only the crust and rind of my nature. No matter, she expected of me nothing better. She knew me too well to look for compliments. My dry jibes pleased her well enough, and the more impossible and prosaic my mien, the more merrily she laughed. Soon after his marriage, Monsieur de Hamal was persuaded to leave the army as the surest way of weaning him from certain unprofitable associates and habits. A post of attaché was procured for him, and he and his young wife went abroad. I thought she would forget me now, but she did not. For many years she kept up a capricious, fitful sort of correspondence. During the first year or two it was only of herself and Alfred she wrote. 
Then Alfred faded into the background. Herself and a certain newcomer prevailed, when Alfred Fanshawe de Bassompierre de Hamal began to reign in his father's stead. There were great boastings about this personage, extravagant amplifications upon miracles of precocity, mixed with vehement objurations against the phlegmatic incredulity with which I received them. I didn't know what it was to be a mother. Unfeeling thing that I was, the sensibilities of the maternal heart were Greek and Hebrew to me. And so on. In due course of nature, this young gentleman took his degrees in teething, measles, whooping cough. That was a terrible time for me. The mamma's letters became a perfect shout of affliction. Never woman was so put upon by calamity. Never human being stood in such need of sympathy. I was frightened at first and wrote back pathetically. But I soon found out there was more cry than wool in the business and relapsed into my natural, cruel insensibility. As to the youthful sufferer, he weathered each storm like a hero. Five times was that youth in articulo mortis, and five times did he miraculously revive. In the course of years there arose ominous murmurings against Alfred I. Monsieur de Bassompierre had to be appealed to, debts had to be paid, some of them of that dismal and dingy order called debts of honour ignoble plaints and difficulties became frequent under every cloud no matter what its nature ginevra as of old called out lustily for sympathy and aid she had no notion of meeting any distress single-handed in some shape from some quarter or other she was pretty sure to obtain her will and so she got on fighting the battle of life by proxy, and, on the whole, suffering as little as any human being I have ever known. End of chapter 40。Chapter 41 of Villette. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Villette by Charlotte Bronte, Chapter Forty One, Fabu Clotilde. Must I, ere I close, render some account of that freedom and renovation which I won on the fete night? Must I tell how I and the two stalwart companions I brought home from the illuminated park bore the test of intimate acquaintance? I tried them the very next day. They had boasted their strength loudly when they reclaimed me from love and its bondage, but upon my demanding deeds, not words, some evidence of better comfort, some experience of a relieved life, Freedom excused herself, as for the present impoverished and disabled to assist, and Renovation never spoke. He had died in the night suddenly. I had nothing left for it then but to trust secretly that conjecture might have hurried me too fast and too far, to sustain the oppressive hour by reminders of the distorting and discolouring magic of jealousy. After a short and vain struggle, I found myself brought back captive to the old rack of suspense, tied down and strained anew. Shall I yet see him before he goes? Will he bear me in mind? Does he purpose to come? Will this day, will the next hour bring him? Or must I again assay that corroding pain of long attent, that rude agony of rupture at the close, that mute mortal wrench, which in at once uprooting hope and doubt shakes life, while the hand that does the violence cannot be caressed to pity, because absence interposes her barrier? It was the Feast of the Assumption. No school was held. The boarders and teachers, after attending mass in the morning, were gone a long walk into the country to take their goûte, or afternoon meal, at some farmhouse. I did not go with them, for now but two days remained ere the Paul et Virginie must sail, and I was clinging to my last chance, as the living waif of a wreck clings to his last raft or cable. There were some joiners' work to do in the first class, some bench or desk to repair, Holidays were often turned to account for the performance of these operations, which could not be executed when the rooms were filled with pupils. 
As I sat solitary, purposing to adjoin to the garden and leave the coast clear, but too listless to fulfil my own intent, I heard the workmen coming. Foreign artisans and servants do everything by couples. I believe it would take two Labasakurian carpenters to drive a nail. While tying on my bonnet, which had hitherto hung by its ribbons from my idle hand, I vaguely and momentarily wondered to hear the step of but one ouvrier. I noted, too, as captives in dungeons find sometimes dreary leisure to note the merest trifles, that this man wore shoes, and not sabots. I concluded that it must be the master carpenter, coming to inspect before he sent his journeyman. I threw round me my scarf. He advanced. He opened the door. My back was towards it. I felt a little thrill, a curious sensation, too quick and transient to be analysed. I turned. I stood in the supposed master artisan's presence. Looking towards the doorway, I saw it filled with a figure, and my eyes printed upon my brain the picture of Monsieur Paul. Hundreds of the prayers with which we weary heaven bring to the suppliant no fulfilment. Once haply in life, one golden gift falls prone in the lap, one boon, full and bright, perfect from fruition's mint. Monsieur Emmanuel wore the dress in which he probably purposed to travel, a surtout guarded with velvet. I thought him prepared for instant departure, and yet I had understood that two days were yet to run before the ship sailed. He looked well and cheerful. He looked kind and benign. He came in with eagerness. He was close to me in one second. He was all amity. It might be his bridegroom mood which thus brightened him. Whatever the cause, I could not meet his sunshine with cloud. If this were my last moment with him, I would not waste it in forced, unnatural distance. I loved him too well, too well not to smite out of my path even jealousy herself when she would have obstructed a kind farewell. A cordial word from his lips, or a gentle look from his eyes, would do me good, for all the span of life that remained to me. It would be comfort in the last strait of loneliness. I would take it. I would taste the elixir, and pride should not spill the cup. The interview would be short, of course. He would say to me just what he had said to each of the assembled pupils. He would take and hold my hand two minutes. He would touch my cheek with his lips for the first last, only time. And then, no more. Then indeed the final parting, then the wide separation, the great gulf I could not pass to go to him, across which, happily, he would not glance to remember me. He took my hand in one of his. With the other one he put back my bonnet. He looked into my face. His luminous smile went out. His lips expressed something almost like the wordless language of a mother who finds a child greatly and unexpectedly changed, broken with illness or worn out by want. A check supervened. Paul, Paul, said a woman's hurried voice behind. Paul, come into the salon. I have yet a great many things to say to you. Conversation for the whole day. And so has Victor. And Joseph is here. Come, Paul. Come to your friends. Madame Beck, brought to the spot by vigilance or an inscrutable instinct, pressed so near she almost thrust herself between me and Monsieur Emmanuel. Come, Paul, she reiterated, her eye grazing me with its hard ray like a steel stylet. She pushed against her kinsman. I thought he receded. I thought he would go, pierced deeper than I could endure, made now to feel what defied suppression, I cried, My heart will break! What I felt seemed literal heartbreak, but the seal of another fountain yielded under the strain. One breath from Monsieur Paul, the whisper, Trust me, lifted a load, opened an outlet. With many a deep sob, with thrilling, with icy shiver, with strong trembling and yet with relief, I wept. Leave her to me. It is a crisis. I will give her a cordial, and it will pass," said the calm Madame Beck. 
to be left to her and her cordial seemed to me something like being left to the poisoner and her bowl when monsieur paul answered deeply harshly and briefly Laissez-moi. in the grim sound i felt a music strange strong but life-giving he repeated his nostrils opening and his facial muscles all quivering as he spoke but this will never do said madame with sternness more sternly rejoined her kinsman sortez d'ici i will send for persila on the spot i will send for him she threatened pertinaciously femme cried the professor not now in his deep tones but in his highest and most excited key femme sortez à l'instant he was roused and i loved him in his wrath with a passion beyond what i had yet felt what you do is wrong pursued madame it is an act characteristic of men of your unreliable imaginative temperament a step impulsive injudicious inconsistent a proceeding vexatious and not estimable in the view of persons of steadier and more resolute character you know not what i have of steady and resolute in me said he but you shall see the even shall teach you he continued less fiercely be gentle be pitying be a woman look at this poor face and relent you know i am your friend and a friend of your friends in spite of your taunts you well and deeply know i may be trusted of sacrificing myself i made no difficulty but my heart is pained by what i see it must have and give solace leave me this time in the leave me there was an intonation so bitter and so imperative i wondered that even madame beck herself could for one moment delay obedience but she stood firm she gazed upon him dauntless she met his eye forbidding and fixed as stone she was opening her lips to retort i saw all over monsieur paul's face a quick rising light and fire i can hardly tell how he managed the movement it did not seem violent it kept the form of courtesy he gave his hand it scarce touched her i thought she ran she whirled from the room she was gone and the door shut in one second the flash of passion was all over very soon he smiled as he told me to wipe my eyes he waited quietly till i was calm dropping from time to time a stilling solacing word ere long i sat beside him once more myself reassured not desperate nor yet desolate not friendless not hopeless not sick of life and seeking death it made you very sad then to lose your friend said he it kills me to be forgotten monsieur i said all these weary days i have not heard from you one word and i was crushed with the possibility growing to certainty that you would depart without saying farewell must i tell you what i told modeste beck that you do not know me must i show and teach you my character you will have proof that i can be a firm friend without clear proof this hand will not lie still in mine it will not trust my shoulder as a safe stay good the proof is ready i come to justify myself say anything teach anything prove anything monsieur i can listen now then in the first place you must go out with me a good distance into the town i came on purpose to fetch you without questioning his meaning or sounding his plan or offering the semblance of an objection i retied my bonnet i was ready the route he took was by the boulevards. He several times made me sit down on the seats stationed under the lime trees. He did not ask if I was tired, but looked and drew his own conclusions. All these weary days, said he, repeating my words, with a gentle, kindly mimicry of my voice and foreign accent, not new from his lips and of which the playful banter never wounded not even when coupled as it often was with the assertion that however i might write his language i spoke and always should speak it imperfectly and hesitatingly 
All these weary days, I have not for one hour forgotten you, faithful women, eh, in this, that they think themselves the so faithful of God's creatures. On a very fervent and living crew to myself, I, too, till lately scarce dare count, from any carter, but look at me. I lifted my happy eyes. They were happy now or they would have been no interpreters of my heart. Well, said he, after some second scrutiny, there is no denying that signature. Constancy wrote it. Her pen is of iron. Was the record painful? Severely painful, I said, with truth. Withdraw her hand, monsieur. I can bear its inscribing force no more. Elle est toute pâle, said he, speaking to himself. Cette figure-là me fait mal. Ah, I am not pleasant to look at. I could not help saying this. The words came unbidden. I never remember the time when I had not a haunting dread of what might be the degree of my outward deficiency. This dread pressed me at the moment with special force. A great softness passed upon his countenance. His violet eyes grew suffused and glistening under their deep Spanish lashes. He started up. Let us walk on. Do I displease your eyes much? I took courage to urge. The point had its vital import for me. He stopped and gave me a short, strong answer, an answer which silenced, subdued, yet profoundly satisfied. Ever after that I knew what I was for him, and what I might be for the rest of the world I ceased painfully to care. Was it weak to lay so much stress on an opinion about appearance? I fear it might be. I fear it was. But in that case I must avow no light share of weakness. I must own great fear of displeasing, a strong wish moderately to please Monsieur Paul. Whither we rambled I scarce knew. Our walk was long, yet seemed short. The path was pleasant, the day lovely. Monsieur Emmanuel talked of his voyage. He thought of staying away three years. On his return from Guadeloupe, he looked forward to release from liabilities and a clear course. And— What did I purpose doing in the interval of his absence? He asked. I had talked once. He reminded me of trying to be independent and keeping a little school of my own. Had I dropped the idea? Indeed, I had not. I was doing my best to save what would enable me to put it in practice. He did not like leaving me in the Rue Fossette. He feared I should miss him there too much. I should feel desolate. I should grow sad. This was certain. But I promised to do my best to endure. Still, said he, speaking low, there is another objection to your present residence. I should wish to write to you sometimes. It would not be well to have any uncertainty about the safe transmission of letters, and in the Rufosset, in short, our Catholic discipline in certain matters, though justifiable and expedient, might, possibly, under peculiar circumstances, become liable to misapplication, perhaps abuse. But if you write, said I, I must have your letters, and I will have them. Ten directors, twenty directresses shall not keep them from me. I am a Protestant. I will not bear that kind of discipline, monsieur. I will not. Doucement, doucement, rejoined he. We will contrive a plan. We have our resources. Soyez tranquille. So speaking, he paused. We were now returning from the long walk. We had reached the middle of a clean faux bore, where the houses were small but looked pleasant. It was before the white doorstep of a very neat abode that Monsieur Paul had halted. I call here, said he. He did not knock, but taking from his pocket a key, he opened and entered at once. Ushering me in, he shut the door behind us. No servant appeared. The vestibule was small, like the house, but freshly and tastefully painted. 
Its vista closed in a French window with vines trained about the panes, tendrils and green leaves kissing the glass. Silence reigned in this dwelling. Opening an inner door, Monsieur Paul disclosed a parlour, or salon, very tiny, but I thought very pretty. Its delicate walls were tinged like a blush. Its floor was waxed. A square of brilliant carpet covered its centre. Its small round table shone like the mirror over its hearth. There was a little couch, a little chiffonier, the half-open crimson silk door of which showed porcelain on the shelves. There was a French clock, a lamp. There were ornaments and biscuit china. The recess of the single ample window was filled with a green stand, bearing three green flower-pots, each filled with a fine plant growing in bloom. In one corner appeared a guéridon, with a marble top, and upon it a work-box, and a glass filled with violets in water. The lattice of this room was open. The outer air breathing through gave freshness, the sweet violets lent fragrance. "'Pretty, pretty place,' said I. Monsieur Paul smiled to see me so pleased. "'Must we sit down here and wait?' I asked in a whisper, half awed by the deep, pervading hush. "'We will first peep into one or two other nooks of this nutshell,' he replied. "'Dare you take the freedom of going all over the house?' I inquired. "'Yes, I dare,' said he, quietly. He led the way. I was shown a little kitchen with a little stove and oven, with few but bright brasses, two chairs and a table. A small cupboard held a diminutive but commodious set of earthenware. There is a coffee service of china in the salon, said Monsieur Paul, as I looked at the six green and white dinner plates, the four dishes, the cups and jugs to match. Conducted up the narrow but clean staircase, I was permitted a glimpse of two pretty cabinets of sleeping-rooms. Finally, I was once more led below, and we halted with a certain ceremony before a larger door than had yet been opened. Producing a second key, Monsieur Emmanuel adjusted it to the lock of this door. He opened, put me in before him. Voici! he cried. I found myself in a good-sized apartment, scrupulously clean, though bare, compared with those I had hitherto seen. The well-scoured boards were carpetless. It contained two rows of green benches and desks, with an alley down the centre, terminating in an estrade, a teacher's chair and table, behind them a tableau. On the walls hung two maps, and the windows flowered a few hardy plants. In short, here was a miniature class, complete, neat, pleasant. "'It is a school, then,' said I. "'Who keeps it? "'I never heard of an establishment in this faubourg.' "'Will you have the goodness to accept the few prospectuses "'for distribution in behalf of a friend of mine?' "'asked he, taking from his surtout pocket "'some quires of these documents, and putting them into my hand. "'I looked. "'I read, printed in fair characters.' Externat de Damoiselles, numéro sept, Faubourg Clotilde, directrice, Mademoiselle Lucy Snow. And what did I say to Monsieur Paul Emmanuel? Certain junctures of our lives must always be difficult of recall to memory. Certain points, crises, certain feelings, joys, griefs, and amazements, when reviewed, must strike us as things wildered and whirling dim as a wheel fast spun. I can no more remember the thoughts or the words of the ten minutes succeeding this disclosure than I can retrace the experience of my earliest year of life. And yet the first thing distinct to me is the consciousness that I was speaking very fast, repeating over and over again. Did you do this, Monsieur Paul? Is this your house? Did you furnish it? Did you get these papers printed? Do you mean me? Am I the directress? Is there another Lucy Snow? Tell me. Say something. But he would not speak. His pleased silence, his laughing down look, his attitude, are visible to me now. How is it? I must know all. 
all i cried the packet of papers fell on the floor he had extended his hand and i had fastened thereon oblivious of all else ah you said that i had forgotten you all these weary days said he poor old emmanuel these are the thanks he gets for trudging about three mortal weeks from house painter to upholsterer from cabinet maker to charwoman lucy and lucy scott the sole thoughts in his head i hardly knew what to do i first caressed the soft velvet on his cuff and then i stroked the hand it surrounded it was his foresight his goodness his silent strong effective goodness that overpowered me by their proved reality it was the assurance of his sleepless interest which broke on me like a light from heaven it was his i will dare to say it his fond tender look which now shook me indescribably in the midst of all i forced myself to look at the practical the trouble i cried and the cost had you money monsieur paul plenty of money said he heartily the disposal of my large teaching connection put me in possession of a handsome sum which part of it i determined to give myself the richest treat that i have known or shall know i like this i have reckoned on this hour day and night lately i would not come near you because i would not forestall it reserve is neither my virtue nor my vice if i had put myself into your power and you had begun with questions of look and lip where have you been monsieur paul what have you been doing what is your mystery my solitary first and last secret would presently have unravelled itself in your lap now he pursued you shall live here and have a school you shall employ yourself while i am away you shall think of me sometimes you shall mind your health and happiness for my sake and when i come back there he left a blank i promised to do all he told me i promised to work hard and willingly i will be your faithful steward i said i trust at your coming the account will be ready monsieur monsieur you are too good in such inadequate language my feelings struggled for expression they could not get it speech brittle and unmalleable and cold as ice dissolved or shivered in the effort he watched me still he gently raised his hand to stroke my hair it touched my lips in passing i pressed it close i paid it tribute he was my king royal for me had been that hand's bounty to offer homage was both a joy and a duty the afternoon hours were over and the stiller time of evening shaded the quiet faubourg monsieur paul claimed my hospitality occupied and afoot since morning he needed refreshment he said i should offer him chocolate in my pretty gold and white china service he went out and ordered what was needful from the restaurant he placed the small garridon and two chairs in the balcony outside the french window under the screening vines with what shy joy i accepted my part as hostess arranged the salver served the benefactor guest this balcony was in the rear of the house the gardens of the faubourg were round us fields extended beyond the air was still mild and fresh above the poplars the laurels the cypresses and the roses looked up a moon so lovely and so halcyon the heart trembled under her smile a star shone subject beside her with the unemulous ray of pure love in a large garden near us a jet rose from a well and a pale statue leaned over the play of waters Monsieur Paul talked to me. 
His voice was so modulated that it mixed harmonious with the silver whisper, the gush, the musical sigh, in which light breeze, fountain, and foliage intoned their lulling vesper. Happy hour! Stay one moment. Droop those plumes, rest those wings, incline to mine that brow of heaven. White angel, let thy light linger, leave its reflection on succeeding clouds, bequeath its cheer to that time which needs a ray in retrospect. Our meal was simple. The chocolate, the rolls, the plate of fresh summer fruit, cherries and strawberries bedded in green leaves formed the whole, but it was what we both liked better than a feast, and I took a delight inexpressible in tending Monsieur Paul. I asked him whether his friends, Père Silas and Madame Beck, knew what he had done, whether they had seen my house. Mon ami, said he, no one knows what I have done, save you and myself. The pleasure is consecrated to us two, unshared and unprofaned. To speak truth, there has been to me in this matter a refinement of enjoyment I would not make vulgar by communication. Besides, smiling, I wanted to prove to Miss Lucy that I could keep a secret. How often has she taunted me with lack of dignified reserve, of needful caution? How many times has she so silly insinuated that all my affairs are the secret of Polichinelle? This was true enough. I had not spared him on this point, nor perhaps on any other that was assailable. Magnificent-minded, grand-hearted, dear, faulty little man, you deserved candour, and for me always had it. Continuing my queries, I asked to whom the house belonged, who was my landlord, the amount of my rent. He instantly gave me these particulars in writing. He had foreseen and prepared all things. The house was not Monsieur Paul's. That I guessed. He was hardly the man to become a proprietor. I more than suspected in him a lamentable absence of the saving faculty. He could get, but not keep. He needed a treasurer. The tenement, then, belonged to a citizen in the Basse Ville. A man of substance, Monsieur Paul said. He startled me by adding, A friend of yours, Miss Lucy, a person who has the most respectful regard for you. And to my pleasant surprise, I found the landlord was none other than Monsieur Muret, the short-tempered and kind-hearted bookseller, who had so kindly found me a seat that eventful night in the park. It seems Monsieur Muret was in his station, rich as well as much respected, and possessed several houses in this faubourg. The rent was moderate, scarce half of what it would have been for a house of equal size nearer the centre of Villette. And then observed monsieur paul should fortune not favour you though i think she will i have the satisfaction to think you are in good hands monsieur miret will not be extortionate the first year's rent you have already in your savings afterwards miss lucy must trust god and herself but now what will you do for pupils i must distribute my prospectuses right by way of losing no time, I gave one to Monsieur Mirin yesterday. Should you object to beginning with three petite bourgeoises, the Demoiselle Mirin, they are at your service. Monsieur, you forget nothing. You are wonderful. Object? It would become me indeed to object. I suppose I hardly expect at the outset to number aristocrats in my little day school. I care not if they never come. I shall be proud to receive Monsieur Muret's daughters. Besides these, pursued he, another pupil offers, who will come daily to take lessons in English, and she is rich. She will pay handsomely. I mean my goddaughter and ward, Justine Marie Sauveur. What is in a name? What in three words? Till this moment I had listened with living joy. I had answered with gleeful quickness. A name froze me. Three words struck me mute. The effect could not be hidden, and indeed I scarce tried to hide it. What now? 
said Monsieur Paul. Nothing. Nothing. Your countenance change, your colour and your very eyes fade. Nothing. You must be ill. You have some suffering. Tell me what. I had nothing to tell. He drew his chair nearer. He did not grow vexed, though I continued silent and icy. He tried to win a word. He entreated with perseverance. He waited with patience. Justine Marie is a good girl, said he. Docile and amiable, not quick, but you will like her. I think not. I think she must not come here. Such was my speech. Do you wish to puzzle me? Do you know her? But, in truth, there is something. Again, you are pale as a statue. Rely on Paul Carlos. Tell him the grief. His chair touched mine. His hand, quietly advanced, turned me towards him. Do you know Marie Justine? said he again. The name repronounced by his lips overcame me unaccountably. It did not prostrate. No, it stirred me up, running with haste and heat through my veins, recalling an hour of quick pain, many days and nights of heartsickness. Near me as he now sat, strongly and closely as he had long twined his life and mine, far as had progressed and near as was achieved our minds and affections assimilation, the very suggestion of interference, of heart separation, could be heard only with a fermenting excitement, an impetuous throw, a disdainful resolve, an ire, a resistance of which no human eye or cheek could hide the flame, nor any truth-accustomed human tongue curb the cry. I want to tell you something, I said. I want to tell you all. Speak, Lucy. Come near. Speak. Who prizes you? If I do not... Who is your friend, if not Emmanuel? Speak. I spoke. All escaped from my lips. I lacked not words now. Fast I narrated. Fluent I told my tale. It streamed on my tongue. I went back to the night in the park. I mentioned the medicated draught. Why it was given. Its goading effect. How it had torn rest from under my head. Shaken me from my couch carried me abroad with the lure of a vivid yet solemn fancy, a summer night solitude on turf under trees, near a deep, cool lakelet. I told the scene realized, the crowd, the masks, the music, the lamps, the splendors, the guns booming afar, the bells sounding on high. All I had encountered I detailed, all I had recognized, heard, and seen, how I had beheld and watched himself, how I listened, how much heard, what conjectured. The whole history, in brief, summoned to his confidence, rushed thither, truthful, literal, ardent, bitter. Still, as I narrated, instead of checking, he incited me to proceed. He spurred me by the gesture, the smile, the half-word. Before I had half done, he held both my hands. He consulted my eyes with a most piercing glance. There was something in his face which tended neither to calm nor to put me down. He forgot his own doctrine. He forsook his own system of repression when I most challenged its exercise. I think I deserved strong reproof. But when have we our deserts? I merited severity. He looked indulgence. To my very self I seemed imperious and unreasonable for I forbade Justine Marie my door and roof. He smiled, betraying delight. Warm, jealous, and haughty, I knew not till now that my nature had such a mood. He gathered me near his heart. I was full of faults. He took them and me all home. For the moment of utmost mutiny, he reserved the one deep spell of peace. These words caressed my ear. Lucy, take my love, one day share my life, be my dearest first on earth. We walked back to the Rue Fossette by moonlight, such moonlight as fell on Eden, shining through the shades of the great garden and happily gilding a path glorious for a step divine, a presence nameless. 
once in their lives some men and women go back to these first fresh days of our great sire and mother taste that grand morning's dew bathe in its sunrise in the course of the walk i was told how justine marie sauveur had always been regarded with the affection proper to a daughter how with monsieur paul's consent she had been affianced for months to one heinrich muller a wealthy young german merchant and was to be married in the course of a year some of monsieur emmanuel's relations and connections would indeed it seems have liked him to marry her with a view to securing her fortune in the family but to himself the scheme was repugnant and the idea totally inadmissible we reached madame beck's door jean baptiste's clock told nine at this hour in this house eighteen months since had this man at my side bent before me looked into my face and eyes and arbitered my destiny this very evening he had again stooped gazed and decreed how different the look how far otherwise the fate he deemed me born under his star he seemed to have spread over me its beam like a banner once unknown and unloved i held him harsh and strange the low stature the wiry make the angles the darkness the manner displeased me now penetrated with his influence and living by his affection having his worth by intellect and his goodness by heart i preferred him before all humanity we parted he gave me his pledge and then his farewell we parted the next day he sailed End of chapter 41Chapter 42 of Villette. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Villette by Charlotte Bronte. Chapter 42. Fini. Man cannot prophesy. Love is no oracle. Fear sometimes imagines a vain thing. Those years of absence. How had I sickened over their anticipation? The woe they must bring seemed certain as death. I knew the nature of their course. I never had doubt how it would harrow as it went. The juggernaut on his car towered there a grim load. Seeing him draw nigh, bearing his broad wheels in the oppressed soil, I, the prostrate votary, felt beforehand the annihilating crunch. Strange to say, strange yet true, and owning many parallels in life's experience, that anticipatory crunch proved all, yes, nearly all, the torture. The great juggernaut in his great chariot drew on lofty, loud, and sullen. He passed quietly, like a shadow sweeping the sky, at noon. Nothing but a chilling dimness was seen or felt. I looked up. Chariot and demon charioteer were gone by the votary still lived monsieur emmanuel was away three years reader they were the three happiest years of my life do you scout the paradox listen i commenced my school i worked i worked hard i deemed myself the steward of his property and determined god willing to render a good account pupils came burghers at first a higher class ere long about the middle of the second year an unexpected chance threw into my hands an additional hundred pounds one day i received from england a letter containing that sum it came from mr marchmont the cousin and heir of my dear and dead mistress he was just recovering from a dangerous illness the money was a peace-offering to his conscience, reproaching him in the matter of, I know not what, papers or memoranda found after his kinswoman's death. 
naming or recommending Lucy Snow. Mrs. Barrett had given him my address. How far his conscience had been sinned against, I never inquired. I asked no questions, but took the cash and made it useful. With this hundred pounds I ventured to take the house adjoining mine. I would not leave that which Monsieur Paul had chosen, in which he had left and where he expected again to find me. My extenar became a pensionar. That also prospered. The secret of my success did not lie so much in myself, in any endowment, any power of mine, as in a new state of circumstances, a wonderfully changed life, a relieved heart. The spring which moved my energies lay far away beyond seas, in an Indian isle. At parting I had been left a legacy. Such a thought for the present, such a hope for the future, such a motive for persevering, a laborious, an enterprising, a patient, and a brave course. I could not flag. Few things shook me now. Few things had importance to vex, intimidate, or depress me. Most things pleased. Mere trifles had a charm. Do not think that this genial flame sustained itself, or lived wholly on a bequeathed hope or a parting promise. A generous provider supplied bounteous fuel. I was spared all chill, all stint. I was not suffered to fear penury. I was not tired with suspense. By every vessel he wrote. He wrote as he gave and as he loved, in full-handed, full-hearted plentitude. He wrote because he liked to write. He did not abridge because he cared not to abridge. He sat down. He took pen and paper because he loved Lucy, and had much to say to her. Because he was faithful and thoughtful. Because he was tender and true. There was no sham and no cheat and no hollow unreal in him. Apology never dropped her slippery oil on his lips, never proffered by his pen her coward feints and paltry nullities. He would give neither a stone nor an excuse, neither a scorpion nor a disappointment. His letters were real food that nourished, living water that refreshed. And was I grateful? God knows! I believe that scarce a living being so remembered, so sustained, dealt with in kind so constant, honourable, and noble, could be otherwise than grateful to the death. Adherent to his own religion, in him was not the stuff of which is made the facile apostate, he freely left me my pure faith. He did not tease nor tempt. He said, Remain protestant, my little English Puritan. I love Protestantism in you. I own its severe charm. There is something in its ritual I cannot receive myself, but it is the soul create for Lucy. All Rome could not put into him bigotry, nor the propaganda itself make him a real Jesuit. He was born honest and not false, artless and not cunning, a free man and not a slave. His tenderness had rendered him ductile in a priest's hands. His affection, his devotedness, his sincere pious enthusiasm blinded his kind eyes sometimes, made him abandon justice to himself to do the work of craft and serve the ends of selfishness. But these are faults so rare to find, so costly to their owner to indulge, we scarce know whether they will not one day be reckoned amongst the jewels. And now the three years are past. Monsieur Emmanuel's return is fixed. It is autumn. He is to be with me ere the mists of November come. My school flourishes. My house is ready. I have made him a little library, filled its shelves with the books he left in my care. I have cultivated out of love for him, I was naturally no florist, the plants he preferred, and some of them are yet in bloom. I thought I loved him when he went away. I love him now in another degree. He is more my own. The sun passes the equinox. The days shorten. The leaves grow sere. But he is coming. 
frosts appear at night november has sent his fogs in advance the wind takes its autumn moan but he is coming the skies hang full and dark a rack sails from the west the clouds cast themselves into strange forms arches in broad radiations there rise resplendent mornings glorious royal purple as monarch in his state the heavens are one flame so wild are they they rival battle at its thickest so bloody they shame victory in her pride i know some signs of the sky i have noted them ever since childhood god watch that sail oh guard it the wind shifts to the west peace peace banshee keening at every window it will rise it will swell it shrieks out long wander as i may through the house this night i cannot lull the blast the advancing hours make it strong by midnight all sleepless watchers hear and fear a wild southwest storm that storm roared frenzied for seven days it did not cease till the atlantic was strewn with wrecks it did not lull till the deeps had gorged their full of sustenance not till the destroying angel of tempest had achieved his perfect work would he fold the wings whose waft was thunder the tremor of whose plumes was storm peace be still o oh, thousand weepers praying in agony on waiting shores listened for that voice but it was not uttered not uttered till when the hush came some could not feel it till when the sun returned his light was night to some here pause pause at once there is enough said trouble no quiet kind heart leave sunny imaginations hope let it be theirs to conceive the delight of joy born again fresh out of great terror the rapture of rescue from peril the wondrous reprieve from dread the fruition of return let them picture union and a happy succeeding life madame beck prospered all the days of her life so did pere silas madame walravens fulfilled her ninetieth year before she died farewell end of chapter forty two end of villette by charlotte bronte